Okay guys, think of my post as you will. I have been refraining from posting this for some time. Even back in the older days of Antarctica on X and Paul several years ago. I figure now is as good a time as any. I stopped myself from posting because I feared gang stalking or being traced if there was any truth to what I'm about to post. Now I just think fuck it. This post will most likely go unnoticed anyways, and gang stalking is just an irrational fear for myself. My knowledge of Antarctica comes from my best friend of 50 years now. Though we grew up together, we grew up in very different conditions. He was part of the rich family, who owned one of the largest factories in my hometown. I was the opposite, just a naive kid playing around town when we first met. We were best friends then, and I still consider him my best friend now despite him traveling around the world, going to Princeton, and doing whatever he wanted. The point is, he is a footy first mason, and has lived a life way beyond I can imagine. Despite all this, he always comes to visit, sometimes several times a year, sometimes not for years, but when he does, he usually gets smashed and trashed, hookers, blow, he even brought me DMT and other crazy shit. Okay, enough Backstory. Time for the goods. This comes from him. His story hasn't changed, though he only told me this roughly five years ago and told me shit would be happening in less than a decade. This starts with religion, and at first I rolled my eyes, but as he talked more, it sent shivers up and down my spine. So, the Masons have been in charge of controlling and releasing information to the public at reasonable levels. This is what he told me the majority of his Masonic duty entails, and the first piece of media they altered was the Bible. A major part of the Bible was cut out from the revelations, revealing where the Antichrist and the beast would emerge from. He said the section they cut out was the most important. Okay, so the revelations stated that the last Antichrist would be the total opposite of Jesus. Spreading disease from an old age which turned most humans into zombies, or some weird shit he said. Anyways, he said this Antichrist was trapped in a frozen wasteland with magnificent buildings and was being held captive by kilometers of ice. He doesn't know exactly if this is an individual. Even the Masons think this is a virus of some sort. The Bible didn't specifically state, but he said, this is where the saying comes from when hell freezes over. Hell is already frozen over. Once hell is defrozen, the real hell will be unleashed. He told me these temples in Antarctica have been explored by a group of people in control of the government. The same group is doing crowd control methods all around the world, have been digging, hoping to find this antichrist buried in Antarctica because some believe it is the key to immortality. For another small section of the Bible did refer to the everlasting life, Garden of Eden being hidden right beside the Antichrist, and in order to bring about the last of days, it had to happen anyways, so teams have been digging, blowing up shit, covering up, stopping visits, though he said you can visit the outside portions of Antarctica, only those who know will ever get to see those temples, and constantly destroying any information leaked from this expedition. He told me, several years ago, some Russian thought he found a portion of the immortality and injected himself with an ancient virus they discovered in a vial in one of the temples. He even cringed when talking about the story, and said the guy instantly turned blue and froze over. Everyone ran out, and when they returned, his body was gone. Now they only work in those giant radioactive suits. He said they had to replace him with a body double to avoid drawing notice or some shit in his real life. He went into great detail about how big and complicated those temples, and he calls it a big giant city, expand across the entire continent. He said from one temple where you enter, there are hundreds of rooms, hallways, traps, all types of symbols and shit on the walls, large books of ancient texts no one can read, vials upon vials of random liquids which they can't even remotely identify, but he said most contain living organisms in these vials and they are protected behind large traps, shit from Indiana Jones. He said they've already lost over 500 people exploring, and now they are using robots, but shit is so complicated, you have to move blocks to open doors, solve riddles, I don't know. 
He said it's truly a giant mousetrap. There are keys and legends on the walls, and a single room can contain up to 100 different keys for solving to open a trap. It's crazy shit, and they have the smartest people working on it. And they send in third world people to go open the doors when they think they solved it. It's shit I still don't know what to make of. So, some other stuff he told me. Most movies and books are representing what they think will happen when it's discovered. Like Transformers, with the frozen bot forget his name, all these zombie movies, and all this other shit in the media. I'm not sure if you guys care. Essentially, I have crazy stories from him for all these years. A lot of examples I forget because of our drunken binges, but this is the gist of it. Don't know if it confirms anything for you guys, but it's my two cents. Just for you anon, I will type out everything I know. He said Game of Thrones, one of the only shows I watch so I can relate to what he said, shows what they think will happen when they discover this Antichrist. They aren't sure it is, but the White Walkers are meant to get normies ready to fight against the possible zombie outbreak, and why they think it's soon. A quote he kept repeating from the Bible was, After the War of Wars, and after the Winter of Winters, is when everything would happen. He thinks the War of Wars was from World War II up until now. None stopped fighting across the Earth, and the Winter of Winters refers to the ice of Antarctica decreasing and opening up parts of island still frozen. Another crazy fact he said they know is there will be Jesus or Christ right beside the Antichrist, and you will get to choose when it's first discovered. He thinks it will be two vials beside each other, and you will have to drink one. After the Russian, they put in a ban from ingesting any shit from these temples to prevent anything from happening. It's truly a clusterfuck of arguments, because everyone wants to be the first to keep discovering, but they are in disagreement of what to do with all these random vials they keep finding. He said each other has random living organisms inside of it, and it's bacteria and viruses we have never seen before. Shit which makes apples rot in minutes, and monkeys explode diarrhea and shaking to death. But the coolest thing he said was there is a giant, frozen skeleton in golden armor in one of the temples, holding the skull of a giant reptile, which looks to be over 30 feet tall, and the reptile head is roughly the size of a van. It's incredible to see, and unbelievable. He mentioned some Jewish show on TV called The 100. I haven't seen it, but he said the leader takes a chip or drinks something which gives him the recollection of all the knowledge previously, and lets them control the others with their minds. This is what they think is in the immortality vial. So the media and shit they keep releasing is just them theorizing everything and making entertainment out of it. It's funny because it's the truth in a way, he said, and the public just eats it up. On one long binge, he did tell me everything they found so far. It must have been hours. He was talking lots of shit, and it just went through me because it was so unbelievable. Aside from the traps, the walls are covered in symbols and images. Shit which has supposedly happened already. Shit which hasn't happened. And shit just no one knows what to think about. He said these images, though drawn in some ink, which looks like it's printed on a piece of paper, has predicted many events recently. And the Illuminati card game, this piece of 4chan I do enjoy friends about, were actually pictures on the walls of these temples. He said they look so lifelike, even though being drawn, they had to release them in a game because these events were coming true over time, and they keep doing so which is crazy. For them it's just another piece of media which flies over the heads of the population, but for them, it's a giant timeline. He said there's tons of shit hidden in media which they find and subtly hide, but it doesn't matter to anyone because we just keep consuming shit and not caring nor would we care unless we saw it in real life. I was amazed when he mentioned this game, because I actually own it, and took it out and we play for hours. He explained a shit ton of cards which happened, and cards which they think will be happening soon. He said each and every card is a picture from the wall, and nothing is made up. He said the card game is a giant timeline leading up to the end, or discovery of Antichrist. Every time they open a new room or different section to the temple, it's littered with more images. He mentioned a shit ton of other games, movies, shows, books, and other stuff. 
which they hid stuff but I can't remember all the names. So which are the ones they think are going to happen next? They aren't sure, but they constantly hide these hints in TV. Even for them it's like a giant mess of information they are constantly working on. He said the pictures are one thing. There are hundreds of books and scripts which contain shit no one understands. He educated me on the Voynich Manuscript. It's one of the books which they found and made its way into the public. No one knows what it means or anything, but they think it was ancient methods for making medicine or other stuff no one actually knows. He mentioned like 9-11 was in the temple several times and they did attempt to prevent it, but somehow there was a group in the government which made it happen because of interests. They even hinted on The Simpsons and several other shows that it was coming, but the public can't make connections or believe anything. He says the more shit they release, the less likely the majority of the population believes. Instead, they focus on working, shitting, eating, and making money. It's just nothing but entertainment. So what you're saying is, Conan the Barbarian is a documentary, Fire and Ice is a documentary, Deus Ex is a documentary, Rhapsody is a documentary, The Lord of the Rings is a documentary, Nirvana is a documentary, and Odin was right. This is what he said. He said there is a connection between how much shit from the temples they put into the media, the more likely it is to be successful. Even the symbols, which are littered across all media, Illuminati symbols, come from these temples, and other temples from the world. But in these temples they appear hundreds of times in a random order, like a language. So they just throw it out into the media and we buy it up, not even knowing what they truly mean, but they just keep filling our media with it, and we just keep consuming it. They have no idea whether these stories happened or will be happening either. There is no order in how they appear in the temples. It's all scattered, so they're scared that there are beasts hidden deep down in the temples. Another interesting thing he said was you cannot look through the walls. So normally they could use imaging and radar and other technologies to map out temples. These ones just appear as one giant black blimp with all technology they attempt to use. They are literally mice in a mousetrap, making their way through this maze, piecing together lots of info, and hoping to get lucky. The amazing part he said about the temple is how complicated it's constructed. From the 500 people who died, 400 are still missing. So the puzzles and shit you do to open doors actually open up traps where you fall into it or some shit. And those 400 have disappeared into the temple somewhere and not a single one has been found yet. They fear they have become infected with the zombie virus, for there are symbols showing death all over the temple. But they fear, once they reach a certain level, they will find all of those lost in a weird state, dead or infected or something. Also, there is no noise in the temple. When you talk, it's a very flat tone, and there is no outside noises. It's like a dead silence, which makes it really fucking scary to work in. Most of those who are deciphering will not enter the temples under any circumstances. That's why they send the third worlders to go in, and try to open up shit. He said all the most important stuff has been removed. They kept the fluff which keeps people calm and going to church. Everything in the Bible is true, with many parts missing. He actually mentioned that Noah's Ark was based on Antarctica, and they expect to find some evidence of it once the snow melts. A part he mentioned was that the Antichrist was at war with God, and that is why he got frozen, but he said that God isn't what we think he is. He's not a man, but a living organism, capable of hive mind-like thoughts which can see the future. So God, the spirit mind hive, warned Noah of the flood ice age coming, but didn't warn the Antichrist. I didn't know because it went over my head as he was talking, but he said these two have been at war for a long time and humans are just the vessels in which they use. This is why Christ and the Antichrist will be located near each other. And he said the Matrix told the story as the blue pill and the red pill. One will be the Antichrist and bring about death, the other will be life, though he admitted they have zero clues as to which is which and where they are in the temples. There is a giant power struggle in those working on the temples because many are offering to be test dummies, thinking they will get immortality but many are scared of what will come about. Humans are just vessels? I don't know Anon. I'm trying to recall word for word what he told me, 
and I'm doing my best. He said it's like the body is the temple or some shit. He said you are what you eat, like you consume a virus and it can control you without you knowing. This is what he was trying to tell me Christ and the Antichrist were. And that is why Christ actually translates to body. So Antichrist is antibody. Something which goes against us. I don't have the answers you seek, just some information on what is going on. Everything in the Bible is true with many parts missing. Please explain which Bible your friend was referring to. I don't know, I haven't read any. He said the Bible is true, and they changed it, heavily removing everything of value. I discovered some reaction in here. I know Green originally discovered this, and I have gone to great lengths to credit him. Unfortunately, much of what Green proposed is simply impossible, and doesn't actually measure up when you do it properly. He's also missed three quarters of the page. If you think this is fudged, you need to go and get hold of a grown-up. Nothing in this is paranormal, sorry. It's fucking interesting but has nothing to do with John D having an unfathomable concept of number theory. If this isn't going to make you look like a Brexiteer, please take a look. If you are English or arguably even American, this is the most important person in your history. Shakespeare could not fully write. We have six really shite gigs and that's it. You can't have a guy who in print is regarded as the greatest of letter writers and not have a single solitary scrap of his handwriting. There is zero evidence that Stratford grammar was even operational at the time. Grammar schools were not what they would become. There is zero evidence of any description that this barely literate green hoarder had any education whatsoever, or that he ever left the country. His will contains no punctuation, no books, and hence zero Shakespeare. When Stratford was visited soon after the posthumous publication of the 1623 first folio, nobody had a clue what was going on. His daughters were bare illiterate. The only paranormal thing in all of this is how the heck does English lit even work out where the front door is in the morning. There is a thoroughly bogus post dating argument Stratfordians think that they can wield to defend themselves. It's pitiful. Look at the RSCs on site. Look properly. There's really only one hard material not available before, a date after 1604, De Vere's death, which is the Tempest. The problem with this copyright case is it was blown clear in the air 15 years ago. Strachey, the claimed source, published 1625 anyway, not 1610, uses Eden, a 16th century author. There is no Eden in Strachey that isn't in Shakespeare. There is lots of Eden that's in Shakes and not in Strachey. Game completely over in any copyright case. Once you get into the nitty gritty and understand that he has to lay his hands on over 300 books, no half a dozen languages to scholarly level, etc., it's obvious this isn't even one guy. It's a scriptorium with a common editor. Hamlet is the artistic biography of the man who established Freemasonry, its most revered figure and greatest secret. Come on, people. This is properly interesting. Correction, autobiography, not biography. De Vere's life is recurrent in Hamlet. This is possibly the deposed Tudor line. Yes, it's thermo-fucking-nuclear if you have the slightest interest in English history. Exactly who is related to who is of much debate, though the extreme theory that he was both the son and lover of Elizabeth is appalling, and I don't buy it. It's in the film Anonymous, needlessly. Indeed, I don't know if he was, and don't need him to be the father of Elizabeth's child in Ryofsley, Earl of Southampton. But we have all the bones. They exist. We can work that bit out eventually. De Vere was the poshest cunt, there, I said it, in history. His direct ancestor got off the boat with Guillaume the Bastard, William I, as his half-brother-in-law. 
The family's military heritage is epic. I'm trying to find a new hobby. Astrophotography has gone bonkers, by the way. I'm actually sick to the back teeth of this because I cannot get anyone with the technical capacity to analyze it, to even walk through it. That's actually a heck of a lot of you. It's Elizabethan era maths, which is not much, but you would need to fetch the file from the Folger Luna collection and measure what I say to have any confidence. That's way too much effort for something that you are just oh so sure is bollocks. Even the Oxfordian people, the De Vere with Shakes Consortium, really couldn't give a flying flamingo. I don't want to write a sodding book or publish a paper. I want to enjoy the stars. So right now, the 9th of March, 2023, the only person since this was first done, who at least wasn't a very knowledgeable mason, to know if any of this is there beyond Alan's critical first breakthrough is me. I have no intention of running some conspiracy cult to promote this, so I am going to muck about getting pictures of Jupiter and Andromeda this year. The Essex Rebellion of 1601 is a matter of undisputed historical fact. Where the Earl of Essex, a bloke called Davro, gets his head removed inside three weeks of the failed coup. The guy in shot, Henry Ryavesley, third Earl of Southampton, is the fair youth of the sonnets. See wiki, Ryavesley's connections to the sonnets is almost uncontested. His name can be pronounced Rosley, but I call him Risley. As in the picture, he is on remand in the center of the Tower of London. These are the two senior aristocrats at the head of this. One gets his head chopped off, singing a famous John Lydon line. The other gets let off, but kept indoors till Liz gets replaced by a Scottish bloke. Southampton is so privileged within Tudor society, you would have to turn it inside out and perform weird n-dimensional topology on it to allow some oik from Warwickshire to publish stuff about anything to do with his sex life, for fuck's sake. Let me tell you about that monument in Westminster Abbey. That's where the Masons really have been taking the proverbial. Back in a bit. Someone reposted this on here before. I didn't, but it's where I got some of the very few hits that I got. In a way, it is related to paranormal, as Green has made it so. And it's not. But I'll shut up if there's no more pull, or I'm moderated. None of the boards that it should have activity on are interested. But, for the record, no, it's nothing whatsoever to do with poetry written by D. It's a precise, geometric cryptogram that is entirely novel, demonstrating that the Masons publish Shakespeare and naming him. I've not come across much about this before, but from even the scraps I've heard in passing, I find it generally easy to believe Shakespeare wasn't one guy, but, like you said, a scriptorium with a common editor. I've never heard it phrased like that, but it's a really complete idea, and it feels a comfortable fit. Shakespeare honestly always felt like a fictional character himself. I can imagine that there was a character author all writers were to keep in mind to embody as they wrote. Like a kind of motivation prompt for an actor. But I'm just speculating there. Maybe Shakespeare was one guy. But it's just as likely that he was not. And there is as much likelihood of a group of intellectuals devising a project where they write under one pen name. Especially as there is strategy in that. For those who wish to wield influence without agendas or personalities attached that could throw the experiment into disarray and fail to secure the influence. On the other hand, it is quite tragic if it's possible to attribute the genuine work of one unique man's work to several individuals taking credit for the distribution of skill that went into works of great intellectual capacity. If it were to rob an individual of being the demonstration of their own capacity through their own entire will and mastered skills, and instead, water it down to only having been able to be so elegant and profound because several aristocrats pooled their utmost talents and that no common man could be a match in talent 
for the collective talent of the well-traveled and intellectual elite class. The Masons talk endlessly about things being hidden in plain sight. The picture is an engraving of Shakespeare's monument. It's his tomb, in Westminster Abbey. It's got 17 spears around the bottom. There are 17 notches along the top of the portico triangle at the top, 40 across the bottom. Obviously, there should be at least 20 on the slope if there's 40 along the bottom. The two numbers, 17 and 40, are encoded into it repeatedly, as if the recurrent motif of four T's. De Vere is regarded as the fourth inverted T, inverted and hidden inside the three T's of the triple tau. He's clearly making a Knights Templar chi ro, or he needs to spend a penny. You can get a four and a Roman ten out of that also. The text that he's pointing to is screwed up, as Baconians have noted. The actual reason, with 17 and 40 again encoded into the number of characters, and the four T's, a blatant misquote which was noted at the time of construction. It was put up in 1740. It's got the erection date of 1740 carved onto the monument, which is completely irregular. You may put the date of the death or event, never the builder. The masons reserved that spot, fact, and threw the wall up, 20 years before waiting for that particular year. It's an altar, the altar of St. Glade's Chapel. Any altar in our most sacred cathedral has been reserved as the resting place of kings. Seventeen and forty are regarded as De Vere's cipher. They unlock the cryptography. You can draw those numbers by various geometric methods from both Edward De Vere and the 17th Earl of Oxford, and from William Shakespeare. There's a lot more we have on that monument. See Alexander Waugh. There's a guy Drayton behind the wall, massive lump of marble, staring directly down at where the altar is on the other side of the wall. Drayton knew John Hall of Stratford, a physician. We have letters between Hall and Drayton expressing their friendship and matters of art. None of them mention a word about fellow Stratford resident at the time, William Shakespeare, with regard to art. He was Hall's father-in-law, Hall was co-executor of Shakespeare's will. That's how he spelled his own name. That end of Westminster Abbey, the South Transept, and in particular the region of Shakespeare's monument, has dozens of known and highly suspected masons from the 17th and 18th centuries buried there. The abbey will corroborate that, and goodness knows how many unrecorded ones. Regarding our collective lack of plebeian genius, now we found out that you would have had to have been very powerful indeed to have created and had Shakespeare publish. He's taken the proverbial out of every toff in the country, mercilessly and systematically. Faraday never even went to school. Heaviside wasn't much better off. These are the two most important physicists between Newton and Einstein. Perhaps only Maxwell himself compares. Marlowe, son of a bootmaker, is very heavily connected to at least the historicals. He's common as muck. Elizabethan England, at war with both Roman Spain, would have made North Korea look like a liberal democracy. The number of ways in print you could get yourself ritually murdered were endless. That this work was created and published in the first place, at enormous risk to those involved, is something to celebrate. It's terrifying. The deeper you go into this, the more ridiculous it gets, and there is next to no research being allowed. If you are an English literature postgraduate, and you suggest this as a project, you get your career terminated. In the 18th century, people like Alexander Pope, who put that monument up, and was a very senior public Freemason, were obviously playing at silly buggers. There is also some evidence some Masons in the 19th century knew. I don't think many senior Masons know anything now, at least not for sure. 
King Charles III is an outspoken, authorship septic, as was his late father. I think every king or consort to the British monarchy has been a super senior mason since the restoration. Most have, anyway. Philip told this comedian, Sir Stanley Wells, the head of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, where he was being knighted, that he is more convinced Shakespeare isn't who Wells thinks he is, after reading his book, than he already was. There is a special 32nd degree of masonry, master of the royal secret. There are, I believe, only three of them. When one snuffs it, they recruit another. They know. They have sworn not to tell. So we can't expect them to tell us. But the more I nosy about the Masons, the more I understand that they are as interested in this history as we are. It's quite common for a Mason to believe D was actually Shakespeare. I've had one tell me so, right on the steps of the Grand Lodge. Genuine thanks to all for looking. The literary scholars of the Oxfordian movement, who I only got involved in this to thank them for their efforts, cannot absorb much, if any, of my work. If your friend of 40 plus years, who you respect as an engineer, who is certainly not an idiot, but not exactly a Shakespearean scholar, fished this out, would you believe it? My mates won't. I forgot to mention something important and glaring about the monument. In 1977, I guess as part of the Queen's Jubilee that year, the text in the picture was hacked onto the monument. It wasn't put on there 247 years earlier, and for a bloody good reason. The Latin in the lidded tawny sarcophagus above his head is actually arse about face. It's meant to mislead those who don't really know their Latin. The dedicatory text in every other monument in the abbey, and there are very many, is always below the figure or ornamentation. It's 30 odd quid to get into Westminster Abbey these days, and you have to book. The area around the back of that wall is being used as a storage area for seating. There's a monument to Ben Johnson above a door, put there before the monument wall. Johnson is deeply implicated in all of this. It's universally accepted that he was heavily involved in the publication of the first folio in 1623. Like Drayton, he is staring down at where the altar slash grave is, a point in the abbey that would not have any apparent connection to Shakespeare for over another century. I should repost the composite images I prepared specifically for 4chan. The monad on the left predates da Vinci. Jira, who is associated with, but did not discover, the hexapentagon thing in the middle, was a contemporary and a student of da Vinci. It again goes a very long way back, at least to ancient Egypt. We have studied the pentagon and the golden ratio since long before we could write. The pentagon has been a symbol of knowledge that predates writing systems. D has shown us that he can create a highly illustrative form of the monad from Vesica Pisces that incorporates the Great Pyramid of Giza and a pentagram. The Hermeticists believe that God created the universe using numbers, geometry, and words of the three sacred languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Discovering this geometrical pseudo-relation, it has no real place in maths, unfortunately, would have felt to D as if God were talking directly to him. This graphic is intended to explain this relationship, which is actually three relations that can be summarized as the perimeter of the hexagon equals length of the side of the triangle equals length of the side of the pentagram equals base length of the pyramid. The pyramid base is coincident with the pentagram apex and the triangle center. These are all indicated, however subtly. There are distinct and non-standard masks in the typesetting and precise positioning of elements that corroborate these relations. It's one thing to have a dozen coincidences, but they show an intelligent plan, not just several unconnected shapes. I've detailed the precise coincidences of this on a small site I put up there. Any individual element of it can be dismissed and ignored. That is the deliberate nature of this cryptography. It's hidden in plain sight. 
anyone with sufficient craft can explain to anyone in these words worthy enough what is intended just by pointing to it. No published mathematician will attack this. He slash she wouldn't just be fighting me if they did. That's what would happen and they would immediately understand that. If you are a professional mathematician, I'd be delighted for you to refute that. This Vesica Pisces meets the monad via Giza creation of Dees is cute enough. It's had a series of other astonishing cryptographs integrated and overlaid into it. This is one shape that is generated by two input points and simply defined rules. Every line on my diagrams is spat out of a spreadsheet. Everything on the spreadsheet is created by a formula from previous points derived. The upper area of the diagram is connected to the lower circular area, discovered initially by Alan Green. The white triple tau hides an inverted fourth T within it. When you drop that down, it becomes a Teutonic cross, which happens to be the emblem of the Master of the Royal Secret. A super exclusive, free people only, 32nd degree order that we don't know that much about, except it's got a really really suspicious name, hasn't it? This is Green Circle, and was Chi Ro. If you've seen this before, I went through all of Green's assertions, including all the really mad stuff about averaging angles of subtended chords, etc. All of it. What you see is what is there. None of the rest stands up. In the case of the square roots, extra golden ratios, etc., none of them are valid, and are trivial Pyfac to know so. Any student of D would know that immediately. E and E1 are not quite as mad as his constant referral to things like Plan can see, the speed of light. Brun's number cannot happen in 1609. You need a microprocessor, not just a very big brain. E isn't there, though it's worth pointing out that Joss Berge supplied Johannes Kepler with the anti-log of 1 before 1609. Just saying. And this is D's star chart and his triplicate signature. The star chart has been worked into this with fiendish brilliance. I've made some attempt to explain this in more detail on the microblog and in videos. This part is the easiest to at least verify. There are four angles there for you to measure just by fetching the lunar version from Folger and loading it into GIMP. They are all within 120th to 150th of a degree from integer. The angles are the measured angles of these three fabled heavenly events, three of the most remarkable astronomical occurrences in all recorded history, each happening in our time period and having a major and recorded effect on science, plus Venus, the most sacred and visible of planets. Anon explains alien implants are re-encoded DNA, impossible to remove, powered by the body, and they won't show up under examination. No one believes him. He decides to drop names and clandestine knowledge, divulges there's a race to crack the technology and use it for evil. Alien implants being confirmed. Has anyone seen this? Some solid red pills in this documentary. 100% worth watching. I'm not a fan of Netflix, with their overreach into the political arena, but the doc somehow managed to be decent. What do they claim to find exactly? If it's anything non-organic, then it isn't put there by a non-native intelligence. These things encode tracking devices straight into your DNA. If you remove it, then it will simply grow back. They also utilize DNA to store and track biometric data, which presents itself on the surface of the skin for easy interface and data extraction. If you have a mechanical or non-organic implant that emits any sort of signal, then humans placed it there. This is the kind of shit we need to see proof of. This is nothing but speculation. Is it possible? Yes. Was there any proof to form this hypothesis? Nope. Would love to see the research done to confirm what you claim though. This is the kind of shit we need to see proof of. 
find an actual abductee and biopsy the mole on their ear, have a lab sequence it, and then put a cryptographer on it. Good luck on the last part. This is nothing but speculation. First hand experience actually. I'd prefer it if no one believes me or takes me seriously. Just consider it role playing. If someone bothers to follow the breadcrumbs, they can take all the credit for whatever they happen to find. Was there any proof to form this hypothesis? There will be no solid proof forthcoming, no. Would love to see the research done to confirm what you claim though. It always fails at the final analysis. We can't figure out what they're encoding or why. It's worse than trying to decipher hieroglyphs without the Rosetta Stone. Just consider it role-playing. I already am. There will be no solid proof forthcoming. Please stop posting nonsense then. It always fails at the final analysis. Post everything that led up to your final analysis. No you. This isn't my claim. I already am. Good. Please stop posting nonsense then. Your own inability to follow something does not make it nonsense. Post everything that led up to your final analysis. You wouldn't be able to understand it. My only purpose is to nudge those that would. No you, this isn't my claim. I thought you wanted me to stop posting. Why contradict yourself so quickly? No, you claiming something without any grounds, but then saying there was research done later on in your writing makes it nonsense. You wouldn't be able to understand it. That's called a cop-out. Stop posting nonsense. Post proof. It isn't a hard concept to understand. Don't claim contradictions if you can't follow the discussion. Actually, unless you are going to upload your data from me slash the world to see, go LARP on a magic thread. Makes it nonsense. It certainly doesn't. I've laid out very simply and clearly where to look and what to do. Just consider yourself not to be the target of my post and move on with your life. You wouldn't want to waste your time on nonsense after all. I'll continue to post for as long as I see reason in doing so. Your considerations have no value to me. I'm only interested in pointing people in the right direction, and that person is not you. The idea that leads to the discovery is more important right now, as my hands are tied by circumstances outside of my control. Okay, then I'll continue to assume that this is just a lonely person needing interaction anyway, and is just LARPing for the sake of attention. This is my last response. Enjoy your life and on. You clearly know what is best for yourself. This is my last response. That's too bad. I was hoping to ask you how you think a non-native intelligence might go about tracking terrestrial life forms in the most resource efficient manner. For example, would they carry tracking devices with them and thereby increase their logistical responsibilities or would they manufacture them locally say in the asteroid belt. Wouldn't an even easier option be to make a few small edits to the DNA of organisms under study to offload the cost of observation to them? If you consider how an efficient civilization of sorts would conduct itself in its dealings, you can glean a number of interesting things that act as a starting point when trying to detect what presence they would have here. Do you have any ideas about the best way to utilize tracking devices in particular? You have unbelievably precise info. How and where did you learn all this? I've only spoken about the things I believe someone who would come to a thread like this would have some interest in. It's my desire to get people thinking beyond the concept of mechanical implants and send them in a useful direction. These things are rather elusive, so we must look for ways to gather information about them in whatever footprint they happen to leave. I'm simply pointing to the footprint. Many years of direct or indirect observation of any and everything I could get my hands on or involve myself in. This would include things like shadowing credible abductees, collecting samples, and many long nights of watching absolutely nothing happen. Unfortunately, there are far more unknowns than knowns. My hope is that someone with a different perspective will follow the breadcrumbs and be able to crack the data where others have failed. To the best of my knowledge, at this point, 
we've been reduced to making a comparative analysis of biopsies in order to discern any sort of pattern in the specimens. Not that this is a bad thing. Perhaps it will work, but it takes a long time. And even if we can catalog all the similarities and differences between the samples, it's no guarantee that we will understand why those differences exist. I feel that a more crowdsourced approach is likely to produce a lightning bolt from the heavens. Depending upon the intentions of those creatures, we may need that lightning more than you know. Now, there are other things I'm aware of that I could point you to if you like. I've refrained until this point because I know that the more I reveal, the harder it will be to believe me, since I can offer very little in the way of hard evidence. However, the further this goes, the more it will benefit me if the disinterested parties ignore this. Anyone should feel free to ask whatever they like. Calling me a fraud or belittling my posts will help me, so please do so. I'd like to hear more about what you know, but I don't have any specific questions at the moment. You must have some documentation on all of this research you've done. Any way to look at this? I do, but all of it has been kept strictly offline. The separation is to the point that it has never been put onto a device with the ability to connect to the internet. Not that long ago, people would have considered that paranoid, but I imagine you can see the reason in it, considering the revelations of the past few years. I have thought about making a few of the graphics illustrating the operational principles behind things like technological telepathy public, but if I did, I'd find myself in trouble in rather short order. I suppose I might be able to do it if I just go with a recreation. On the other hand, some of these concepts are dangerous, and I think they'd lead to a dystopian society at best. Which leads me to another question. What do you suppose the alien society looks like? And if we take our cues from them, on what's technologically possible, how much will our society begin to mirror theirs? Well, we do take cues from them, and attempt to work backwards from what we've witnessed them doing. As an example, we know that they can use implants in the spinal cord to remotely control motor functions, and we've been working at various institutions like Battelle to replicate that under the guise of curing paralysis. Of course, the end game is actually to create a sort of slave collar that can interrupt signals traveling up and down the nerves in the spine and replacing them with our own to make people walk or sit still, depending upon the situation. And don't even get me started on the people who left DARPA for Silicon Valley and social media. Do you work for an organization slash company of some sort that's interested in unlocking the secrets of ET implant technology? Or were you always just some guy who worked alone and spent the last many years looking into this sort of stuff? Yes, but they'd never frame it that way. The question was always, if this is possible, then how? So you start at whatever seemed to be credible in terms of alien technology and then attempt to demystify it. So, let's say that it's credible that aliens can communicate telepathically. How would that function technically? There are a number of possible ways. For example, you could implant a receptor organ behind the tympanic membrane on the auditory nerve that mimics signals and sends them straight along the brain depending on whatever transmissions it receives. You can actually find this in abductees. It'll present upon visual inspection as an unusual mass. Most doctors that find it will send it off for study, but the tests just show them as atypical cells, as they aren't cancerous. Of course, the other part of that equation is that they are somehow able to read the output of someone's brain remotely and transmit it. I think they have at least two ways of doing that, but there isn't anything physically present in abductees to view so it's all speculation on my part. Now imagine how this kind of technology would impact human society, and what a petty despot might do 
with the ability to read their subjects' very thoughts. Also consider what sort of society these things must have. Now is the time for me to throw you a breadcrumb in this thread. Dugan also led the company's Brain Computer Interface Project, a new type of technology meant to translate a person's thoughts directly from their brain and onto a computer screen. Dugan unveiled the project on stage at Facebook's annual developers conference in April. She's one of the best people I've ever met in terms of stealing ideas. Were you always just some guy who worked alone? Both. I see. I know for a fact that mind reading technology has existed since at least 2016 slash 17. One variation is called Remote Neural Monitoring, or RNM. After seeing your latest post, I can't help but wonder if RNM was born out of some reverse engineering attempt of the ET receptor organ technology. I also know that certain circles within the Hollywood sphere either have access to RNM or simply purchase the surveillance logs thereof on the black market, and hence use the ideas they obtain from people's minds in order to craft TV commercials, movies, and TV shows. I spoke to one gentleman who once told me that even some novelists have access to this underground market. Is it possible that someday you might be willing to release all the research you've accumulated over the years? And many thanks to you, kind sir, for that breadcrumb back there. The idea was bounced around before my time. As soon as reports started rolling in of non-verbal communication, the neurologists start spitballing how it might be possible, and from there, they just ran the scans and tried to correlate words to brain activity. I'm not sure when they first started work on that in particular, but I believe they may have started in the 80s, which was before my time, cataloging brain activity in association with thoughts of individual words. Right now, they have a skullcap embedded in helmets that's meant to be used by special forces, in tandem with an earpiece, transmitting a limited number of commands to allow for silent, non-verbal communication at distances beyond visual range. This was done by contractors operating under DARPA. I've never heard of that, and a few years ago, I wouldn't have believed it, but after a certain someone in DARPA shut down my work and stole my ideas, it wouldn't surprise me. I do know that the goal moving forward within the next 20 years is to have something that you can slap on someone's head and have read all their thoughts, whether they like it or not. Sort of the ultimate interrogation tool. I thought about releasing my research a lot since my health has started to fail me. Really, I'm holding back because of the aspirations of some of my peers. They can't compete against the resources of the tech giants, but I don't want to kneecap them. I also had nightmares after my first posts. I haven't had nightmares in years, but I kept dreaming those things were coming to kill me for talking about them. It's irrational, but obviously it stresses me out. It's funny how you mention the 80s. Some years ago, I read a blog comment that stated that mind reading technology has existed since 1985. This would be the textual kind though, meaning they can only extract your thoughts in the form of words, but nothing visual. As in, being able to see the things you're seeing within your own mind. My long-time IRC contact of many years once told me that mind-reading technology has been around even earlier than the 80s. What kinds of health issues are you currently facing? It wouldn't surprise me if other people had leaked things over time. I've read a few things over the years that were either incredibly lucky guesses or things someone blurted out while inebriated. If things are more technical or abstract, the broad mass of people tend to ignore them. I'm going the abstract route in order to hide myself in plain sight. It's a bit cowardly, but I have family myself, so outright breaking my agreements could hurt them, as well as my old friends. I'm only nudging things along because I've never seen anything 
to suggest that these entities are friendly, and if we don't advance, they may take advantage of us. In that way, people heading to the social media companies to try to realize various ideas isn't that bad. However, with only a few people knowing where the ideas behind this technology came from, I don't think people will be able to realize where it might go. The complete destruction of privacy of thought goes too far, in my opinion. The only thing I ever saw was a rather bulky and crude helmet. This is because it was very hard to read any sort of useful brain output outside of an MRI. Of course, there may have been more. Just a few of the things you'd normally expect with old age. If I get too specific, I'll narrow the list of candidates for myself down. Although judging by the lack of reaction, I don't think anyone is watching. Also, now that I've had time to reflect on things, I've realized it's about time to give you some more data. If you will humor an old man for a bit longer, I'll give you some data in regards to the measurements of these creatures, as well as the information I obtained about how they managed to incapacitate people for abduction. There are a few stories from there about what happened in the field, so there is a human element to it. Many will say these beings are short in stature, which they are. However, they have very long hands for their height. Using known measurements of humans in the environment, we were able to determine that their hands are 14 inches long, from the bottom of the palm to the tips of the fingertips. That's about 35 and a half centimeters for those that use metric. There is a strange uniformity in their size among individuals as well. Who knows why? Unfortunately, after this post, the thread ended immediately. I'm not sure if archived or taken down, but OP was not able to disclose any more information. There was a massive nuclear war on Mars. The question is, why? It's possible that Mars was used as the testing ground by the Archangels to practice the revealing sciences taught to them by the higher power. That is, if one sees the Anunnaki or Archangels as benevolent, benign, or apathetic in modern times. So it is possible that they used some of the texts that they brought with them from Pleiades or Orion to speed up the process of wrecking an already long-term, unviable planet while simultaneously working on Earth, Nibiru, once it was set in place. You have it half right. No, it's just factions within our people. What got the planet nuked? Vampirism. That's where it started. Let's say things got out of control over a very, very long time, and someone took it on themselves to bomb it dead. I was on the ground when it happened. Some of us managed to escape. It was a space bombardment, and I don't know why my memory is bad, but it happened on my wedding night. At Mount Olympus, there was once a pyramid hotel. With windows and such, it was great. Then the bombs came. There was running, falling buildings, screaming. Those people tried to bite me. I had to get out. A broken old ship back home to Earth didn't make it. Had to crash on the moon. Then nothing. Mars is a highly valuable strategic location. If you're traveling from the inner solar system to the outer solar system or beyond, and vice versa, Mars is the gateway. A space truck stop, if you will. Enough gravity to be useful, but not so much it's too expensive to launch from. In other words, if your enemy is in the inner solar system and you want to cut off their access to the rest of it, you'd hit Mars, or the other way around if you were trying to hold this solar system from an outside force, and were getting pushed back and trapped in the inner solar system, you'd hit Mars. Earth isn't a blasted wasteland, so I'm assuming it was the latter, and it was successful. Long ago there was a war. Short answer, yes. Some of the refugees fled here and fucked monkeys and made us, or something. I don't know how the story goes exactly. It's hidden behind a lot of half-truths and lies. Time is cyclical. 
humanity will eventually colonize Mars, with the majority of biological humans living under an artificial canopy covering the Val Marineris. Artificial humans, robots slash AI, and such basically, but this is a simplification, because sci-fi is not fully prophetic, will dwell atop Olympus. As humanity decays in its downward slide back to the beginning of its cycle, the two sides will come into conflict and ultimately annihilate each other, wiping out nearly all evidence of their presence there. Wouldn't it be insanely easy to destroy all life on a planet if we're talking about interplanetary warfare? Be some other space world. Have uranium. Start sending massive clumps of mass akin to rods of God to space. Add nuclear propulsion to the rods of God. Send to Earth. Wouldn't the amount of energy in these be akin to a comet with life wiping potential? It takes a gigantic amount of calculation and observation to accurately hit a planet with a rod of God, unless you are in orbit or in the solar system. Wouldn't it be insanely easy to destroy all life on a planet if we're talking about interplanetary war? I assume yes. In Earth war we constantly have to be careful not to kill civilians. If you are going to war with another planet that you do not have to live on, you can fuck it up as much as you want. Wouldn't the amount of energy in these be akin to a comet with life-wiping potential? Nuking the fuck out of a planet sounds a lot easier use of that uranium. There was a civil war between the imperialist central government and separatist states seeking to overthrow the regime. They didn't have nuclear missiles, but the separatists rigged a power plant to blow up. Nobody really understood the scale of the destruction to follow. Two possibilities that I've heard. One is that Earth and Mars once orbited Saturn. All three have roughly the same tilt. Then something pulled those planets out of Saturn's orbit and transferred them to the Sun. Another is that there was a planet where the asteroid belt is now. It was a water planet called Tiamat. Some alien race was being chased down by another and hid on Earth, but they planted decoys on Tiamat, which was destroyed by the group that was pursuing them. The destruction of Tiamat caused floods on Earth, but hit Mars the hardest. Something pulled those planets out. That would be the introduction of Venus, the fallen star, Ishtar, etc, etc. Mars, Tuesday, the god of war certainly lends itself to the notion of a cataclysm or war desolated Mars. Perhaps fallout from when the two planets crashed into each other and created Earth and the Moon. There's a lot of half-truths out there. I've done some intuiting with Jesus and a pendulum about the solar system and who owns what and who or what lives where. The following is the present situation. Mercury is inhabited by dragons, the good book-reading kind, not the draconian child rapists. These dragons are on good terms with the Alliance and moved into Mercury because they can handle the climate. Venus is inhabited by elves from Sinus B. They conquered it from the forces of evil, which include Draconians and Afukans. Earth is far, far larger than we're told. Everything outside our firmament is a war zone now, but the Alliance is winning. They can't tear the prison walls down until every prison warden has been terminated. Mars is now in the hands of that same Alliance. Fragments of man who chose to stay behind for the Great Flood and survived it and the Martian underworld reconquered the nuclear wastelands from evil. Three weeks ago the war was still raging. The asteroid belt is a whole other tragic story. I don't know enough about its history, but let's just say Ceres isn't mineral. Either it's a battle station or a shipwreck of one, much like Luna, Phobos, and Deimos. Jupiter, however, is very plain. It has always been an Atlantean, Lumerian type of spirit society, where good and evil tolerated each other by staying away from each other. The good lived on the surface, the evil lived in the Jovian underworld. By now, however, due to the stellar war, the Jovians have conquered 90% of the underworld. More importantly, 
They control the machines now. Jovians are a peculiar mix of humanoid animals, pigmen, bearmen, werewolves, and bipedal bovines, lyrans, etc. It's not without reason that Jupiter slash Zeus sits on the throne. Syrians, Lyrans, Pleiadians, Arturians, they all live there. The first colony, Saturn, has now been conquered. Formerly reptilian and draconian, it's in the hands of the Alliance now. Even its underworld and most of its moons. Continued in next post. Uranus has tragically been lost to the draconians. Originally inhabited by the Pleiadian and Lyrian progenitors, pioneer souls who forged new lands and border systems, it was the first battle of the Stella War. While the colony can be recovered, it's gonna take one hell of a fight to reclaim it. Neptune, on the other hand, remains strongly in the hands of the Alliance. Its dominant souls are Arcturians and Pleiadians. The majority of the inhabitants are Elder Souls and Angels, Soldiers, Commanders. Neptunians are by far the most battle-hardened. It's not a discourtesy to the others. Elder souls and angels have been fighting evil for millions of years at a time. The veterancy comes with experience, and it's this veterancy which puts Neptunians in charge of the Alliance and the plan which truthers think to know but have no conception of. Which leaves us with two more planets and a bunch of battle stations. Pluto is still in reptilian hands and is subject to a blockade at present. The tenth planet, however, is completely, totally, and royally fucked. Call it Nibiru if you want. I call it caught in between dimensions. The whole place is stuck in a time loop, at a fixed point, years ago and years ahead. It's a huge planet, far bigger than Jupiter and Saturn combined, but it's as broken as it is big. If you've ever played Warframe and know about the Void, that's basically what happened to Nibiru. They didn't pull that sci-fi out of their ass for the video game. The important takeaway is that the Alliance is winning, and that Trump's not in it. The original DJT was meant to be the second beast. He was replaced and terminated in his infancy. The replacement entity is a Neptunian, and he's safe somewhere off-world beyond the illusion. This is critical. Everything you see and hear about Trump at this time, about White Hats and Elon Musk and Kushner, it's a Luciferian pantomime and the Luciferians are dead. The aliens visiting Earth and ruling Earth are from our solar system, and they destroyed Venus with Type 1 Civtac, and Mars with a nuclear bombardment. Humans were uplifted to be a slave race because it was easier than robots. Once their societies were destroyed, and they messed with our DNA and culture, they just hopped into spaceships and zipped along the solar system at high speeds to let time accelerate. They land after five years of their time, and their human slaves puppeted through religion, and centuries pass, and cities are built. Chances are we are advancing quickly technologically, because A's from outside our solar system showed up, so they need to arm their slave race to defend the surface, while they dig bunkers on Earth, asteroid belt, or somewhere else to hide. Chances are that no matter what happens, we humans will be fighting to continue our own enslavement, while we are told otherwise. Venus was ripe to make reptilians, as Mars was with grey insectoids, because they tried to do the same to Earth. Once we noticed they launched their weapons which would destroy our world and set back our technology and society thousands of years, we nuked them. They were warned and ignored that, so they paid the price. Too late, however, but we could rebuild. They being dead, could not. Ha. Huh. I contemplated this a while ago. Not sure about Mars and Venus, probably similar connections. But Jupiter and Saturn went to war. Catastrophic war. Jupiter was hit first. Saturn shot a weapon into Jupiter, which pierced most of Jupiter. The hole was the size of a large planet. That hole became known as the Red Eye of Jupiter. Jupiter retaliated, before the planet met its end, by shooting a similar weapon to the top of Saturn. This weapon destroyed Saturn's crust, basically turned it into dust, and launching it into orbit slash the atmosphere, possibly a gravity weapon. Both races lost everything. 
Both Mars and Venus are failed Earths. Men lived on them, but the branches of the tree that is man were cut off, because Mars and Venus are not the middle way that man's oversoul ascends through. Bees, bananas, and wheat come from Venus. The timeline changed in 2016. Something happened in 2016. It's like you can draw a line at that year, and everything before that line was the real world, and everything after that line is the fake world. It's as if the whole mood of everything changed overnight. The world became darker, bleaker, more hopeless. People started becoming angrier, more divided, started freaking out over the dumbest possible shit. Everything became unstable, and you started seeing insane shit happening in the news, like wars, pandemics, tyranny, censorship, extremism, which never happened at this rate before 2016. Think back to how life used to be even just a few years before. 2010 to 2015 felt like a completely different universe compared to post-2016. 2010 to 2015 felt like a fuller, more vivid, more real world in which it was easier to make sense of everything that was going on in the world. Post-2016 just feels like chaos, and on top of that, it also just feels fundamentally fake. Every day I wake up and look at the news and read the headlines, and it just does not feel real anymore. Everything reads like some stupid fiction. It's as if in 2016, the real world ended, and instead we started chugging on in the simulation, but it's just like a Chinese knockoff version of Earth. It will never compare to the real Earth that we all know and remember from 2015 and earlier. What happened in 2016X? What caused all of this? Lots of psychics at this point have told me that Hillary was supposed to win 2016, that Trump winning was a complete divergence of whatever was planned or supposed to happen. Pick related our post from 2016. Something did happen. Some people point to Matthew 24-22 as a clue to what, in terms of time running faster. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. I believe this shit, discussed with many people. All of them say that time somehow feels fast. Can we somehow prove it? I don't think you can. Some people say this has something to do with Revelation. I'm not really into the Bible, so I can't comment on that. You can go down that rabbit hole here. I do believe something though. I've always thought, and mostly still do, that the Mandela effect has mind tricks and faulty memory. However, when I was a child, I remember how I found it interesting that the Earth was on the Sagittarius arm of the galaxy, and my son is in Sagittarius. What a funny coincidence, I thought. I also remember how I was obsessed with the constellation of Orion for some reason. Later in life, I planned to study astrophysics, but changed my mind at the last minute. Not relevant. Nevertheless, up to my mid-twenties, I used to be a complete physics and astrophysics nerd. My point is, my knowledge of these things was not a passing knowledge. The Earth was on the Sagittarius arm of the galaxy, not on the Orion spur as it is now. This is the one Mandela effect I've experienced that I cannot explain. Some people say we moved to this other Earth. Perhaps the old one was on the Sagittarius arm. When the transition is complete, the zero point time will end and you will appear in your new game zone, planet. You will look the same, think the same, feel the same, in fact. It will be just like you all had some mystical experience and life will carry on as normal for you. Same houses. Family situations, jobs, friends, lovers. Fuck. I did undergo something like that around 2016. Maybe it's something a lot of people had, but it's simply not talked about. A political, psychological operation began that has yet to end. Ironically, this is exactly what people felt when 2001 became 2002. But people got desensitized between 2002 and 2015 and forgot they were in a psychological operation. Based on this pattern, the world should start to slowly get weirdly cozier until 2029, when calamity should hit again. The sad fact is that nothing changed. It was just the same cycle that had happened over and over before, 
That's how history works. Nothing ever really changes. People have always been the way they are now. Certain factors might change, but it's the same human element. I don't even remember anything specific from 2016. For me, it was just four years after the failed 2012 Doomsday Prophecy, and 16 years after the Y2K Doomsday. It was also 15 years after 9-11, which was the event that led to the most loss of civil liberties. So for those of us who lived through that, 2016 wasn't anything special. Yeah, a lot of significant life events happened for me in 2016. I know Anans aren't interested in my whole life story, so basically, I ended up on a completely different path in life than I had expected starting that year. Also around that same time, everyone I knew or tried to get to know, except for two people, started ghosting me for no apparent reason. Was ghosting even a thing before the 2010s? I'm in my 30s and I clearly remember people being a lot more sociable and honest about their feelings in the early 2000s. Now it's like everyone either keeps to themselves entirely, or they do have something to say. They're just upset about something or other. Even the last people I know have been acting weird and more distant. Not like they used to, and I'm over here just trying my best to enjoy my life. I stay off social media for all the reasons above. I think it's part of what's wrong with people these days. Anyway, I should be interested in hearing what more people think of this. They are trying to shift the universe, of course they are. What did you think the Great Reset means? The cycle has been going on and on since infinity. The only way to break out is by finding the true timeline. Have you ever broke something to find it mysteriously repaired, or losing something out of thin air? They try to blame it on false memories, but the real reason is because of quantum immortality. We simply branch out into sets of possibilities. For example, there's a universe in which COVID never happened, and one where it did. We retain sometimes this information due to our consciousness lapping over with another timeline with a 99.999 recurring similarity to the one we already reside in. The elite want to do a merger of every single reality into one. Humans are the life essence of the universe, so in a sense, if they can control us, they could control the natural flow of the dimensions. Hence entropy. The false vacuum that we live in is a sign of an incomplete cycle, or the end of one. At a hair trigger, it folds in on itself and we shift along the z-axis. This is how they win. How to defeat them is to kill them, to make them shift to another reality, or put them into a dimensional prison. A fake world is more easier to control. The internet is an example of a fake and controlled world. This does not only happen in 2016. Confirmed. On January 1st, 2016, it seems that a totally different world began from December 31st, 2015 backwards. As if reality was given a strong varnish that stained absolutely everything false, and only got worse with each passing year. Have you noticed how people can't find out what the hell to talk about with others? And pay attention to every insignificant thing to desperately make some topic of conversation that breaks the ruthless silence? Have you noticed how colorless and fake the world looks, even though technology has improved? Have you seen how irreparably disconnected people are from each other? How about we talk about how quickly time flies? And what about the rudeness with each son of a bitch walks angry on two legs, believing that the world and other people owe them a favor? Before 2016, life and everything seemed more accessible and real. Now, it can only be the post-credits of a horrible movie. We entered the age of Aquarius around 2020 to 2021. Our current era is ruled by Saturn, meaning people are becoming more restricted in expression. The previous age of Pisces was ruled by Jupiter, where its expansive energies made people more reflective, more open to possibilities, more heart-centered. Saturn is all about imposing restrictions to deal with mundane material life. I wouldn't doubt if COVID-19 was a ritual to signify the changing of the guard, mass conformity, the deterioration of art, the increase in business-mindedness. These are some of the changes reflective of the transition from the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius. The transition period could be said to have started circa 2012 to 2016. It's not all bad though. The first thousand or so years of the age of Aquarius is co-ruled by Venus, which is likely where the huge divide amongst people comes from. Venus is about love, 
pleasure, compassion, freedom, etc. So the population born with such predilections sense the changing of the guard and are opposed to restrictive satanization of culture. I sense a war of biblical proportions is on the horizon between those who value restriction, conformity, intellect, and materialism, and those who value expansiveness, individuality, heart-centered consciousness, and spiritualism. Personally, I'm starting to think the fake world is all there is actually. Even when things appear to be nice, it's always fake. For example, Pick Related, La Belle Epoque, Paris World's Fair, 1900. Looks fake to me now. It's very pretty. Even too much pretty to be real. Another example. All I see is specular lighting, bump mapping, filters. It's CGI to me now. No kidding. If you try and search how did they build that, then it's much less detailed. And all you see is two or three builders max on wooden ladders. Not realistic. I had a dream that the real world was a simulation, and people were basically controlled by computer scripts and something rare happened to one of my scripts, and it changed the way I thought. After the script stopped running, my brain started to heal and I started to see past the matrix in a sense. I started to feel more alive than usual, and time appeared to slow down. I calculated that the time perception scripts were currently set to run at 20 to 24 times faster which means that most people experience time 20 to 24 times faster than they should have, but I was free of this now. I was looking for a newspaper, because apparently the media was making fun of one of my female friends, but two strange people kept getting in my way, so I stopped looking for the newspaper. And then I saw a bunch of normal, everyday people, but they were saying, I want to kill myself. I want to kill myself. I want to kill myself. And I started having thoughts like, why are they all saying this? What kind of world are we really living in? What is happening here? And then I saw a red heart, inside of a teal furnace thing, and the heart said, It is we who torment you all. We torture you, using the things that you love the most. We hurt you the most by using the things that you love the most. Then I got more angry, angrier than ever, and I tried to tear the heart to shreds, but the heart couldn't be hurt. I felt urgency and dread, because everyone on earth was being tortured by some shady group, and nobody could stop the heart. I started yelling, Take me to your leader. Take me to your fucking leader. And a bunch of shadowy men started to get closer to me. And then the script turned back on, and I felt my emotions fade away. And I found the newspaper, and gave it to my friend. She was playing video games. Then I woke up, feeling emotional. Other changes to keep in mind. Exorcisms and demonic possessions are the highest that they have ever been, as per Catholic exorcists. The moon is faker than ever and NASA is desperately trying to keep everyone asleep on the issue. Psychedelic drug use is at unprecedented levels. Oof. Time speeding up phenomena. This one probably started 2012 to be honest. Grey alien iconography at unprecedented levels. Raid Area 51 lol. YouTube comments are increasingly unsettling and weird. Binaural beat slash manifestation videos. The Grey Goop slop remix of Lion King, Aladdin, etc. Fortnite. Something really sinister about this game that's hard to pinpoint. TikTok. Just lol. I could go on and on. The end result is everything becoming faker and gayer. The real question is, why? I have a new theory. If it's true that 12 seconds today would have been 10 seconds in the past before time got fucky, you ever notice how teens and young adults in old movies just look older than a person their age would look today? Maybe it's because their time moves slower, so they actually age faster slash more than we do in what is supposedly the same amount of time. Hence why a 20 year old in 1980 looked like what a 25 to 30 year old would look like now because their time was slower. Just some ideas for what changed then and since then. Trump's campaign and later his victory. Bringing a whole bunch of unpleasant far-right lunatics into the political mainstream, which were previously off-limits, for good reason. Severely shifting American and greater Western politics in the process, while the neoliberal and politically rather managerial, centrist and center-right mainstream has been largely unable to really respond to this. 
while the left couldn't really find itself either. The digitalization of modern Western society aggressively continuing, but more and more centralized under just a few dozen giant but exceedingly mediocre platforms. In 2020, COVID coming around and ending the 2010s with quite an unpleasant bang. The usual Western cost of living problems and crises worsening and worsening. I'm not sure if that was exactly 2016, but yes, this is not the real world. More like some backup version or simulation. Me is 100% real and proofs we are constantly shifting. Check FE, Flintstones, Fruit Loops, and Houston we have a problem flip-flops. Time is speeding up. I'm not American, but I always knew their Massachusetts counting method. It used to work. Now it's not. I did a little test with many, even the most skeptic friends. You can do it too. Tell them to count the seconds as they remember it, up to 60. At the same time, start the stopper and compare the results. Each time they were counting 10 to 30% slower than real seconds. All of this is just the tip of an iceberg. Everything around us became batshit crazy, but 99% of NPCs can't or don't want to see it. I've slipped into this unconscious habit of thinking to myself, I want to go home, periodically through the day, accompanied with a feeling of longing for something I can't name. Weird thing is, it happens when I'm at my house. I don't know why I think it. I have nowhere else to go. Maybe it's the timeline shift you talk about. Maybe it's that I have always felt like I don't belong in this world. Who knows? But the feeling has only been getting worse. I used to think it was some sort of reality shift, but now I think it is just a natural downshift in society slash civilization. We are on the edge before a large and negative event, so naturally, weird and bizarre things are happening because that is a symptom of a sick and dying age. The last dying time was the world wars and the depression in between, including the disease outbreaks. But out of that we got relatively good and innovative times. So, we are on another downturn, but it's always cyclical. So after the bad times ahead, we can look forward to whatever comes after. ITT, I disclose the nature of UR lodges, which are regular free Masonic lodges that have been dominating international politics, economy, and culture for over a century. All this according to the Italian Freemason, Magaldi, who published a work of disclosure, along with four other alleged UR Lodge members. They list 36 super lodges. Thomas Paine, founded around 1849 to 1852 in the USA. Parsifal, established in 1862 in Germany. Montesquieu, 1870 in France. Valhalla, 1871 in Germany. De Ring, 1881 in Germany. Edmund Burke, 1888 in England, after suggestion by Cecile Rhodes. Arjuna Phoenix, 1904 in India by Gandhi. Leviathan, 1910, refounded in 1918, probably in the US. Joseph de Maist, 1916 in Switzerland, by Vladimir Lenin, refounded in 1921 at the fringes of the Soviet Communist Party Conference. Pan Europa, 1947 in Vienna, by Richard Kudenhof Kalergi. Carol of Carrollton, 1964 in USA, founded in honor of the recently murdered John F. Kennedy. Lux ad Orientum in New York. By Brzezinski. It was established in the Columbia University. Free Eyes, 1968, in the US, by David Rockefeller, Henry Kissinger, and Brzezinski. Eamon, 1972, in Jordan. White Eagle, 1978, in the United States. Tao Lodge, 1990, in China. Hafor Pentalfa, officiously in 1996 officially in 2000 by the neo-conservative circles around Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, and Huntington. Matt, 2004, 
in the USA by Brzezinski. Atlantis, Aletheia, origins are unknown. Babel Tower, unknown origin, Eurocentric. Benjamin Franklin, founded in the United States before the 1960s. Compass Star Rose, slash Rosa Stella Ventorum, founded before 1953. It is frequented by the heavyweights of the military industrial complex. Its name refers to the Masonic NATO Synod. Christopher Columbus, members from USA, Canada, and South America, founded before the 1960s, unknown origin. 24. Das, unknown origin. Its name refers to a unification of divine emanations in the Kabbalistic tree of life. Ecclesia, unknown origin, rooted in Catholic organizations worldwide. Ferdinand LaSalle, founded by members of Thomas Paine, unknown origin. Members are from France, Germany, and Scandinavia predominantly. Fraternité Ver, its origins are unknown. It was founded probably before the 20th century. It's predominantly French. Name means Green Brotherhood. Gabura. Its origins are probably in the US. It is dominated by the military industrial complex. Cultural milieu of Jewish American right wingers. Gabura is a divine emanation in the Kabbalah associated to strength and hardship. Gadula. Unknown origin. It's predominant in the Orient. Name refers to one of the two names of the Kabbalistic emanation associated with love and kindness. Golden Eurasia. Unknown origin. It regards itself as a mirror of the East and West. Hiram Rhodes Revels. Unknown origin. Its name refers to Hiram Abif, the architect of Salomas Temple, according to Masonic lore, and Cecile Rhodes. Ioannis. Its origins are unknown. It was probably founded in the U.S. The name refers to St. John, who is the author of the Book of Revelations. IBN Arabi, founded before 1953. It worships Gnostic Sufism and is predominant in the Middle East. The name means Son of Arabia. Yanus, unknown origin, founded before 1952. The name refers to the two-faced Roman god of doors. Newton Keynes, unknown origin. It was probably founded after 1946. Its name refers to Isaac Newton and John Maynard Keynes. Simon Bolivar, unknown origin. It claims to recruit exceptional South Americans from around the world. It was founded before 1970. The U.R. Lodges differ from the already known lodges of the Freemasons by four things. They are ultra secret, so that even the very most high-grade Masons did not know, until now, that they existed at all. They are basically as international as possible, although each one of them has a geographic focus. Their members can belong to different UR lodges at the same time. Each individual UR lodge is autonomous and has no one else above it. The UR lodges recruit members directly from the profane, so one does not have to be a mason already to be accepted into these lodges. The UR lodges have a grade system, but do not convey any peculiar initiatic teachings, as far as I know. They mainly exist for political strategy. UR lodges accept women into their ranks. These lodges exert their power through the obediences of ordinary masonry and adjacent occult circles and paramasonic organizations into which non-masons may be admitted and whose work is visible to non-initiates. They are often founded out of UR lodges and are strictly controlled by them. Examples of such paramasonic organizations include the American Security Council, Pilgrim Society, Bilderberg Group, the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Royal Institute for International Affairs, the Project for a New American Century, the Fabian Society, the World Economic Forum, the Tavistock Institute of Human Revelations, 
the Bohemian Club, and the Theosophical Society. The focus of McGaldy's work lies on the history of political schemes after the Second World War, more the history of Western society after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. The lens through which he describes this history is an eternal, essential conflict that dwells within you or large masonry, the struggle between democratic, progressive masonry, which is said to strive for the liberalist and humanist brotherhood of all men, and neo-aristocratic, anti-democratic masonry, which aspires for a strong hierarchy, in which the men of superior and stronger spiritual mental quality govern the dynamics of the world, and reign over the uninitiated, which lead meaningless lives as half-brutes. From an exoteric viewpoint, the neo-aristocratic, anti-democratic morality is typified by Joseph de Maistre, Friedrich Nietzsche, Julius Evola, Ayn Rand, Milton Friedman, and such, whereas the democratic progressive morality is represented by figures like Thomas Paine, Bertrand Russell, John Maynard Keynes. Neo-aristocrats are behind the FED system, the military-industrial complex, and oligarch institutions like the European Union. They are financial alchemists who see immaterial money as the substance of the most initiatory quality. Democrats are behind the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, which was exemplified by Martin Luther King and the Kennedy brothers. The development of this era was supposed to establish a progressive world order and was sabotaged by the neo-aristocrats who killed all three of them off. They sabotaged the anti-war sentiment by accelerating it into a drug-induced chaos, leading to a cascade of degeneracy and violence, betraying the original purported goals of democracy and peace and undermining its credibility. After the assassination of Kennedy, the Democrats were able to hold Lyndon B. Johnson in power, who was dragged into the Vietnam War by the neo-aristocratic military-industrial complex. In 1968, the Democrats decided to drop Johnson and support Robert Kennedy instead, who was assassinated before he could gain any attraction. In the same year, the U.R. Lodge Free Eyes was founded by David Rockefeller, Henry Kissinger, and Brzezinski, which would later become the most powerful lodge. Along with the other aristocratic lodges, they put Richard Nixon in place of presidency, who was the subject to a permanent tug of war between the traditional aristocratic Gebera and Leviathan, who wanted to prolong the Vietnam War by any cost, and the new Free Eyes, which wanted to put an end to it and invest into the economic opening of China instead. Finally, Free Eyes won Nixon over. Leviathan and Gabura exerted revenge by staging the Watergate scandal and pushing him out of office. In 1973, Free Eyes established the Trilateral Commission as its para-Masonic organization. After Nixon was gone, his vice and Free Eyes member Gerald Ford became president until Jimmy Carter was put in place in 1976. Free Eyes was already quite powerful during the time as they controlled both candidates, Ford and Carter, in the presidential election. Their rivals from Gaborah already favored Ronald Reagan as a presidential candidate. In the late 1970s, therefore, members of Gaborah and some frustrated Free Eyes members decided to put a limit to the power of Free Eyes. In 1979, they founded a new lodge named White Eagle. They caused upheaval in the Middle East by installing a Sharia regime in Iran, which led to many foreign policy catastrophes and diminished Jimmy Carter's chance for another presidency. In 1980, therefore, White Eagle gained the upper hand by installing their asset, Ronald Reagan. One shall notice a recurring pattern, showing that presidents are often para-Masons or regular Masons only, while being surrounded by U.R. Lodge Masons. You can see this with President Ronald Reagan, regular honorary Mason, 
who had George H. Bush from Three Eyes as vice president. Jimmy Carter was only a paramason, but his vice president, Walter Mondale, and his national security advisor, Brzezinski, were Three Eyes members. Richard Nixon was only a paramason, but his foreign minister and security advisor, Henry Kissinger, is a Three Eyes member. John F. Kennedy was neither a Mason nor Paramason, but Lyndon B. Johnson was a member of Yanis. Three Eyes responded to the inauguration of Reagan with an assassination attempt. A few days later, White Eagle committed an attempt against the Polish Pope, who was supposed to be under the special protection by Brzezinski. During this time, the power of the Democratic Progressive Lodges was hugely diminished. Almost all the rivalries were being fought by the neo-aristocratic Masons. In 1981, the aristocratic U.R. Lodges totally cemented their power through the Treaty United Freemasons for Globalization. It was an agreement between almost all U.R. Lodges, except Joseph de Mesta, and they agreed to work together and quit all the brother wars for at least 20 years. In this treaty, among others, the following things were fixed. The dissolution of the Soviet Union, which was a setup of the neo-aristocratic Joseph de Maistre in a tug of war with Golden Eurasia and Lux ad Orientum. The reunification of Germany, the further economic opening of China, the dissolution of the apartheid system in South Africa, the dissolution of the Red Brigade, P2, and other organizations. Ronald Reagan should remain in office for eight more years, followed by a term by Free Eyes member George H. Bush, who would also join White Eagle. In 1992, a committee of seven progressive and seven reactionary Masons would decide upon the future president, who might be a Democrat or Republican. This president would then remain in office for eight years. These were carried out in 1992. The Masonic Committee decided to replace Bush by Bill Clinton, who was a paramason, who had been a member of the Masonic Youth Organization, the Malay, in Arizona, and was later initiated into Compass, Star Rose, Yanis, and Free Eyes. Displeased by the election of Clinton, Bush decided to form a counter-alliance against the other lodges, which included Samuel Huntington, Dick Cheney, Bush Jr., and would later become a U.R. Lodge itself, Hafer Pentalfa. It was ritually established in 2000, the same year in which the Globalization Treaty ended. The same year, Hafer Pentalfa decided to put George Bush Jr. onto the president office, while Free Eyes wanted to establish Al Gore as the next president. Although it wasn't quite powerful yet, it succeeded in the elections by a quite too obvious fraud in Florida. Hafer Pentalfa established the project for a new American century as the Paramasonic Organization. The following years are described as remarkably unpredictable and brutal, even from the point of view of the neo-aristocratic Masons from Free Eyes and White Eagle. As the wars in the Middle East went on, the U.R. Lodges Gabura, Durring, and Joseph de Maester created a loose alliance with Hafer Pentalfa. To counter the power of Hafor Pentalfa, the U.R. Lodge Matt was founded in 2004 by Brzezinski of the neo-aristocratic Free Eyes and Ted Kennedy, a democratic progressive mason. It's an archumenic lodge that is supposed to find compromises between diverging ideological tendencies. In 2005, Barack Obama was initiated into Matt and was made president in 2008. Four years later, Obama was supposed to win against the Republican cardboard cutout Mitt Romney, who didn't serve any higher purpose than to keep Hafor Pentalfa out of the election process. That time, Pentalfa regained some of its power by establishing the terror organization ISIS in the Middle East. The fear-mongering of the 2000s Iraq slash War on Terror operation was supposed to be rebranded into an omnipresent global terrorist threat. Pentalfa tried to regain the office by installing Jeb Bush, who was then probably supposed to run against Matt member Hillary Clinton. 
Magaldi's book was published in early 2015. On his blog, he described sketchily what happened afterwards. Apparently, it was decided by other UR lodges that Bush should be removed during the Republican pre-election so that it would never come to an elaborate election campaign. This was supposed to happen by including an eccentric candidate who would gain all the attraction and who would humiliate Bush all the time. After Bush dropped out, the eccentric was supposed to drop out as well, and there would be a battle between Clinton and a generic Republican candidate that Clinton would win. Something went wrong, and Donald Trump didn't drop out. Apparently, his contestants in the primaries were too weak, so he became the Republican nominee. This was not according to the plans of the neo-aristocratic U.R. Lodges, who did everything in their power to put Trump under fire. It was almost settled that Hillary Clinton would win the presidency, when in the last moments, the Democratic progressive U.R. Lodges supported Trump, such that he would win the presidency. This came as a surprise for everyone, as they not only expected to get Clinton into the office easily without any concerted counter efforts, but they didn't expect the progressive Democratic brethren to take such a swing. That is the story of the North American political post Kennedy timeline, as Magali told it. You are lodges and national socialism. Magaldi presents National Socialism and Italian Fascism as a failed experiment of the Lodges. In reference to the ballad The Sorcerer's Apprentice, he speaks of a Nazi fascist Frankenstein, which Sorcerer's Apprentice had created in the Mason's apron and which eventually got out of control. The UR Lodges are said to have built up authoritarian national radical movements in the expectation not that a European war would occur but that this type of rule would be transferred to other European nations, and finally, in a modified form, to the US. Freder Rosenkreutz, one of Magaldi's alleged co-authors, sees the lodges Valhalla, Parasafal, and De Ring, along with some reactionary French-Dutch and Anglo-American Masonic circles as the carriers of this development. Winston Churchill, who was initially conservative and pro-fascism, is said to have undergone a change of heart after the Munich Agreement of 1938, and now offered the support of the British and continental conservative Masonic sections to the progressive Mason F.D. Roosevelt in fighting Germany and her allies. Magaldi states that almost all of the highest circles of Masonry dropped it in 1948, at the latest in 1941. This means that the fight against the Third Reich was completely genuine, at least after 1941. In 1941, the U.R. Lodges agreed on a final solution to this conflict and formed the Atlantic Charter, which was sealed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 as the main moment of a new world order. Magaldi writes, on the other hand, that of a Third Reich increasingly dedicated to a bloodthirsty and titanic retrogression inspired by a magical, esoteric, furiously anti-Masonic ideology, and from then on, also deprived of any official Masonic antibody, which, so far, conservative and oligarchic, had accompanied the Nazi regime in its rise in consolidation under the wise direction of the Freemason Jalmar Schatt and some of his brethren from the city of London and Wall Street. The terrible, inhuman vision of a very different, final solution broke out. He writes further, Only now that the National Socialists felt betrayed by those elite and neo-aristocratic Anglo-American Masonic circles which had favored the rise in the consolidation of their power, and which, on the one hand, had failed to avoid warlike confrontation with the UK, and then with the US, which also, on the other hand, in some cases appalled by the escalation of violence and the undifferentiated, often arbitrary, brutality of the Nazi Third Reich, set out to punish these same circles, sometimes actually remotely or directly of Jewish descent, sometimes not, but in any case symbolically linked and connectable 
in the proper Gandistic curses against Demo, Pluto, Judeo, Masonry. You are lodges in Soviet communism. A supposed co-author of Magaldi named Freder Rosenkreutz writes about the historical primordial soup of communism, the League of the Just, the League of the Communists, then Schapper, Whiteling, Bauer, Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, Trotsky, were all founding fathers of communism with impeccable Masonic origins. All Masons with elitist and no less anti-democratic and anti-freedom tendencies in theory and practice than the reactionary and neo-aristocratic ones to which the confreres of the so-called extreme right paid homage. Soviet communism is described by Magaldi and his co-authors as a project of neo-aristocratic U.R. Lodges, similar to National Socialism. The U.R. Lodge Joseph de Meister, which is said to have been founded by Vladimir Lenin in Switzerland in 1917 and refounded in 1921 on the fringes of the Party Congress of the CPSU, was probably substantially involved in this oligarchic experiment, especially after Stalin's death. Most state leaders and secret service functionaries are said to have recruited from this lodge. Magaldi writes about Yulianov slash Lenin. In consultation with some of his central European Masonic confreres, especially members of the original lodge from the German area der Ring, who would be particularly helpful to him in his revolutionary rise to power in Russia. The future father of the USSR argued as early as January 1917 that the name of de Meister was perfectly suited to designate a place of meeting and contact between intellectual elites above the ideological and propagandistic antagonisms that would necessarily arise between the communist regimes and the Western powers. A name, moreover, that would exquisitely symbolize the oligarchic abhorrence of liberal democracy, that would unite both Lenin's communist and free Mason epigons and their conservative and neo-aristocratic fraternal contacts beyond what decades later became the Iron Curtain between East and West. Magaldi and his supposed co-authors omit the period of Stalin's reign almost completely from their narrative. They mention in passing that Stalin was a renegade Freemason. Whether he belonged to a U.R. Lodge is uncertain. Stalin and the Soviet Union must have had the support of all of the U.R. Lodges during World War II. The Cold War of the next decades, insofar as it was publicly visible, was, in Magaldi's image, a largely agreed-upon spectacle of neo-aristocratic U.R. Lodges designed to strengthen the military-industrial complex. From the initiated point of view, the anti-democratic neo-aristocratic primal lodges looks ad orientum in golden Eurasia were already working in the 1960s on a dissolution of the Soviet state apparatus with resistance from the Joseph de Meister. After the Masonic Treaty in 1981, where the dissolution of the Soviet Union was scheduled, the rest of the U.R. Lodges worked on the liquidation of resistant Soviet leaders. The Golden Eurasia Mason, Mikhail Gorbachev, led the Soviet state apparatus to its end. U.R. Lodge Pan Europa, the essentially Masonic Pan Europa movement, which united Masons of different ideological tendencies in the 1920s, consolidated itself into an almost completely aristocratic oligarchic project, which preferred the economic unification of the continent to the political one. Pan Europa and Compass Star Rose control the Bilderberg Group, and the World Economic Forum is their paramasonic organizations. Here is a list of the Freemasons who took part in disseminating the pan-European idea in the 1920s. Which of them later became members of the U.R. Lodge Pan-Europa remains unclear. Here is the list. The pan-European movement disbanded and fell into oblivion during the rise of national authoritarian movements of the 1930s and World War II. It was later picked up 
and rebranded into another neo-aristocrat project by Masons like Otto van Habsburg, Conrad Adnar, Alan Dules, and Winston Churchill, who stripped it from most democratic progressive elements. Kalergi founded the UR Lodge Pan Europa in Vienna in 1947. Kalergi compared his aristocratic scheme to the rebuilding of the Carolingian Empire of the 9th century. Freder Kronos describes the pan-European idea. According to our project for the new European age, Europe is to become the prototype of a post-modern feudalism, led by a Masonic nobility, rich in initiated spiritual heraldry and alchemical financial talent. The system, similar to the Chinese communist oligarchic system, can be exported all over the world. In 1948, George Orwell published 1984, in which the future world is ruled by continental, technocratic, totalitarian superstates. This is to be understood as a reference to the work of Pan Europa. George Orwell was a member of the democratic progressive U.R. Lodge Thomas Paine. Here is a list of prominent U.R. Lodge members, including Vladimir Putin, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, Margaret Thatcher, almost all Rothschilds, Stanley Kubrick, Neil Armstrong, Henry Kissinger, and David Rockefeller, George W. Bush, and Dick Cheney, Bob Dylan, Bill Gates, and Henry Ford II. Here is the list of the rest. What is cannibalism and why is it an old world order thing? What is getting shanghaied and what does it mean? There are dozens of reasons to traffic in humans. They are infinitely more profitable than trafficking in any other thing, even gold or nuclear materials. It has always existed. And as long as people don't eternally prosecute that evil, it will continue to exist. It's a battle that never ends. Every generation will have people who rise to power and figure out that they can do it, or that it might be possible and might work, and then makes it happen. Maybe each group doesn't touch down with a millennia old institution that may or may not exist that controls all of civilization. But the idea that each institution doing this is not trying to get to that point is laughable. Each Illuminati group is trying to get itself beyond the cycles of cataclysm, the next extinction event. They want to retain all their science and knowledge and use it to rule over you. The fact that this is their motivation should tell you that you need to treat it as an ongoing conspiracy, because that is what it intends to be. Is the Illuminati that orchestrated the Great Recession and World War I the same faction that orchestrates all of our bullshit today, 100 years later in 2020, it wants to be that permanent, and that's all you need to know. Modern China's organ trade is more or less common knowledge by now, but I always thought that it was just for monetary gain. Is there anything esoteric to it, or something that connects with other parts of the NWO? So you think that the Chinese are competing with other parts of the NWO, rather than cooperating or even being connected to them? Both. That's how the whole Illuminati works. It's a king of the hill on a mountain of mud. If the pinnacle looks weak, then others will make a move. That's how most criminal syndicates work, except for ones with religious commandments, which is where Satanism and other institutions succeed. For instance, without the corruption of the Catholic Church, Judaism and Satanism Without the FBI taking out the Mafia at a critical point, the Drangheta could never rise to power. The Pinnacle always pretends to be thousands of years old, and claims to know the true history of man. Another thing that people don't think about is where this opponent is. Communists talk about taking money from them as if it's sitting around in bank accounts. Really, the money is in play. It's everywhere, and in everything. The same with the agents. 
They are everywhere, and in everything, including the Earth. You think you could get a team together and assault some castle, take out a lord and get some gold and rescue some kids? That won't work, because they are underground. Like you said about China's organ trade, more or less common knowledge. So are the bunkers for the elites. But this is young money. The real elite use ancient catacombs and natural cave systems that have existed for thousands of years. There are tunnels underneath each city, and this is where the enemy really is. You would have to map the tunnels, invade them, cut them off, clear them piece by piece, and then reinforce them and hold them. That would be a huge effort. The population of subterranean populations is 100 million. 30 million are slaves. The memes about inner earth are funny. It's real but not a donut shape. It's caves. Hell is real too. The megacity down there is the problem. Over 28 battalions have been trained to fight underground, but it may not be enough. A lot of commanders think they will not see that kind of combat, but they will. They are going down there. This is going to take years. Checked. This guy knows. It's a race to finish on all fronts. There also may well be esoteric reasons behind the abduction and trafficking of organs and bodies. Why else would the pharaohs have had their important bits buried separately from their bodies, more or less? Exactly. The new ruling faction would want nothing more than to take the previous ruler's hearts and other organs and use them in rituals, eat them, or otherwise defile them. Esoteric magic possible. Cannibalism. Whatever. They did it to protect from their own. The graveyard represents that we don't defile our own people. A civilization without one was built to be farmed, Egypt. Proper burial takes on a huge religious significance because of this. It's almost backwards to the norm. It prevents your opponents from cursing the body, our one body, casting spells with it, consuming it, etc. However, the beer angle is not well known about. Haven't you noticed that beer brewers have royal seals on their work? The seal also says things like, established in 1800 whatever. Well, if you have a population to feed, why would you bake so much bread? Bread goes bad. If you brew beer, it will last much longer. Ale is like a liquid bread, if you brew it correctly. It can be very heavy and full of carbs. You can sort of feed people like that, and keep them sort of drunk and malleable. So each royal family will brew beer for their people, to keep them fed and drunk and stupid. But who is the crest for, if the beer is for the pleb? The crest is for the royal. An elite abroad today knows just where to buy his pizza, and where not to buy it. You don't want mystery meat pizza, or maybe you do. You won't know what is in each person or in each city states beer without seeing the royal crest on it. When an elite walks into a bar and sees a certain crest, he knows the cattle in the bar belongs to a certain family, and that the beer they drink was made just for them, to make them more consumable during human trafficking. You wouldn't want to drink a certain faction's beer if you knew who made it, and how they like to do business. The acorn that the reclaimer bears, the mystic fucking pinecone you all can't decipher, is hops. The secret of taking a fledgling agricultural society and turning its bread into beer, and its free people, into your personal cattle. The other thing about the royal crest on the beer is understanding where those people will go if they are shanghaied through a trapdoor in a bar. They serve a certain beer with a certain crest, so you can see what family is taking the people who disappear, so you will know who is boss as you travel around. It's out in the open, just their style. I would also like to add that there are several types of tunnels, not just trapdoors and bars and saloons that take people. There are natural cave systems. There are border tunnels. There are underground military bases. There are vacuum sealed hypertransport tunnels. There are underground scientific institutes. There are historical 
architectural catacombs, like Seattle, or almost all of Europe and Asia. There are subway and train tunnels. There are secret society tunnels. There are underground railroad tunnels. Every faction occupied tunnels at some point, and or cut new ones. As various allied forces engage with tunnel snakes under the guise of counter-narcotics operations and counter-human trafficking ops, eventually the battalions will be exposed to things they were not supposed to see. Children and rumors of children that are happening right now are one thing, but there are allegedly other facilities. It's entirely possible that a breach team makes it into a biolab and catches a disease. Then they have to seal the tunnel. They could also find monsters. And I don't mean zombies in the sense of Resident Evil, but monsters in the sense of Resident Evil genetically engineered animals. It will be almost impossible to contain certain things, and the deaths in these tunnels will be catastrophic. It will take decades to clear them, and map them, and disclose them. I'd almost rather fill them all up with concrete, but a lot of the deepest tunnels are over 12,000 years old. There is more to gain, from the government's perspective, to turn hell into an archaeological dig. So be it. You are sharing conspiracies of a fifth age, filled with magic and monsters, wondering when and where they will come from. They were under your feet the whole time. You thought being a paladin or a warrior of light would mean confronting people, face to face, and it does mean that. It also means climbing into something the size of an air duct to literally fight demons in the dark. The human horrors are bad enough. The scene in the movie Road where they find people being kept alive in the basement for food, that's what some of these tunnels are like. There may have been a large gallery with a large entrance and a large complex network, but it was sealed off except for an air tunnel that's 1,000 feet long and only 10 inches by 10 inches. The marines had to climb through natural caves for 6 hours just to find that 10 inch portal, so they get a small drone and send it down there. And when it pops out the other side, it's a room and people are screaming and roaring, but the drone has no visual. The thing is, the people wouldn't be screaming unless the drone went down there. They could have been down there for years, surviving on their own excrement, chewing their own arms off, babbling to each other. There are even babies conceived and born in these conditions. They even grow up and turn into little monsters. Thermals reveal what is really going on. There are no windows, no doors, no lights, no tables, no furniture, just bodies, crawling and writhing on top of each other like snakes in a pit. Rescue is a strong word. In the road, when they opened the door, the people tried to fucking eat him and pull him in just as much as they tried to escape. The sight of them, their skin, their eyes, their deformities, scars a person for life. There are 32 million like that down there. If you believe the 28 battalions that are running ops down there, they actually set off detonations that mimic earthquakes. The shock waves make very unique, incidental harmonics because of the long and straight modern machine cut tunnels. On a seismograph, it's unlike any other curve you've ever seen. Even an earthquake wobbles back and forth, and it dissipates. Tunnel shock waves roll in one smooth motion from one end to the other, which is how you find them. You would think that they could use thermal or ground penetrating radar, or even x-ray or something, satellites, to find the tunnels and the people down there. However, with the other billions of us on the surface, driving around, working and living, you can't discern what is on the terrain and what is subterranean. You would have to stop the whole world and tell them to go home in order to use machines to image tunnels from outside. I honestly don't think that's what's happening here though. Like I said, rescue is a strong word. These people won't have a language. They won't fundamentally understand anything and will be completely feral. You can't put them on TV. They don't understand. You would think that missing children who remember what it was like 
to take the Pledge of Allegiance would remember home. But those kids are taken for programs that end in death. Most are sacrificed, others cut apart and sent out to organ trafficking. Some kept for breeding programs or genetic modification. It's too much of a liability to take a viable, critical thinking surface dweller and put them in these systems. They might find a way out or lead the others. Not that there's anywhere to go, in the case of the ten inch shoot. When the faction that put them there lost power, they probably sealed it up just to torture them some more. And who knows how long they have really been down there. Even after blasting towards it, the experience of reaching the gallery is only more and more frightening for the marines. The closer they get to the gallery, the louder their absolutely chilling screams and noises become. As you get to the last 20 feet of the chute, all you can see is arms reaching into it, clawing at each other, peeling at skin and biting. All you see is teeth and disfigured, hellish faces. The marines don't want to breach to completion. The horde in the gallery will attack and try to eat them or something. As you watch the portal through a spotlight, you can smell them. The instinct to take your weapon system to condition zero is unlike anything you will ever experience in your life. Just witnessing the teeming mass of not human causes shock in hardened veterans and causes foxhole conversions in the psyche who now openly prays to God, murmuring not under his breath, but out loud. You can't experience these things, fighting this level of evil, and the opponent isn't even there to take the blows. It really destroys you, these things. These things stop you from sleeping at night. Knowing what really happens to the 800,000 missing children in the United States every year. Knowing that it happens right below your feet. And you try to drown your sorrows, but the sigil on Budweiser is the same sigil on the tunnels that give you the worst nightmares, the ones you have while you are still awake. Let me make one thing clear. If you are a warrior of a light, then it was your destiny to descend into these cramped tunnels like Master Chief in some American power armor and eviscerate whatever lies in front of you. Don't you find it odd that in fantasy settings for hellscapes, a paladin or other righteous character frees lost souls or saves them in hell by vanquishing them? You kill them. That's how you rescue them. You can't bring them out. They bite you. They roar. They drool. They growl. They are animals. They hiss and bare their teeth. They fling excrement at you. Even if you put them in a cage, you can't reform them. The stuff you see in mental institutions is nothing compared to what happens underground and the allied forces did not expect these levels of horrors. When the enemy says, think of the children, tongue in cheek, that's a cold scare to the warriors of light because you can't not think about them, the walking nightmares. Set a few free and you've got a real skinwalker. That's where the monsters come from. That's why you have an instinctive fear of long, skinny, deformed, malnourished, naked, white fanged freaks. So the question of China's relationship to the NWO and how old and deep that relationship really is, is answered with cannibalism. The Chinese have been subjugated for so long that cannibalism is mainstream. They regularly consume humans, especially babies in urine. There are periods of China's history where the archival material is missing for hundreds of years. We have no idea who farmed them or why and for how long, but we do know that it happened for so long that if you disclosed the cannibalistic child assault tunnels beneath the forbidden city that dates all the way to before Persia, the Chinese people will laugh about it and cook another fetus. That's how deep they are with the old world order, that you can't tell the difference between the Satanists, the NWO, the Illuminati, the Deep State, the Chinese. You can't tell any of them apart at the level China exists on. 
Hell is a real place, and you can go down there and fight the demons. That's the real red pill of human civilization. China is the eternal reservoir of this evil. Even when the Europeans in Germany were equivalent to cavemen and were scared shitless of Romans, and neither of them knew about the Americas, China had full access to transcontinental human trafficking networks. The world never underwent the last cataclysm. That's how old China's relationship with this entity really is. The last cataclysm covered the American structures in mud, and the flood waters carved out the Grand Canyon. In Egypt, those same flood waters ripped the casing stones off the pyramids. China was barely hit. Their operation didn't stop at all. They had access to the Atlantic network the whole time. That's how deep the relationship is. That's all you really need to know. You can't fight that ultimate and ancient evil without getting to China in the end. Just like you can't breach the tunnels in the Middle East without getting to Hamas at the dead end. Hi there friends, it seems weird speaking to you at the beginning of the video instead of the end, but I felt it was necessary to say, before this video starts, I am not promoting anything in this thread, I am just relaying the information to you. I do not agree with it, and I encourage you to do your own research on the harms of smoking and nicotine, and decide for yourselves whether that's something you want to do. Please do not base your decisions on something that could affect your health very badly on the opinions of some idiots on 4chan. That's all I'm going to say about the video. I hope you enjoy. See you later, friends. Why are there so many ads telling us not to smoke cigarettes and vape? I mean, what is the real reason? California banned flavored tobacco. The US government banned Juul. It seems to me that the elites in the US don't want the masses using nicotine. And we all know that they don't care about our health, considering the poison jab. It almost makes me think that nicotine is really good for you. Even Harvard says nicotine has benefits for reaction time, mental focus, even protection against Alzheimer's. So is nicotine actually really good for us and not as dangerous as they say? The smoke is bad. The tobacco plant is bad but the chemical nicotine inside it has limited health effects. Because it kills the workforce of the elites too fast. Because tobacco is sacred to the Native Americans, and elites don't want their slaves using it to commune with the creator. Also because schizos chain smoke to enhance their powers, and psychos don't want that. I roll my own and smoke more than 20 a day. You're just that surprised that the clown world is doing something good for once. Smoking was the largest cause of death and disease, the largest cause of all health problems, as it contributes to all of them strongly. It's to save money on healthcare and time, on smoke monsters taking up resources. Get everybody addicted to tobacco. Tell them to sit and smoke while creating our world in the 20th century. Everybody smoked and performed their robotic jobs. Smoking taken away. Everybody wonders why they are depressed, anxious, and ineffected in the world that smoke has created. Antidepressants are shilled to these people. The answer is because they'd rather you be on antidepressants and Neuralink. That's the only reason you can't smoke inside in the US. The USA regime is part of an eschaton, emanimatizing plan, just like Nazi Germany was, and they are the only two nations to ban smoking like this. I don't like nicotine though, I like my weed without it. You are totally right. For a few decades now, people keep talking shit about asbestos, in ads, movies, and documentaries. You should totally find some and breathe all that you can, so you can see why they don't want you to inhale it. This is either one of the dumbest troll threads on the board, or a glowy post. It's no secret that years of tobacco usage causes health problems in a large amount of people. You don't need government statistics to see that in your own life. Yes, the nicotine stuff isn't itself absolutely awful, but any consistent 
delivery method available is bound to fuck you up over time. Either use it sparingly, ritualistically, like shamans in South America, or don't bother. This post is blatantly trying to mislead people, and I feel bad for anyone that sees this shit and falls for this shit. When Mexico banned vaping products, I distinctly remember President AMLO stating that it was because of accelerated heart damage from vaping. We don't have the war on menthol cigarettes that NZ and the US and elsewhere do. I have never, ever, ever, ever seen chewing tobacco here, or even a person vaping for that matter, only in the USA. If that is the true reason that it was banned here, then it got nipped before widespread uptake. The taxes from tobacco essentially is what runs your entire public school system. Why would they obsess over banning menthol products or their likelihood of getting others hooked on it? Unless they still plan to go forward with so-called socialized medicine and really do not collect enough in that tax revenue to offset the lifelong health costs for heart damage and other complications. Conspiracy-wise, I'd fully believe NZ and or the US wanted to ban tobacco for its properties of inhibiting apoptosis and cytokine storms. But Mexico does attempt to make healthcare accessible to everyone, and I don't pay any particular IVA or tax for choosing cigarettes instead of potato chips or soda or carrot sticks. Many places remain cash only and may not even have a register or scanner that distinguishes what exactly you even bought. Why tobacco over other vices like alcohol or sugar, I don't know. The fact that smoking is bad for you is pretty evident, and even a basic understanding of biology should make it intuitive that inhaling smoke into your lungs is going to damage them. It's unhealthy, and I can imagine the drain on the economy was big enough to start some aggressive campaigns. Anyways, time for some more interesting theories. First of all, nicotine is definitely capable of improving the brain. It's a fast-acting stimulant and works on acetylcholine rather than dopamine like other stimulants do. Excess dopamine can be neurotoxic, but elevated acetylcholine is neuroprotective and specifically improves memory and creativity. It's a subtle benefit, not aggressive like amphetamines, but I've noticed I work better after taking nicotine and will often use nicotine gum when I need a mental boost. Another theory is related to the social component of smoking. There are very few times for people to just exist and talk in American society, especially with people outside of your immediate family. The smoke break was one of these times where multiple people would go outside together and just talk, all while under the influence of a substance that enhances cognition. The only other common time people talk with strangers is under the influence of alcohol, which numbs cognition. Basically, by demonizing smoking, another avenue for people who normally would never meet to communicate was removed, and the remaining ways to meet people involve the use of substances which make you stupider, not smarter. Good post. Why would they be moving towards banning cigarettes while legalizing weed and everything else up to and including fentanyl? Not to mention 70 to 80% of Americans on one prescription pill and 20% on five or more. It should be clear that they think there are too many people. And the last thing motivating them is the health, longevity, reproduction, and happiness of their slaves. I'm pretty sure anti-smoking ads are meant to tempt people, mostly recovering nicotine addicts, to smoke. They can't tell you to smoke cigarettes, but they can tell you not to smoke cigarettes. They want you drinking alcohol, candida, and to avoid smoking, anti-candida. When candida is present in the body, the skin turns pale. This is how the immune system is suppressed, and the person is rendered into a docile state. Heart is closed, emotions off, spiritual experiences off, connection to nature, none. Charisma, low if any. Basically, total numbness and unhappiness, total loss of innocence, reptilian traits in its place, money, sex, power, misery, the fallen human, 
the human whose personality has been replaced by a demon. The huge propaganda campaign against tobacco in the 1990s and early 2000s seems quite sinister in retrospect. Like, I never thought about how stupid the concept of secondhand smoke was until the COVID nonsense, when I started to reevaluate other conventional wisdom re-health. There was just absolutely no way you were going to get cancer from occasionally being around cigarette smoke in a public restaurant, but this is literally what we were told and no one questioned it. It just didn't seem like a big deal at the time, and no one felt like sticking their neck out to protect smokers' rights. Looking back on it, I do think that outlawing public smoking was an early exercise in social control, and they were testing whether people would bend to authoritarian public health laws for the flimsiest of reasons. Besides that, the way they demeaned smokers as people is similar to how anti-vaxxers were treated in COVID times. All that stuff about how smoking makes you reek and turns your teeth yellow was basically a personal attack. When I was in high school in the 2000s, yes, I'm old as fuck. There were these posters and pic related, making smokers look like disgusting lepers. Plus, smokers were made to stand outside buildings like outcasts. There was no legitimate reason to come down on them so hard. Now they make them walk all the way to the street, off property. I don't even smoke, and I used to like standing around with the smokers, shooting the shit. The school I went to used to have tons of people hanging out in the courtyards, smoking cigarettes. Went back to one recently, and it was like a ghost town, with people just scurrying from building to building with their heads down. It's to save our money. Bullshit. Explain the obesity crisis then. People are a million times unhealthier these days with obesity rates through the stratosphere. And the elites don't seem to give one shit about that. So I'm skeptical that they were ever concerned about our health. What was even the point of making everyone quit smoking if they just decided to put so many processed chemicals into our food that like half the nation got too fat to walk? Yeah. This idea has been tossed around for decades. Nicotine is good for gut problems like IBS. Asylums often let the patients chain smoke all day because it improves their behavior. It helps people focus, think, have lucid dreams. These days, it's getting kind of ridiculous. On television, smoking cigarettes is depicted as stupid, disgusting, suicidal. Meanwhile, Young teens smoking pot is depicted as just a normal part of growing up. Like that show Jim Carrey was in, where he played a Mr. Rogers satire. Or that show with the redhead girl. I am not okay with this. There's a scene where kids pressure each other to smoke pot, and one kid is like, everyone is doing it. It wasn't that long ago smoking pot was taboo. Like in How I Met Your Mother, or any network TV show, pot was never mentioned. Ever. It's about separating humanity from their free will, their soul, spirit, feelings, etc. Nicotine is energizing and helps people think and feel, so it's demonized. Meanwhile, pot which makes people slow, apathetic, not have dreams at night, is promoted. It's a hard question to answer. On one hand, you have a systematic march towards delegitimizing tobacco as a pastime and valid drug choice that extends society-wide. On the other hand, you have extremely large and powerful tobacco companies whose advertising has been completely gutted and have been known to utilize online undercover campaigns, such as the posts in this thread, to try and convince consumers of the health benefits, etc. of their product because they can't advertise any other way legitimately. My final analysis is that smoking is indeed very bad for you, but that it's a cultural icon of white America that persists as the drug of choice alongside alcohol in majority male and white communities. And as such, it stands at a crossroads where governments are incentivized to lie to you that it's about your health when it's actually about destroying communities that they disagree with. And yet, Large tobacco companies are incentivized to lie to you that it's a decision about personal rights and historical precedents when it's actually a choice about health. 
the ultimate winners, probably the insurance companies. They either make more money from smoking premiums, or they make more money from inflated healthcare costs. Why are cigarette smokers so delusional as to think that they have less rights or public support than weed smokers? Maybe among Zoomers and Redditors, but no establishment or mainstream institution has even taken the stance that weed is better than tobacco. Maybe in the southeast or some part of the country, that is true. But on the west coast plus Colorado, smoking weed is 100% higher status and promoted as harmless, and even beneficial, which is the exact opposite of the way cigarettes are portrayed. Some western states have legalized drugs up to and including fentanyl, while jacking cigarette taxes all the way up and making them walk off property, all the way to the street to smoke. Also see Canada for an entire country with this policy slash mind state. Suppresses immune response to certain things. The additives cause cancer. Nicotine acts as a blood thinner. The perfect storm. The combination speed up aging and illness due to the stress on the body trying to fight it. Stress is related to all illness. Nicotine has a false calming effect, similar to how opioids dull the senses to pain, but it's still there. Pure tobacco is better and for rituals, but gluttony has and will always kill. The body loves shortcuts, anything to reduce the workload, less to produce. Addiction is embedded into your subconscious. Weak souls cannot truly quit, hence why evil goes after kids, to ensure the destruction of God's greatest gift, free will. Gummy worm flavored vapes surely are not designed to entice the young. Get real. Faith in a higher being is the cure. God's network will connect you to power beyond the people that peddle cigarettes. If you can reduce smoking to a few cigarettes a day, it's quite nice. Focus, relaxation, attunement with yourself, kind of like a short break from the world but chain smoking kills all drive and makes you into an addict. Like every other drug, you are chasing a high, albeit not as bad as fentanyl or benzos or whatever cursed shit is flooding the market. As always, balance is key. Your health should always be your primary concern. What the politicians and their propaganda machine decide to do isn't important at that point. If they don't ban it, they have no influence on your behavior or your life whatsoever, and it shouldn't be a concern to you. Nice thread anyway. Very interesting. I wish you wouldn't be so biased towards the positive effects, but alas. Good to know some medical terms extracted from this thread. Cheers fellow smokers. What goes on in DUMBs? Give me all the info on underground bases that you got. AI development, world surveillance, underwater construction, human cloning, animal cloning, splicing slash chimera experiments, portal experiments, highest level classified science experiments, high level neuro linguistic programming, robotics testing, kidnapping, trafficking, mining, paranormal experiments, world leader meetings, rituals, black masses, altars, high-level executions and assassinations, currency storage, stored history records, blood drinking, adrenochrome storage facilities. This, these underground military facilities are used for trauma-based mind control slash monarch programming, genetic and other human experimentation, military slash NWO technology development and storage, including advanced anti-gravity crafts, child slash human trafficking, assault, torture, breeding programs, and other fucked up things. Some quotes. Much of this black ops drug money is being used to fund projects classified above top secret. These projects include the building and maintaining of deep level underground bases, such as the Chrysanthium, underground biogenetics facility in Dulce, New Mexico, Pine Gap in Australia, Precom Beacons in Wales, Snowy Mountains in Australia, the Niala Range in Africa, west of Kindu in Africa, next to the Libyan border in Egypt, 
Mount Blanc in Switzerland, Narvik in Scandinavia, Gotland Island in Sweden. There are at least 1400 of these DUMBs worldwide, 131 in the US, with two underground bases being built per year in the US at the moment. The average depth of these bases are four and a quarter miles underground, some shallower and some deeper. The bases are on average the size of a medium sized city. Each DUMB costs between 17 and 26 billion dollars to build, which is funded by MI6 CIA drug money. A nuclear powered drill is used to dig underground. The drill goes through rock at a tremendous rate and literally melts the rock away to form a smooth glass like surface around the edges of the tunnels. Project Mannequin was started in 1972 and is still being run from a six level underground facility beneath the small town of Peasmore in Berkshire, a few miles from where I grew up. Also, the CLC-1 base under Westminster in London and connected to the large base under Parliament, the Monsoon 1 facility, under RAF Lakenheath, 90 miles north of London, and the underground facility below the Porton Down Biowarfare Facility in Wiltshire. This underground base is so secret that the local residents of Peacemore are not even aware it exists. This NSA facility, known in intelligence circles as the AL-499 base, is located 200 feet below the village. There are entrances to the facility at Greenham Common, known as Bravo Entrance, which is now sealed off, Watchfield Military Science College, Delta Entrance, Harwell Laboratories in Oxfordshire. There are entrances to the base in Lamburn and Welford in Berkshire. The underground base at Lamburn is the Area 51 of the UK, with many exotic anti-gravity aircraft stored there. The people running the AL-499 facility in Berkshire and the connected underground bases are a hardline military regime that is ultimately a religious cult centered around the corrupt Zionists and Rosicrucians. These places are religious centers where so-called black magic rites are performed, ancient deities worshipped, and children trained and sacrificed. One of the largest research centers for experimental programming is on the west coast of the United States. A large research facility is underground and is combined with sophisticated military laboratory research. Another is in East Berlin, and another is in Prague in Europe, and yet another one exists in Rome. A large underground facility located in Czechoslovakia, this facility has numerous altars within it, where sacrifices are done continuously, day and night, for the spiritual empowerment of the project. The facility is equipped with high-tech equipment. Mornington Crescent, that London underground tube station which has been closed since whenever, contains the entrances to British intelligence's tunnels to Illuminati HQ. This is where they all go to perform their satanic rites, not just old World War II secret bunkers. There is also a tunnel under the Thames from MI6 to the Houses of Parliament, a whole underground network that not too many people know about. Underneath the Royal Observatory upon Greenwich Hill, there is a large military base accessible by a trapdoor within the observatory or the Queen Anne's colonnaded house next door to Queen Anne's garden. People have been abducted, tortured, and murdered down there for many decades now and upon Prince Philip's orders, not to mention the child sacrifice that goes on down there. The underground city below Area 51 is called Zion or Mars and it has a mirror underground city also named Zion located in Israel. Valhalla is in northwestern Kansas, underneath Gove County. My training was completed in the USA at age 14 years old by Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino in a special laboratory established at Dolce Underground Base. Delta training included the weaponization of psychic ability or psychic warfare training. Hidden high atop the mountainside along going to the Sun Road at more than 6,600 is the secret tunnel entrance to an extensive underground 
NATSE slash CIA facility. In the above satellite image, the larger circle denotes the hidden rock facade entrance and the smaller circle denotes the position of camouflage guards. The secret tunnel descends more than two miles to a giant hollowed out industrial complex below the mountain. This huge underground city slash base connects Montana to Canada, just north of the national border at the cleverly named International Peace Park. This underground base is where the CIA keeps its stolen Holocaust trillions and tests its most secret New World Order black projects, including Tesla's flying disc, optically invisible aircraft, and other stolen Tesla technologies. Operations at the base include maintenance and deployment of stealth drones. Glacier National Park was the first national park to have railroad access at the time, a necessity for a large-scale military industrial construction. This enabled them to transport the rumored Nazi gold train of stolen Holocaust loot from Montak, NY, to the secret base located inside the mountain. On the promontory above the secret tunnel entrance, there is a strange looking outcropping of rocks that at certain times of the day looks like a grizzly bear, hence the name Grizzly Peak. The CIA uses this secret tunnel to illegally smuggle drugs, guns, SS Nazi war criminals, and dignitaries into Canada without stopping at any border crossings. The secret tunnel to the underground base is hidden behind a remote controlled movable rock wall located in the side of the mountain on going to the sun road shown in this photograph just north of grizzly peak and the weeping wall in the far background the garden wall can be seen and at far right is the base of haystack boot the tunnel entrance was cut out of the bedrock by precision laser to prevent any possible discovery when the base is active during the summer months there are armed and camouflage guards hiding on the mountainside, surrounding the secret tunnel entrance. The Nazi New World Order keeps its stolen Holocaust trillions and stolen Tesla technology secretly hidden inside this hollowed out mountain facility, providing access only to the New World Order elite. The CIA Nazis use stolen Tesla technology to create artificial anti-gravity fields around Glacier National Park, the nearby Blackfoot Indian Reservation and many of our locations throughout the world. There are hundreds of satellites orbiting the Earth that project high-intensity, positively charged laser beams to certain areas on the Earth. The New World Order Nazis use these beams not only as weapons, but also to transmit power to levitating aircraft, flying disks, and other various stolen Tesla technologies below. The absorptive properties of the levitating aircraft allow their utilization of energy beamed from orbital plasma generators, optimally transmitted when the stealth aircraft are themselves plasma cloaked for optical and radar invisibility, giving off only infrared light. A hazardous byproduct of these space laser beams is radon gas. Radon is said to be an invisible gas that causes cancer and leukemia in humans and animals. But if you ask the US government about radon gas, you will not get a straight answer. Native Americans on the nearby Blackfoot Reservation have suffered from extremely high rates of cancer and leukemia since the 1950s. The US government says that nothing is wrong and there is no reason to be concerned. Yet suffering communities must be informed of the true cause of their severe ailments. The SR-71 Blackbird B-2 stealth bomber planes and anti-gravity flying disks are constantly hovering just below 200 in the skies above Glacier National Park and the Blackfoot Indian Reservation. This explains why commercial flights are forbidden to fly below that in Glacier National Park and why no one is allowed to bring firearms into the park for protection against the aggressions of the resident grizzly bears. There are many more secret CIA bases at other national parks around the country, including the Grand Canyon. These planes are optically invisible and make no audible sound at all. The SR-71 et al. are periodically brought into the secret underground hangars located in the hollowed out mountain below Grizzly Peak on going to the Sun Road. 
these levitating airplanes are slowly lowered into the waters of Lake McDonald in Glacier National Park, seen above. The planes are capable of traveling underwater, like submarines, for short distances. Once the planes are submerged in Lake McDonald, they travel to the underground slash underwater hangars inside the hollowed out mountain. Once inside the underground hangars, the planes are serviced. There is a giant elevator inside the mountain that brings the planes up to a full-sized hidden runway inside the mountain. During the night, when going to the sun road is closed, a large camouflage section of the mountain is briefly opened for aircraft to exit the facility. Once the plane has left the mountain base, the secret runway bay doors are closed. Otto Scorsini presented the photograph below, taken on August 27, 1997, describing the hidden stealth technologies active around Glacier Parks like McDonald. Scorsini pointed out the flat, squared rock as being a hidden flat panel radar array. One feature among several secret installations enabling covert surveillance of the sensitive airspace. The disc-shaped cloud is actually a plasma-cloaked stealth disc aircraft, silently hovering above the CIA boat. Photos of cloud-enveloped discs are well known in UFO circles. The US government claims that SR-71 Blackbirds in hangars are wet because they expand and shrink while flying, thereby causing condensation buildup. That line is disinformation. Stealth planes spray mists of water on themselves while flying to create the illusion of optical invisibility by interaction with the electrified aircraft shell. Water vapor is used by stealth planes to disguise the aircraft in a white-colored artificial cloud that, when ignited, forms a plasma mirage envelop for complete optical cloaking. To use the words of Otto Scorzani, the stealth planes are like flying ozone generators. This advanced application of HHO plasmas derived from water allows the planes to be lowered through the waters of Lake McDonald or other lakes around the US to secret underwater slash underground CIA facilities. The term bloodliner has been applied to psychopathic victims of generational sexual abuse, as in the case of the sheriffs, a designation that may be supported scientifically by a genetic predisposition to psychopathy among males with the YY chromosome, rare exceptions to the predominant XY. Otto Scorsini exposed a multi-generational human reproduction experiment for the Fourth Reich repopulation of North America with secret subterranean Aryan populations exceeding 20 million. Scorzani reported himself to be one of the elite inseminators for the vast human reproduction experiment, now in its sixth decade, being conducted at the secret Nazi base in Glacier National Park, Montana and elsewhere below the bedrock of America. Hitler's entire Nazi Third Reich of 50,000 plus have been living in secret underground bases throughout the United States, Canada, England, France, and Italy ever since the supposed end of World War II. They have been actively planning for their new world order or Fourth Reich in America at these secret underground bases. The initial 50,000 Nazis have been reproducing like rabbits for the last 58 years. It's estimated that there are now more than 20 million of them living in America above ground and below ground in secret NWO bases. The 20 million does not include the millions more who are secret Nazi sympathizers. American citizens are forbidden to enter these US government-sponsored NWO bases under penalty of death. Secret bases include Area 51, NV, Camp Hero, Montauk, NY, Las Cruces, NM, Wright, Pattinson, Underground Air Force Base, OH, and the secret hollowed out mountain base in Glacier National Park, MT. Why did the world used to feel so much more real and tangible before like 2015 or 2016? When I think back to the 2000s and the early 2010s, it felt like there was so much more to life and color in the world back then. Things were so much more vivid and realistic, whereas life in the late 2010s and the 2020s feels fake and dulled. 
like seeing life through a YouTube video, rather than actually living it. What changed? I am not the only one who comments on this though. Loads of people have all agreed with me that something shifted in the mid-2010s, and the world became substantially more fake and vapid after that point. There is some disagreement on the specific year when things changed. Some say 2016, some say 2014, some say 2012. But the general principle has been recognized by millions of people the world over. This is not the same world we were living in 15 or 20 years ago, that's for sure. Propaganda. If you turn off the screens, the world hasn't changed, just the narrative. I don't know why so many Westerns have double think on this. It's hard to admit we live in a strange type of totalitarianism ran by the media. This is wrong. I've spoken to people much older than me, 40s, 50s, 60s, and so on, who all agree that something fundamentally changed in the mid-2010s, and the world became a surreal, crazy place. You can't turn off screens in the 2020s. You need basic things like smartphones and social media accounts to function in modern society. The destruction of the real, thanks to information overflow and endless simulation. We are a product and consequence of our surroundings, the things we see, and the things around us in 2023 is anything but real. Concrete brutalist architecture, endless construction, soul-crushing advertisements and conglomerates, divided nationalities. We turn to entertainment to get some solace, some connection with authentic, creative, cultural expressions. But in entertainment and media, the shackles of unreality grasp unrestrained. A complete distraction of the real. Thousands and thousands of transfigurations of culture every second. Our limbic systems hijacked for the purpose of content. Our most innate feelings and desires and everything that is good, packaged and quantified and packaged in a 24-7 algorithmic stream. Every day, we stray further from being human. What changed? The funny thing is, this was bound to happen. The forces lurking beneath societal progress made this outcome inevitable. Part of it is also just becoming older. The mental shift that happens in your 20s is akin to a complete reconstruction, and it necessarily means less childlike wonder and joy. That's probably just an evolutionary trait that is also unstoppable. Quite sad, but unstoppable, and gives you advantages in other aspects of your being. We are living in an age where everything is simulated. I mean everything. The idea of friendship, simulated. The idea of love, simulated. Culture and counterculture, simulated. Art, politics, Community, respect, loyalty, simulated, packaged, resold, merchandised, quantified, reconstructed, remade 100 times, finely tuned. So we're a bunch of evolved monkeys who really value things like love and community and expression. They all live in a hyper-simulated, technologically advanced, overcrowded, interconnected super society that has been overtaken by a single demon called production. We really value things like community, but this demon and its very smart ways have found ways to merchandise and gain profit off of everything. From community to mental health to everything. Us monkeys really value these things. But sadly, the underlying capitalistic forces that govern societies and their growth don't value anything but production and profit. Endless production. And all these things that were once very real, and that us monkeys really deeply value, have been subjugated and hijacked for other means. And because of the insanely, inhumanly fast flow of information, this just happens everywhere, and it's very widespread, and also subtle. It's screens, monitors, TV. By blasting your eyes with screen rays for more hours than not, you train your brain to become accustomed to an oversaturated color perception, making real life seem less vibrant. This leads to slow, subconscious disassociation from reality. Pre-2016, 
seems less real to me because my life was shit and I put myself in front of a screen a lot to cope. Nowadays, it's much better. No clue, but I have experienced it too. Around 2014 is when it really started to go downhill and change. 2016 was like a portal year. I always looked back on it as a landmark of when things really got shitty, even before I knew it was a thing. I think I started feeling that lifeless feeling you speak of somewhere in 2017. After 2021, all bets are off. This shit is not real. I am ready to wake up from this coma dream simulation. Yeah, most likely so. I keep thinking of 2008, even though no much that I remember happened to me that year. I honestly think, thought that we, or at least I, were born into this simulation, and it's slowly revealing itself. You can take walks without being glued to a screen, but reality literally feels less tangible and vivid than it used to. Walking through nature doesn't feel or look the same as it did before 2016. Everything seems grayer, duller, and more lifeless. 2010 to 2011, tyrannical sadist enjoyed total victory and domination over the free peoples of Earth. Young people who showed any loyalty, courage, or intelligence were rounded up and disappeared. Evil won. This emptiness is the sorrow of endless humiliation by our captors. The world used to feel more alive because it was. The human spirit has been defeated. 2008. Wow, that woman can sing. 2023. Wow, that woman can't sing, but AI can fix it. Everything has exceeded reality. You see it all over the place. We've gone off the cliff edge. How the fuck do we fix it though? I can't bear living in a world like this any longer. I'm losing my fucking mind. Hyper-reality unironically. Yes, this. The more humanity learns of the universe and more tech evolves, the less mystery and wonder there is to be discovered, leading to an ever more jaded society. Uh, what you're saying isn't exactly hyper-reality, but I do agree with what you said. Hyper-reality is about technology, but specifically about technology of simulation. I would argue that massively proliferating simulation tech makes humanity less knowledgeable of the universe overall because we're becoming detached from reality. It's the one thing that's undefeatable though. That's the point. The entire place was set up to see the decision you will make when it ends. What lasts after the end, or what ends along with the ending. If you are here right now, it means you always have been and ever will be. There will come a moment when time itself ends and you will realize that you are still aware, without thoughts even, without language, which is the beginning of the illusion. In the beginning, there was the word. There has never been a past or future because it is always the present. Younger people have had little life experiences that they can draw upon to create cool shit. Identity politics are currently striding every other facet of life that could compete with it so people only have the party. And our society, as a whole, is losing touch from reality, with us being in the late stages of decadence. It's not about getting older. It's because whatever you're doing is either escapism or coping, and eventually the effectiveness of the thing runs off. If you were enjoying something without those two, it wouldn't become boring eventually. Unless it's something that's super instant gratification, MOBA's PvP, then that can have an effect on dopamine receptors. So, cope slash escapism gaming, too much time on monitors, equals derealization, equals everything sucks now, equals touch grass, deal with your anxieties and traumas, stop being a bitch about your life and take responsibility, stop being a victim, unless you wish to remain in a slave mindset for the rest of your life. Too much MOBA and CSGO, too much TikTok and social media, too much porn and cooming, equals dopamine receptors fry, equals I don't get the high from these games anymore, equals dopamine reset. Just stop doing things that give instant gratification. Start working on something that takes time, be it art or music or some work-related stuff. Get your fucking hands dirty, you lazy sloth. The longer something requires to get gratification, e.g. some book, the better effect it has at repairing the dopamine receptors. 
It's the context in which information is presented. That is the narrative control. I think the shift happened earlier in the tens. 15 to 16 is just when most people started to notice. On account of the sensational US presidential election and everything involved in it. However, for narrative control, you will be wanted to associate the change with those years to be less likely to look further into the past. Please analyze how you react to information which you receive. This will unveil the narrative patterns to you. There are two cases. One, maybe that's just what happens as you age. Life becomes less vivid, and people today are conscious enough to notice it. Or two, there is some extreme psyop gradually increasing. A zeitgeist of new thought patterns, making you more detached from reality. I imagine this is what femininity feels like. A melancholy detachment, observing over experiencing, like you are a video character. This is probably why the whole back rooms, liminal spaces, life doesn't feel real type of shit is trending. This is probably happening because of the age of Aquarius, but I think it's more sinister. We are gradually being weaved and spun into hell. Some black mirror-esque hell. There is a whole movement of political drones who want you to be depressed and unproductive, just like them. It reminds me of the Adam and Eve story. Eve made an oopsie, so now Adam needs to go through punishment alongside her. I digress. I have a third schizo theory, however. There is a parasitical entity invading this earth. They use radiation. We get radiated and over time depleted of color, energy, life, being literally drained for everything we are worth. What changed? Pluto exited Sagittarius and entered Capricorn in 2008. It easily explains a lot of things, like the progressive centralization of society, the dopamine of worldwide mass surveillance states, the reactionary trad fad taking off in 2016, the 80s nostalgia phase, the domination of corporations over individuals, the V meme about SOVL versus Solus, the SVB banking crisis, the Fed, the widespread corruption in the government, the fact that US politicians are involved in child trafficking and the underworld, and the seemingly absolute control of the PTB, Illuminati, Deep State, Glowies, Controllers, Archons, Reptilians, the secret actual rulers of society, and the quickly approaching total enslavement of humankind, and much more. If you understand what Capricorn represents, look around and you can see its signs everywhere in society. There was the financial crisis of 2007 to 08. Governments did something without precedent when they saved the con man that caused the crisis. They also realized they could print money and the economy would, apparently, not immediately collapse into hyperinflation. People really underestimate the power of money, and I don't mean it in the childish sense of money corrupts. Money helps everyone make decisions, but you can't make decisions if all money is fake. After 2012, central banks felt safe enough to start their scam, so they have printed money and pumped them into the market directly for all kinds of weird projects. From social projects, social media companies like Tinder, Facebook, Instagram, etc., and even your car, the way cities' infrastructure are made. Everything is based on money, completely created out of thin air and distributed by bureaucrats. This is why reality is fading because you don't live in a real economy anymore. More and more people are employed in bullshit jobs. And we're not talking the 80s bullshit job, where someone was miserable in an office, but actually doing stuff that helped people. We are talking people in bullshit jobs that have absolutely no true purpose, but the hope to convince some manager in a VC company with ties to a hedge fund, with access to the Federal Reserve or European Central Bank or Chinese Central Bank, to give them more money for useless stuff. Even people in trades are building stuff that nobody uses, designed to never be used by people who deep down know it's not going to be used. It's completely fake economy, where the government is deciding what gets produced by allocating freshly printed money. It's no wonder everything feels fake. It is fake. Your subconscious knows it. This is my true answer and yes, there are paranormal elements in it when you look close enough. I'm sorry, Anon. It's all been downhill since 2001 and on. 2003, 
The world still existed, but it was slipping. 2005, the rot had truly set in. Some traces of the world left, but it is now officially fake and gay. 2008, GG no re everybody. Better look, next incarnation. 2012, sharp downfall from 2008. The cake is officially baked. 2016, possible stirrings that things might actually get better. 2020 and on, the laughter of dark gods. You can see the teen rate of taking one's own life start to rise up in 2009 to 10, and goes up even further after that. If you look at Skyrim, the dumbed down version of Oblivion, it was released in 2011. It features things like the stupid constellation level ups and not being able to kill important characters. It was made easy so dumb young kids could play it, but we all played Oblivion and it was fine. They shitted up gaming to destroy escapism from their hell world. They are after everything like this. TTRPGs, movies, comics, and other hobbies. They want you to look them in the eyes while they fuck the world. COVID got everyone on the same focus. It sort of aligned everyone together. For me, I'd say 2013 was the last good year. I spent a good deal of it partying with friends. 2014 to 15 was spent mostly alone with occasionally fun times. 2015 to 16 with the election was like an echo of the old good internet. Trump's presidency was strange because things felt good, but it was almost like it was time to focus on the self. And when we all woke up in 2020, the evil plan had already been put into motion. 2023 is definitely the worst year so far. Shit is going downhill fast, and there is nothing good going on anywhere. Locally, I live in a decent area. Nothing good happens. Public events have a dark undertone to them. News and current happenings are awful. Movies, TV news is awful. The video games are shit. Even indie games now are garbage. It's obvious they want us to suffer. They want people to be insane. Yeah man, I did some traveling a year ago and went to a few places across America, thinking I'd find some great goings on or some nice places that are comfy. I'll tell you what I saw. Huge swaths of land that can essentially be summed up as poor. People are too poor to really do anything, especially these days. They are turned inward and focus on themselves. Poor might be the wrong word, since wealthier people also do this. They become more self-reliant and simply do their own thing. This is rural areas. A lot of young men of these families are in jail for dumb bullshit as well. The police state is hard at work for their masters. In rich cities, the debauchery and degeneracy is in full swing. The liberal propaganda is constant, and any connection people have is superficial. At least the restaurants are good, but seriously, going out to eat or drink is the pinnacle of this lifestyle. Pop-up communities, or something to that effect. The best sort of thing I could find. It's people usually gathered around for some camping or woods-related activity. But they all leave after some predetermined time, and a lot of it is pay-to-play type stuff. Mini festivals, a month-long sailing school, seasonal firefighters. These mini communities usually rock and feel good, but don't last. Everyone's gotta go back to work eventually. Seem like before there were permanent communities of people with common hobbies that don't really waste anymore. Four-wheelers, cooks, arts, games. I don't really see people doing these types of things IRL anymore. At least not in groups or communities. Also, the bit about young men being in prison is fucked. The cops are going insane at a much faster rate than the rest of us. This is true, and it's because the satanic highlight class has actively been dulling it since the end of World War II. It's just so much more apparent now. The dulling is reflected in practically all aspects of life most obviously in media, fashion, and architecture. In fact, this dulling is a result of the push for minimalism in these ways of life. Ever notice that music in the mid-2010s went to absolute shit regardless of genre? It all became bland and inoffensive. This is intentional. Clothes and buildings, same thing. All minimalist, brutalist, devoid of soul. All in the name of fairness, equality, utilitarianism whatever you want to call it. This is done to demoralize the people, get them to reject beauty and become perfect, little robots 
that never noticed their little life force energy had been drained. Destroy the economy. 1914 Federal Reserve Act. Look at our dollar now. It's a joke. And get them constantly stressed about their finances and feeding their families. Too distracted to notice how else they're getting screwed. To those who can still notice Satanist trickery, keep an eye on how much more bold they're going to get in the next years. As people become more drained, distracted, and worn out, they will no longer notice or care about blatant violations of the most basic human rights. This could be the part where the Satanists keep an eye on world governments, UN, WEF, hold their NWO stunt, and offer a fake solution to fix the problems they created. This has been the plan for who knows how long. Remember, these Satanists hate you and want you to suffer. They will not show mercy for one second. You must resist and not bend the knee in any way for them. Reject everything that comes out of these foul lying mouths. Reject any modern satanic way of life. Fight back by being the light the dark forces fear. Cut out all processed food and eat a very nutrient-rich diet. Another way they dull the mind is by depleting the nutrients in food, specifically magnesium for the brain and spirit, and zinc for hormones. Zinc depletion is why so many people look like they haven't hit puberty yet. Listen to music that actually heals you. On the 13th of the 2nd, 2021, an Antarctica thread regarding a newly cropped up picture of what appeared to be a spider-like creature in Antarctica cropped up on X that were found in a Google Earth thread. An Anon came forward claiming that his father was a doctor that worked at McMurdo Station in the New Zealand claimed Ross Dependency Area of Antarctica and that he knew about these creatures beforehand. The following are his posts before he went quiet. Boy, I sure do fucking love mutated penguin spiders. It's not my fault they have to live here. We're kinda in the same boat. I have no memory of choosing any of this. I guess they built them a big fancy new house here, but it already fell apart and leaked water everywhere. I had nothing to do with the polar bear murder last week. I thought that was wrong. You can buy land on the moon, but not on Antarctica. I find that interesting. Hmm. What would be the approximate size of it? Here is a zoomed in picture of the creature. OP, I am the foremost expert on the subject. My father was stationed in Antarctica at McMurdo Station. He's told me things. Y'all want to hear some fucked up shit? I'm using a name because it's easier for me to keep track of this shit. Some background. My dad is a doctor. Was stationed at McMurdo for 11 months in the 90s. Not saying what year, because he was the only doctor there, and y'all could track me down. Frequently went out on scientific expeditions. First and foremost, there were some areas people just didn't go to. They weren't environmentally hazardous, they were just avoided for one reason or another. When my dad asked one of the researchers who had been there for 10 years, he went pale and told him to shut up. It was about 30 miles south, 10 east of McMurdo. They took a 5 mile detour around whatever the hell was there. So already things are adding up. There were little outposts here and there, thinking a metal tube sticking out of the ground with a hatch in the side. They were supposedly emergency inclimate weather shelters, but the walls were too thin, and they were always locked. Secondly was a weird structure. My dad said one time they were cresting a hill near the spot they avoided, and a grey building with a white roof was in the distance, and that it didn't look like the normal shelters that they used, but almost like an office building. Also sorry about spelling and shit, I think faster than I can type and I want to get this out there. Thirdly, there were the striders. Big, fucking, five-legged things that crawled across the continent at night or in snowstorms. There were sightings from the military personnel there. Most of McMurdo is US Navy. My dad had a Polaroid of one of the footsteps and a track from one of the Dakars they had, and it was easily a foot deep into the snow 
that was already packed down from a 10 ton truck. Also, what the normal shelters look like. You make a good point. The official reasoning for Antarctica being controlled is they want to keep it the last untouched place on Earth. Like Strider from Half-Life Big, as far as they know. Footsteps at least 30 to 40 feet apart, and now, if you have ever played Pathways into the Darkness, one of the enemies resembles it, but only just. Think pick-related, but white slash grey. Seven to eight stories tall, and five legs instead of two. Like Morrowind Striders? Oh no, never seen him. KK, my guy. So as I said, my dad was a doctor. Got yelled at by his superior officer, who said they didn't need none of you unwanted smart types around here. Guy was a prick and hated anyone who wasn't a grunt or a researcher. Let leak to my dad, he was a replacement for a doc who had snooped around. Tried to scare my dad and shit. Guy was a total douche. One day, a guy who my dad knows for a fact isn't at McMurdo or any of the nearby bases comes in, escorted with severe lacerations. He is told that the guy fell. My dad calls bullshit. The cuts were too clean to be ice or rocks, plus no debris was left in the wound. The guy was delirious, and while he's under anesthesia, starts talking about things he probably shouldn't be saying. Something about, we let them loose, and they were frozen, we thought they were dead. He starts to say something else, but the guards yell at him to shut the fuck up and gag him. That's right, they gagged a guy who is only getting oxygen from a mask. My dad flips and rips it off, yelling at them and asking what the fuck they're doing. The guard sticks his M16 in my dad's face, forces him back to his quarters and doesn't let him out till the dude is patched up and waiting on the next plane from South America. In regards to Morrowind Striders, too small, too fat, but the legs are right. Think upright torso on five spindly legs, open top, much taller. Oh yeah, but after that, he started taking some stuff. He had an Apple IIe used for flight sims, and he started to keep track of information he had gathered. Said he hasn't looked at it in years. I'm going to try and get it out, and running, and see what I can find on it. Till then, not much else I know about what went on. He said he saw the Striders a few times in the winter, but kind of hard to prove. Says he's forgotten about a lot these days. If I can find the computer, I can get more stories. Other than that, not much else. One time they hit something with the Dakar, which was a big deal since there aren't many penguins in the Arctic, and when they got out, the researcher who told my dad to shut up forced him back into the car. Dad said it looked like one of the things from the Cloverfield movie, but you know, all fucking crushed to bits. So spindly, little legs, and the like. Says he thinks it was buried under the surface level of snow, which is why they didn't see it. Also, agreed, it sounds stupid, but what? A fast-growing, possibly supernatural apex cryptid with a wet, spindly body that only moves in low visibility? I'm only parroting what I heard. I would say it is maybe 20 to 40 feet tall, but I wasn't there. My dad's theory is that while taking boar ice samples, we found something, dug it up, and one or more escaped. They grew into what roams Antarctica, and we shut down the continent because of it. Anon claims that his dad had a wooden plaque from the station, and says he will post a picture. Give me a view, guys. I'm going to take a picture and censor the name of the plaque my dad got from being stationed at McMurdo. We'll have the whole X in the date thing to prove I ain't lying. Here is the pictures that OP took as promised. Found it and got it out. Can't find the keyboard though. And here is proof he was at McMurdo. Here is a picture of the pins. I can't get it running tonight. I'm honestly really tired. I have work tomorrow morning, but my dad literally just woke up, and I asked him, and he told me something he didn't already tell me. 
So people die in Antarctica. It happens. It's cold and accidents happen. Every time, someone died during the winter snowstorms though. He had to wait for them to fall and sew them back together. Similar wounds from the person who dipped in the summer. Except one man. Another he didn't know. Who was missing his lower half. This guy was carted in by similar guards. But not the same. His intestines had spilled out. And my dad had to sew on fake clove lower half after sealing up the guy's lower torso. They then dressed him in battle dress. The official cause of death is hypothermia, but we both know that's bullshit. His lower abdomen from the end of the ribcage down had been ripped off violently. There's shit out there in arms. You better fucking believe it. So I asked him a few more questions about injuries, and he said a lot of lost limbs from frostbite. A few cuts here or there. Those two are the only two that stick out to him. There were a lot of lacerations on people who did stuff outside in the winter, and the only ones allowed out were a certain group of Arctic warfare soldiers and the researchers. He said talking about all of this has gotten his memory going. Said he grabbed one of the researchers' journals one time, and it had all kinds of diagrams of shit that didn't look anything like any animal that was supposed to be out there. This is where he got his descriptions for the striders and the spiders. He cornered one of the researchers once and questioned her. She got really stiff and refused to tell him anything, and he later got a talking to from his cow about how useless he was and shit, and how if there was another incident, they were sending him back stateside. He ignored this though, and when his cow was away, looked through his files. This guy controlled the whole base at the time, found documents regarding certain operations during the winter months, and that there were requisitions for ammo. He got caught though, and this is what led to him being kicked back to the States. He got court-martialed, but because he never signed an NDA, and he never found anything bad, they docked his pay and sent him on his way. What's the source slash context behind him? I'm totally new to this one. It's from Google Earth. Some dude that was there took the pics around the place he was. I guess he was a scientist. Here is the pic previously mentioned. Let me get him to look at it. He says he doesn't know. It's on the opposite side of the continent from him, near some Australian and British stations. Other people's stories. Once they told my dad he was being shipped out, Despite the fact that it was the day he was supposed to leave, he stopped caring what people thought and started gathering stories from everyone he could. Most of it was I saw this or I saw that, but nothing he could really work with. Then came in Jones, not his real name. Jones was one of the Arctic warfare specialists, Green Beret. The guy was autistic, strong as fuck and smart as hell. Only got through all the training because he could hide himself and while being regarded, could do a lot that other members of his team couldn't do. But the one thing Jones had that the others didn't was a conscience. Jones felt bad for what he did, and my dad had an undergrad degree in psychology. They had an agreement. Jones hurts himself to get sent to my dad. My dad helps Jones get stuff off his chest. Everyone is happy. His buddies didn't know he is going to a shrink. He gets to feel good and the co gets to have a functioning soldier. One time, Jones wakes my dad up, about three days before my dad is supposed to ship out. It's two in the morning, Jones just came back from some mission, says he needs to talk to my dad. My dad tells him to fuck off, not this early, and Jones puts something on my dad's chest. It's the leg of one of these small things. My dad freaks out, and Jones puts a hand over his mouth and tells my dad a story. This is where it all comes together, Anons. Clench your ass. No bathroom breaks until the ride is stopped. Some of you may say this sounds like a story with supporting information leading to a climax. Fuck you. Got to make it sound good for YouTube, eh? Jones proceeds to tell my father the most fucking incredible story I have ever heard, and it confirms 
many theories on 4chan and IRL. And it proves American collusion with China's human trafficking. And it confirms the reason for tunnel warfare training us Marines recently undertook. Y'all ready? Jones gets woken up at 5 in the morning the previous day by his squad leader. Let's call him Jack. Jack tells him to get his ass up. To clarify, these are SFODA with a total of 12 men in the squad and that they're going somewhere. Jones expects an expedition with some researchers, but they don't. They go to the military Dakar with a hole up top for a gun turret. They have an M134 minigun inside the truck, but it's technically demilitarized, but not really, and load up their gear. They leave and make a beeline for the area everyone avoids. My dad figured this out when he said he was heading southeast, and they get to this office building, and it looks sort of like pick related, according to father's recollection, and they drove up to it. They park out front, operator their way inside, and it's fucking carnage. Think government lab in season 2 of Stranger Things. It's just fucking nuts. They clear a few rooms when one of their guys gets murked by one of these tiny fuckers. They light it up and keep going. There are offices with names on them. Some American, some Chinese, some Chilean. There are bodies everywhere. It's crazy, right? So two more guys get injured, and they're moved outside to the truck. The rest of them move downstairs to the tunnels. It's a secret lab, and it is gigantic. They have a strider in a cage that's fucking big, or at least they used to. Many of the cages are broken open, and there are dead bodies everywhere. Jones doesn't say much about this stuff, other than there are tunnels with bullet trains in them, with destinations like Hong Kong, New York, Melbourne, a city for every major country out there. They find a cage that has been ripped into with two spiders in it. They are eating children. In Antarctica, there are children? Shouldn't be fucking possible. Oh wait, China. It's been known for a while that China plays a huge part in its huge amount of human trafficking. Now we know where the bodies go. They found a few scientists and moved them to a different base. Exterminate most of the fuckers in there and move out. It took them almost 18 hours of pure fighting to clear that place out. So guys, I guess we really know what's going on. And I'm very, very, very grateful to get all of this out there. Honestly, my dad would kill me if he knew I have shared this. But honestly, I'm sick and fucking tired. I remember a time where I didn't know, where I grasped at straws for an answer to questions I could barely understand. Here it is, X. Here are your answers. Okay, so what are the striders? Extraterrestrial? Interdimensional? Subterranean? Hyper-evolved apex predator? I will answer questions for a few minutes. Ask away while you can. Subterranean. They start off small but grow real fucking fast. I'm assuming you're same guy, high on weed guy. I haven't read M411, but I think I should. I feel like it should be entirely possible for the government to take what they found in Antarctica and bring it to America for study in less inclement weather. I think they are frozen since the Ice Age and were apex predators at the time, like dog intelligence. No, less supernatural, more cryptid. Yeah, bullets work well against something that evolved long before humans. Not much armor, think like a bug. Hard outer shell, but easy to penetrate with a 5.56 FMJ. Not just there, and for more than food. Probably also experiments. Built by us, think just standard office building. Reinforced for the winters. Well y'all, I finna pass out. It's good to know I made my mark on 4chan history. I'm back guys, and I got news. As I said, this Anon always delivers yesterday. I said 9 o'clock p.m. EST, and on my clock, it's 9 o'clock p.m. EST. I can't find the latest thread it was. It was sometime around midnight last night that I joined it. 
found the old thread. Dim, stupid, read to get up to date. So the hard drive died a while ago, and my dad replaced it with a micro SD. Had to lie to get him to open the case, so no paper would name. But compare the desk, and it's the same. Apple 2SI hard drives didn't last long enough to be able to get the information off them. They are a 30 year old computer. Apparently, my dad replaced the hard drive with a scoozy to micro SD card, and the drive is long gone. Convenient, yes. Disappointing, also yes. But I'd rather come back and tell you than ghost and be regarded as a shill. It's entirely possible he held on to it. He holds on to everything. So I would have to go through boxes and boxes of old electronics to find the 40 megabyte hard drive that came with it. I'll go look and send a pic of what I would have to work with. It's possible, but I think it's just for research. Also on the LARPing thing, yeah, I know I slipped up when I said NDA. It wasn't exactly that, and it was more technical, but long story short, they couldn't legally get rid of him without a fuss being raised. They definitely have. I know of an Oklahoma story of something similar to what my dad saw in Antarctica, and small, spider-like creatures are in all kinds of these stories. Like I said, he doesn't get rid of anything. This is a third of the stuff in that storage room, and we have twice as much as this in the garage. Photo of the back offs. Copyright 1988 on the chip for both of them. I'ma take the one with the Apple sticker on it apart and see if I can find why it broke. If that screwdriver is the type with magnet tips, get it the fuck away from the drives. Why are you taking apart the drives? Holy shit, stop. What the fuck are you doing? Your concerns are warranted, but as I said before, this is a 30 year old hard drive for an unsupported OS that I know for almost a fact is broken. I think your intelligent side is right for thinking that, but it ain't no hoax. I am not promising shit. All I know is what I've been told. My dad archived his own stories and the stories of the people he worked with while he was at McMurdo. They are supposedly on this hard drive. This hard drive has been broken for at least five years. I'm not sure what else I can say. You're right, but fuck it. I ain't doing much with this life anyways. You should ask G what to do. Good idea. Done. If Fred is made on G, but is almost immediately removed by moderators. The wiring on both sides looks alright. It's probably the disc inside. Honestly, I'm not sure what to do. I ain't good with this kind of stuff. Most of the drives of this type died a long time ago, including this one, and I've shared all the stories. Have any suggestions, my guys? Yeah, guys, I can't get the info out of the drive without professional help. I'll go to a data recovery guy and get it out for you. I'm in too deep for this now. Proof that it's locked. I will be back as soon as I can. I need to wait for a paycheck before I can recover it. And that's next Tuesday at the very least. Goodbye for now, Anons. If you don't hear from me again, it's because I am gone. If there is one thing this Anon does, it's deliver. After this, Anon sadly did not return, so it's up to you to make up your own mind on whether he was telling the truth or LARPing, bullshit or not. It's up to you guys to decide. What are the chances history is fake? Someone stated a theory that we were advanced back in the 1800 to 1900 period with huge structural buildings, and statues all over major cities like Chicago. But then they just tore them down, and now we have our shitty looking cities of today. Was civilization greater back then, and history was lied about to cover it up? Anybody who says it's not possible is either lying, or they are purposefully concealing something. I say of course it's possible. I'm not sure if it's likely, but it's definitely within the realm of possibility. And given the absolutely giant scale of the universe, it is extremely likely that at least one or a few civilizations have already hidden their history from the masses, and there will likely be many more occurrences to come. 51%. This is the biggest rabbit hole there is. Nowadays, I find the alchemy and magical history take entertaining at most, and I only trust the physical evidence. 
like rocks, melted structures, petrified stuffs, and signs of ancient technology usage. Because anything pre-World War I to World War II is probably fake or extremely misleading. Even new archaeology digs might be implants to guide history, or am I grasping at straws? 100% More disturbing than this obvious thing is that our history also seems to be fluid. No one even had thoughts such as yours, OP, before about 10 years ago. How is this possible? Were we just dumb? Blind? Collectively suffering from amnesia? Drunk on the abundance and great times of the 80s and 90s? Our perception had undoubtedly changed and continues to evolve. It truly is like we are all waking up. Well, some of us. The ones that are not seem to be even more ensnared by the reality spell. You know whom I'm talking about. The people you know that can't wait to enter the metaverse. Any metaverse. Right after they get a Neuralink implant. It's speeding up as well. I think a lot is fake, but the question is to what extent. One thing I am fairly convinced of is now is that the official history regarding the Roman Empire is largely faked and plagiarized from earlier Greek history. Part of this is also that the Catholic Church invented about 1,000 years at least of history that we call the Dark Ages. Weird how there are ancient ruins in Rome, then literally no old buildings, at all, till you get to the Renaissance. In my opinion, if the Roman Empire fell in the 300s or 400s AD, it's likely the real year will be 1022, not 2022. This article is worth reading at least. Not sure if true, but an idea worth exploring. I think it's also interesting how you never see plans about how they build old buildings. The Liverpool Cathedral is glorious, but it still took decades with modern industrial technology. No idea how people built cathedrals a quarter as big, even without similar technology. Surely masons over time would have preserved their methods, no? It's just crazy to think of how fast a city like San Francisco got built up. Went from being a backwater Spanish mission in the 1840s to one of the biggest cities in USA in like 10 years. With tons of beautiful architecture. I live in a modern big city. It takes multiple years to build a single apartment building with like 100 to 200 apartments. How the fuck did they build large buildings before widespread industrialization? I'm pretty sure most of this is BS. We have tons of archaeological data, and so on, that suggests that the history we know is real. Sure, they, historians, scientists, etc., might all be lying or duped by some giga conspiracy, but if that's true, then we have zero hope of finding any truth at all. I find it hard to believe that the entire world history is almost entirely fictional. Just look at our modern news networks. They typically all start from a grain of truth, not just completely fabricated from the ground up. So you can live in an isolated world of doubt and conspiracy, or trust and accept most of what is said by the current experts. Obviously, this reasoning has its limits, but this would require such a large, world-changing conspiracy that however plausible it may seem, I will need mountains of hard evidence before believing any of this tawdry BS. The one thing that always fucks with me is how do they discover ancient cities, roads, buildings, etc., all underground. Like for example a few years ago, they were renovating a city square, and due to the diggings, they found a huge network of ancient Roman buildings right underneath our city. Or a random farmer was digging some stuff in his backyard and suddenly he hit some carefully arranged stones. Turns out there's literally a fucking ancient highway stretching for thousands of kilometers and as it so happened, part of it went through the farmer's land. Or someone digs something in a hillside, earth falls off and it turns out there's actually a huge ass coliseum or cathedral or other random building just sitting there, covered by masses of earth, so that it looks like a hill. How does that happen? 
it's not that there are 1000 years of invented history. More like history is much, much older than what we're told. Civilization is much, much older. 2000 years ago, we were still relatively close to where we are now. But think about 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago. I think humanity is much older on this earth, or civilizations have existed for a much longer time than we're told, and so much has been transformed and forgotten. Say if there was an advanced civilization 60 million years ago, with cities and technologies and whatnot, how much evidence would we still have today? What relevance would a single city have? You're obviously slow, so I'll explain it as clearly as I can. The Great City of Rome. Here we have these amazing ancient structures. Over there, we have a bit of dilapidated medieval wall. And over here, we have the amazing Renaissance architecture. Why do we have surviving ancient structures and nothing from the Middle Ages? Do you understand what I'm saying? There has been an obvious and coordinated effort to destroy all traces of what really happened during that time. Something happened during the Middle Ages that we must not know about. There's medieval architecture in all European cities. You do know that in Moscow, for example, there is literally nothing predating the Napoleonic invasion, right? You have no clue what you're talking about. All you have is these masturbatory fantasies about mabased Byzantines, which you got from books written by the exact same people who erased our true past. Some people were dropped on their heads. You were thrown against a wall, full force. St. Basil's Cathedral, the Winter Palace, the Kremlin. Your hypocrisy is resounding. You mock me for my beliefs, but you've provided absolutely no evidence for your own beliefs. You weren't born with your beliefs, you were given them by someone else. You're as dogmatic and rigidly minded as any normie mainstream historian. You are an NPC who thinks he's a player character. You're a sheep who thinks he's outside the herd. There is nothing more contemptible. All history is just an approximation to reality, because human measures are too limited to document and understand the complex interactions that led to said history. But most alternate history shit is just pure fanfiction. Give it a few hundred years, and people will tell you about Wakanda versus Hogwarts World War VI. Well-documented information has to survive by someone's care and attention. If universities, media, and even authors are all masons or vetted by them, then chances are that records could be forged or false. Have you heard of phantom time theory and how records created by people like Jesuits have been forged many times to create fake events or fake connections to royalty and religious figures. The issue with history nowadays is nobody gives a crap about not pre-World War I, but even post-World War II, or even 40 years ago. I will tell you as far as I can by my family history. First of all, before the so-called economic boom, 1960 circa, the most of Europe, and I would guess the US too, were rural. Our gramps lived in farms, and most of their livelihood came from there. Radios, let alone TVs, were a novelty and a luxury. MSM were locally printed newspapers. This is important to understand for at least two points. We're literally and physically living in Boomer's world, and the means of mass communication we enjoy today are very recent. Then the family stuff. In my Gramps times, late 1800s to early 1900s, there was no internet, no passenger airplanes, nor work from home. There was one thing called Vaporetto, or steam-powered ship cruiser. My gramps took one to Australia to go hunting rabbits, to raise some money, and I still hold a physical receipt of that. Then you have the World War I, which brought even more poverty in Europe, the US Stock Exchange Fault, the Depression, and finally World War II. All these events acted as a gaunt blanket, meaning many people died, were displaced, and or lost everything they owned. Prior to World War I, Europe was either monarchies, colonial empires, or both, while the Middle East was the Ottoman Empire led by the current Turks. 
This is mainstream history. There is nothing hidden about it. Just general people aren't interested nowadays. And the living memory was somewhat lost after the 60s because nobody wanted to be reminded of their humble rural origins. The great buildings and cities built in the US and around the world were made possible from the technology of those times, plus steel and concrete. They were made to impress. The problem with the US is that you'd rather tear down those structures and build new. In Europe, we tend to be more conservative with urban landscape unless we bomb each other. No, we are just in a cloud of uncertainty, mostly because the Library of Alexandria was burned. My pet theory is Freemasonry, is the passing of vital information that was dangerous to publicly acknowledge. The reason the buildings are superior to now is architects held the position that brain surgeons hold in society now. They were highly revered and the divine communication and blueprints were what set them apart. Do we even have any proof that such a library even existed in the first place? We can't be sure that ancient history is anything but complete fabrication. No reason to take these stories at face value. That part I can agree on to a certain extent. Modern humans have grown incredibly moronic due to the slave system we have been bred into. I remember how they really tried to drive home to us during school the whole idea of we're so much smarter nowadays when in reality, it's pure bullcrap. The average person walking around today has become the shit-flinging monkey they have taught him to be via evolution theory and such. We are spiritually destitute. I'll go on a rabbit hole if it wasn't real. Seems like there's evidence, but probably more so mythos than fact of housing entirety of knowledge. I still can't help but feel some crucial information, probably mathematically related, has been stripped from us. One of the greatest tragedies of modern man is believing his ancient forefathers were room temperature IQ. If anything, mankind has digressed in the understanding of the planet and only improved hedonistically. For instance, boomers are unironically better with PCs than zoomers because of apps. Advancements don't always equate with intelligence. For me, the Library of Alexandria story sounds fictional slash a myth. It's already based on the idea of Alexander the Great, who is already not much of a real figure, as he's presented to us, at least. If anything, the recent years have taught me that nothing of actual note even happens. We're becoming worse, because the population is getting lost inside while browsing the web, whether it's out in public via smartphone or in their PC. We're being trained to think that video games are exciting, that social media is exciting, that having all this information in our pockets is impressive and important when it's anything but that. Since we enter school from a very young age, we are groomed to believe that information and technical knowledge is something important and impressive to have access to. Well, I don't think this is the case after all. I actually think that all this information is useless crap that we don't need, and I would involve even the information to bring up in this very threat. Human beings can naturally build crazy buildings and technology by pure instinct. We are being systematically suppressed from that fact via being immersed in this particular society construct. We're not in tune with ourselves and innate imagination. It has been squashed in us since early on and offered countless distractions so we can never regain it properly. Just walking outside, feeling the sunlight, is much more interesting than anything you can read in books or in the internet. We've been heavily psyoped. Many such cases. Just dug deep into my city's history yesterday and spent the whole night researching shit. In just 20 minutes of browsing archives, I found examples of what is shown in this spread. Buried buildings. Photos of constructing magnificent structures showing only two letters and the complete structure already finished. Renovating probably. Basic repairs and building a planetarium. Again, no photos of the actual construction. The guys were literally shown holding fucking spades, cleaning off mud and the road and landscaping, uncovering, and majestic buildings being erected from scratch in only one year, including the project phase, Keck. Dug into the builders and architects, and even on shallow, clear web, the stories don't match up. Took me four clicks. 
literally three to four people allegedly responsible for all the old world buildings in just 10 years. Most of the time supposedly building three or more of them at the same time. The population of the city was only 80,000. Barely any roads, no cranes. How does this shit make sense to anyone? It's probably that no one gives a fuck. They are just happy with accepting the narrative. Pick related is the theater. It was built in 1.5 years, including project work. First electrified and air conditioned building in Brno in 1882. Guess why? Here is the planetarium. Text and pick related says landscaping slash modification of surroundings around the planetarium. No photos of actual construction anywhere. I'm too deep in the shit to believe that. Pick related, another case of buried old world building. Buried windows, stairs leading up to windows that were reused as doors, some walled off. Most of the old world buildings I see now, or ones that resemble them, seem too low now too, right? Like it's usually so fucking pretty, and then it's just one story high? Fuck off. By the way, the whole city was a store fort, as well as the castle overlooking the city. Barely any sign of it today, or even in 1850s anymore. Pick related is from a map from 1720s. Sorry, I was mistaken. There is actually one, one photo of the planetarium construction. It's this, Keck. Another thing, all connected by the way, by the same three to four guys I mentioned earlier. One guy was constructing three buildings simultaneously. This one was built in two years, 1863. It was and is an asylum to this day. Now what did we learn about old world buildings like this? They were mostly, or at least very often, repurposed to be sanatoriums or orphanages. I have the orphanage example here somewhere too. We'll post it if I get a bit more drunk. Another absolutely beautiful old world building is this one. Built by our skilled builders, masons and architects in just one year. Would you believe that? What's next, men on the moon? Looks pretty much the same to this day. Almost no repairs needed, no reconstruction, except the secondary entrance shown on the right. Stairs added later again. Seems too low too. This would have been at least twice as tall. By the way, the whole city is a huge underground complex, not accessible to public, even some non-dangerous and non-interesting spots. Literally had at least three alchemist labs found there, but that's another story. So yeah, we know we have underground shit, hidden and inaccessible. This shit was supposedly built in one year. No renovations. Meanwhile, buildings that look nothing like this, built and documented 20 years after this one, are constantly falling apart. Also, it's red brick, a never sign, and those fucks turned it into a gym. The official story is that it was always a gym. They actually hired a guy to build this beauty to be a fucking gym from the start. And then they put 50 fuckers in there to stretch and do yoga. Still no one knows where the Greek fire came from. The past is fluid. That's why it can be anything. You think people are making history up to lie to people. When the reality is, you can't register history because it's going to change and whatever you recorded will eventually look like a lie. In her Alexiad, Anna Komen provides a description of an incendiary weapon, which was used by the Byzantine garrison of Dyrrhachium in 1108 against the Normans. It's often regarded as the least partial recipe for Greek fire. The fire is made by the following arts. From the pine and certain such evergreen trees, inflammable resin is collected. This is rubbed with sulfur and put into tubes of reed and is blown by men using it with violent and continuous breath. Then in this manner it meets the fire on the tip, and catches light, and falls like a fiery whirlwind on the faces of the enemies. There is also a surviving 9th century Latin text, preserved in Germany, which mentions the ingredients of what appears to be Greek fire, and the operations of the siphons used to project it. Although the text contains some inaccuracies, it clearly identifies the main component as naffa. Resins were probably added as a thickener and to increase the duration and intensity of the flame. A 12th century treatise 
prepared by Marty bin Ali al Tarsusi for Saladin Records, an Arab version of Greek fire called Naft, which also had a petroleum base, with sulfur and various resins added. I've heard a strange, semi related theory that the medieval age was much longer than we think, like we lost about 600 years of history. Because of the fall of Rome, the Black Plague, and the many wars fought, there was too much chaos. No medieval contemporary historian could possibly correlate all the events correctly, and modern historians are misinterpreting the texts that remain. As a consequence, there is a possibility this is closer to the year 2623 AD. It isn't quite that history is fake if we actually address primary sources. The real issue is popular history, layman history, and the narratives it follow are largely horseshit. This is why when one dives deep into an era and starts to find what seems to be contradictions with layman history, we think something must be covered up. When really it's just a narrative driven thing used to placate normie intelligence, and then popular counter narratives are created that are equally bullshit, i.e. most common conspiracies. Real history has a lot of very real events that are very clearly conspiratorial and deserve scrutiny. Once you actually approach this non-schizo with academic discipline, it's very apparent the narratives we repeat as truth are at best reductionist, at worst revisionist. Yeah, something does not add up. To me, it's almost like during the 1900s, especially after World War I or World War II, we got invaded by A's or something. Suddenly, alien tech starts influencing with our progression. All this electronics and mathematics theory calculations and algorithms are suddenly being applied to real world. Some stuff seemingly came out of the woodworks during the century, and for some applications, there have not been replacement for some of this old tech. Tubes still best for audio gear. According to NASA, they couldn't build moon landing capable space shuttle anymore. NTFS file system still being used despite having a four gigabyte file size limit because the alternatives are, for whatever reason, not stable enough. Despite decades having passed, they can't make NTFS2 that has the same stability. File sizes of XFAT without the instability of XFAT. It's almost like complexity in engineering and all of this theoretical stuff just ramped up tenfold during the century. With all the computing, theorems, software development, it all feels so fucking out of place. You know what I mean? With all that in mind, somehow, pick related is still the most common way to transfer electricity. Some say it's capitalism, that the poles serve their purpose, cheapest option, but is it really so, or is there some deeper underlying issue there? The weirdest part about history is how much what is taught in grade school diverges from reality. Honestly, it's pretty much no different from propaganda, even if you are just sticking to accepted history. It is exceptionally apparent if you look at the narratives told and how far they diverge from reality. This is mostly caused by intentional political battles at the state level, but it recasts history as just a bunch of accepted propaganda. If a historical narrative is politically unpopular enough, it would never gain academic acceptance no matter how real it is. Now take events that you have lived through. If you go back and study them, you will usually find that there have been significant revisions to the historical narrative, to the point where your lived experiences seem false. Now, apply this to every event throughout history and compound it with a large amount of lost sources and the entire story of human civilization rings hollow. History itself might as well be a pointless effort outside of the political realm and storytelling. This is the schizo thought I had this week. Hello X. I'm part of a certain organization, one with very particular interests and responsibilities. I have been given permission by my superiors to make some of our activities semi-public and answer questions. I will say up front that we do have some ulterior motives that I may or may not eventually reveal. 
have been given strict guidelines on what I am allowed to reveal, but I will answer as many questions as I can. Why did we pick 4chan of all places? For the same reason many of you use it. It's a good first filter. I know many of you will dismiss this as yet another roleplay thread. I bear no ill will towards you if you do. Truth is that I don't bear some kind of world-saving knowledge. I'm not here to tell you how to save your soul, nor to warn you about an impending apocalypse. I do, however, have knowledge about a lot of mysterious phenomena. Creatures, organizations, people, practices, and events. From disappearances to sightings, from what is thought to be a myth to what is suspected to be a fact. From the material to the ethereal. About my organization. We are an international group dedicated to investigate the stuff that your authorities aren't comfortable telling you about. Some would simplify it and call it the occult. And while it is accurate, let me tell you that this covers a wider range than just reading through grimoires. Sometimes we're required to perform seemingly innocent investigations under the guise of ecological surveys. Sometimes we're required to do much dirtier stuff. There is a reason why we're required to take a psychological therapy and mandatory vacations after every gig. We've worked with multiple governments across the world, sometimes even against them. Hell, there has been cases in which we have to work against the people we just helped the previous year. About my role, I'm part of the investigation task force. No, I'm not some kind of badass gun-toting marine, although I did receive basic firearms training upon joining, and depending on the task, may be issued equipment of the sort. My responsibilities are varied and range from scouting locations, investigating archaeological sites, documenting the encountered phenomena, contacting the required parties for a job, acquiring resources, and, in very rare occasions, help in neutralizing potential threats. As mentioned before, I will do everything in my power to answer every single one of your questions honestly, but please do not hold it against me if at some point I'm forced to obfuscate information or be vague due to the guidelines I've been provided. How were you recruited? To make a very long story short, I followed a series of signs that led me to a sort of puzzle, a test if you can believe it. After passing it and believing for a moment I was part of an abandoned scavenger hunt, I was provided with contact information via a package I ordered, meaning they knew about my purchasing habits beforehand. Then I had a series of interviews with different people. Some were through the phone, others in person. The whole process took about six months. That said, I'm pretty sure not all members are recruited this way. Each recruiter does things differently, and I know at least one of my coworkers got scouted via internet forums. What's an example of an activity you were a part of? Unofficial archaeology. Basically, archaeological zones are scouted before the public, aka archaeologists, are allowed to proclaim they've discovered it. This is in order to make sure there are no threats to the safety of the people, or information that may be deemed too damaging if made public. This is probably what I've done the most. Other examples include helping neutralize a threat, investigate objects and modern locations, sabotage other organizations, and acquire information or items. It's hard for me to pick one. In my short time, I've seen stuff that still requires me to get a hold of myself. The one time I threw up at the sight of something was, ironically, a man-made creature. We were investigating an abandoned research facility that was shut down during the 60s and was just recently rediscovered. Our task was to go in, clean up the place, and get out. The place was disguised as a hospital for low-income families, so it already had a disgusting vibe to it. We found documents detailing different forms of human experimentation and even organ trafficking. After making our way down to the underground part of the facility, we started hearing muffled cries and moans. Upon entering the laboratory area, we were met with the horrid smell of rotting carcass. We immediately noticed the slimy wet floor, and with each step, the smell got worse. 
The cleanup crew found delivery chairs with human skeletons, all of them with a bullet wound in the middle of the skull. The most notorious thing is that, despite the fact that they were entirely decomposed, they were just as slimy as the floor. As I proceeded to take a slime sample, we could hear something moving in the darkness. The crew aimed their torches at the source of the sound, and I could clearly hear one of them gasp. I turned around, and upon seeing those things, I just threw up. I couldn't hold it. I can only describe them as overgrown fetuses with completely grey skin and macrophilia. About the size of an adult pig. A total of three of them. But later we found two more that had already died. They were blind and seemingly used smell and sound for orientation, which made them crawl straight toward me after I emptied my stomach. The crew was ordered to open fire, instantly killing two of the things. The third one did not pursue me, but instead began licking my vomit. Upon examination, the fetuses were covered in the same slime as the rest of the room. It's very hard to pick one, and I also can't even reveal the most messed up ones. But I can tell you this one. Most state leaders don't even know about this shit. It may not seem that pants shitting at first, but when you realize the commander-in-chief of your country is completely ignorant about some of the biggest threats to your life out there, you know the world is a facade. Unless you're Russian. In that case, at least a few of your public leaders know. I'm not sure if it's okay to say this, since it's a rumor that still needs to be investigated. But here it is. Apparently, the Lapis Philosophorum is hidden in one of Switzerland's vaults. From what I've been told, Volcanelli himself created it. There's theories floating around as to whether the country's most powerful people have used it or not. Since the creation of the magnum opus is both an internal and external process, some people here think they're simply unable to use it because they don't have an alchemist capable of reaching the internal transmutation required. ETA, I'm biding my time. I cannot answer this one. What's one sentence that will be extremely revealing to those in the know, but meaningless to those out of the know? In our solitariness, great depths are sometimes surrounded. Truth hideth in company. What's the current outlook for this swing best case scenario? Uncertain, but most of us remain hopeful. Is my intuition about the theme of fallen angels on target at all? I can say that my intuition was right all along, and I've been quite smug about it with my colleagues. Without giving away more than you can, what's an example of an exciting slash tight situation you've been in while completing tasks for the organization? I can discuss some of our operations with a certain degree of freedom. After all, what is one more cryptid sighting or a ghost story in a vaguely described location? The benefit of this place is that it can easily hide this information in a sea of similar stories. So long as I don't guide you anywhere, I should be fine. That said, probably my tightest situation involved appeasing an entity that a cult summoned, thinking it would be pleased with their degenerate behavior. I've been in the middle of shootouts, kidnapped and nearly executed once. And to this day, that particular moment was the closest I came to being completely and utterly doomed. What entities have you seen summoned? Demon-like things or other weirdness? I've seen people manifest demons, mostly of the lesser kind, call upon the souls of the departed, the fair folk, muses, and even an angel once. The thing is that demon is such a wide term nowadays that a lot of things could count as a demon in people's eyes. My classification is a bit more strict, so I guess some of those lesser demons are closer to mere monsters from other planes of existence. Do they reside in another plane or dimension? For the most part, yes. Do they physically appear here? It's possible, but for the most part, it won't happen. They will often need a physical conduit, like a body or an object. In some cases, they can half-manifest, allowing you to see them but not touch them, or manipulating stuff around you, i.e., suddenly starts raining, fire moves in unnatural ways, etc. Also, 
What do you know about Bigfoot? The biggest and most regretful mistake of mankind. Please do not look for them. Are you affiliated with the aviary? No. What exactly are the things broadly referred to as fairies or the fae? For the most part, they're different kinds of nature spirits that often bridge different planes of existence. They're some of the few that can willingly assume corporeal forms, but our world has become quite noxious to them. Is there any truth to the underground giants, which were a popular point of discussion here recently? Yes. These vaguely human beings, which were said to live beneath Switzerland, China, and parts of the USA, would point to a rich and horrifying subterranean world where, if true, I would wager many so-called cryptids are simply vagrant specimens from this great unseen biome. You're almost on point here. Any thoughts on the increasing amount of posters lately on this board who are claiming to be aliens? No personal thoughts, but I know for a fact that there are people out there with extraterrestrial DNA. What exactly is going on with this talk of the Galactic Federation? I honestly don't know anything about a Galactic Federation. From what I've been told, it's an exaggeration, if not a myth. Since it seems as though the ones there underground have been around for an incomprehensibly long period of time and survived multiple turns of the cyclical rise and fall of mankind's civilization, do the giants have a cultivated, intelligent elite class which is far less bestial and feral than the literal, unwashed masses of other giants nakedly living in their own excrement and devouring each other. They may have survived, but their civilization, for the most part, has not. Current scans and drone footage indicate their civilization is similar to one of the Bronze Age, and from what I understand, there are intelligent giants. Some have even learned our languages. Some sort of Carter of hyper-intelligent beings that operate from the shadows and is a real player in world events, while the ordinary giants are left in their horrible life conditions, for whatever reason. Wouldn't call them hyper-intelligent at all. They are estimated to have relatively high IQs, but not genius level. They are, however, much more attuned to the Earth. We don't have evidence of a cabal or anything like that. They seem very decentralized. Just like how in our society, most people are plebs who do nothing but furnish grist for the mill of the system that enables the parasite elite cabal types to sit in their ivory towers, lording over the world. They're organized in tribes. Some of them have built impressive stuff down there. But like I said, they're very decentralized, and their leaders, while at times hedonistic, are very involved with their communities and have religious responsibilities. I cannot imagine that such a possible class of giant nobility would be anything besides ontologically evil in all respects given the circumstances which seem to be true. Is a rat evil for feeding on its offspring and rallying its own to strike back at the cat? Those Egyptians weren't human. I can't go into too many details on this one, but they're basically puppets or robots. We got our hands on one back in 2016. Regarding remote viewing, it's very hard to be completely accurate. For most people, you're not looking at what is happening. You're looking at a recreation made with your mind's data. Think of it as a collage made up of all the information you've ever absorbed, representing what you're trying to view. How much are you paid? I can't give you a number, but I'm quite satisfied. One of my colleagues said we're getting paid more than the feds. Does money even matter to you? Yes, but it's not the reason why I do this at least not after the shit I've experienced. However, I can't neglect my material needs and responsibilities. What do you aim to accomplish in this life? Best case scenario, ascension. Worst case scenario, at least keep some people safe. Have you chosen to come here? Hell, have I chosen to come here? Nobody really chooses that. Where do we go when we die? Where do we come from before we're born? Oh boy. This is a really complicated one, since I can't provide too much detail on it. I strongly recommend looking at what ancient religions had to say on this topic. Also, thoughts about the soul trap. I'm familiar with at least three concepts to use the term. One is man-made. The other two are just hypotheses 
attempting to explain different phenomena at the moment. Where do I go at this crossroads? I can't tell you, but following my instinct led me to where I am now. Or by asking this, am I asking the devil for directions instead of myself? This, again, is something only you hold the true answer to. For a westerner, for the purposes of enlightenment, following texts that require self-initiation, such as the Golden Dawn or Felima, etc., as a self-taught person, can it be valid, or is it just a waste of time? Valid. It's certainly not a waste of time to learn about them, but please take in mind that each person's path when it comes to the art is different. Here's a little tip. Each recipe in a book has ingredients that can be swapped and still get a great result. In the East, there is much talk of Samadhi, but there are those who consider it a spiritual suicide, as the place left by the ego is replaced by the demiurge. It is contrasted with Kevalya, but I did not understand it, even though I have practiced non-dualistic meditations. The whole demiurge thing here is wrong. It may help to look at them as contemplation of the self, versus contemplation of the whole, microcosmos and macrocosmos. The scheme of the Kabbalah has been adopted and varied in various systems. For example, the Kabbalah of the occultists, or the Christian Kabbalah. Were there any manipulations that decreased its potency? In any case, it's always useful to study, starting from what already exists, and only then find your own answers. As long as the basic principles of the role and system etc. are followed, you will get similar or equal results. What is already there is always a good starting point but far from the only one. There are those who consider this world a prison of the Demiurge, and they say that when you die, you have to turn your back on the light and make a wish to go home. What do you think? I'm very skeptical of the whole prison thing. I haven't found anything that indicates this to be the case. What can you tell us about the higher selves slash inner demon, as outlined in the Abilim, PGM, Crowley's Book 4, and other various cultures? Very much accurate, but some of descriptions and processes have been purposefully obfuscated, like most things in the occult. What additional resources do you have on this, and how to obtain KNC? Honestly, the most important stuff is already out there. If you're already familiar with Abrilim and Crowley, you have access to what you need. Thoughts on Ascended Masters? An end goal for many, the beginning of a new path for a few. Truth is that those who have ascended are so far removed from the average person that even an experienced occultist has a hard time grasping at their knowledge. Have you ever met people possessed by demons? Yes, but my experience has been different. Do they have special powers? Sort of. Fundamentally speaking, a demon is the rawest essence of an idea, for good and bad. If the idea overcomes the will of a person, they can be considered possessed. This can lead to positive outcomes like a musician breaking into a magnificent improvisation, or negative outcomes, like a child breaking an adult's bones with a single blow. Lesser demons will be the ones possessing people the vast majority of the time. They love usurping the monarchs in order to mess with inexperienced magicians and religious folk. Don't expect a possessed person to spit fire or something like that. Even levitation is incredibly rare. I am assuming they are some sort of thought form, from the gestalt of the consciousness, of plants slash an entire collective ecosystem, given that it seems like they can never leave the boundaries of a forest, or something like that perhaps. You're out in the money, for some fay. Others are much older than that. Basically the manifestation of the very first sparks of life on the planet. Others are messengers of nature gods, and others were born along with agriculture. They're not as diverse of the cultures of the world. They're as diverse as the living species of the world. Based on what you know, how can the regular people, like us, counter the magic of the global cabal that engages in child sacrifice, and the whole Pizzagate thing being real, but barely touching the tip of that iceberg? It's gonna sound cliche and cheesy, but honestly, you just need to be a good person. The religious folk will tell you to pray, and be righteous according to their doctrine, but in reality, all you need to do is not contribute to what you know is evil. Megacorp uses child labor and destroys ecosystems. Reject them. Your fellow man is in a harsh situation? Go help him. Avoid industrially farmed meat and produce. 
distrust all politicians, and focus on making the world around you a little bit better every day. And I doubt everyone involved in that whole business is what we call human. While you're not entirely wrong, do not underestimate the evil that men do. In other words, this faction and those like them seem to be responsible for much of the terrible energy in the world today. Can we subject them to assault through a more esoteric or astral means, since conventional means are all but out of the question, since these groups are protected by basically all governments and powerful NGOs worldwide? Even if you could launch an all-out assault, it would be meaningless. Their agents aren't just everywhere, they're every when. Hell, every time you pull the curtain to reveal the mastermind, there is another curtain behind it. Esoteric warfare and astral expeditions are the only means to combat them, and while they outnumber us, we have some incredibly powerful allies. They decided to ally themselves with the wrong faction. Fair amount of research has been done on the topic of psychic capabilities. Most people can achieve basic skills, like remote viewing and precognition, with the right training. Telepathy is a bit more complicated, because it requires people to be attuned, which is why it's common among twins or mothers and their babies. Is Agatha true? Just a deviation of reptilian cities? Sort of true. We found at least two subterranean ruins that fit the description of Agartha, one in Europe and one in Asia. The concerning thing is that their demise happened fairly recently. Why did the Sumerians have that much knowledge? Where did they come from? Humans just like you and me, it's just that they had the correct guidance. Why is Antarctica so important? Maybe because they're objects from the past when it wasn't a pole? There's a lot of stuff down there, and I mean a lot. Undiscovered fauna and flora archaeological sites, abandoned research facilities from World War II. I've been begging them to send me there for years. However, due to current geopolitical developments, the higher-ups have decided not to mess with it at the moment. If you're really, really into astrology, you can sort of predict a few things that will happen. Outside of that, there's talks of the EU expanding into a full-blown single-state government by that year, but it's likely to be delayed. Can't believe I'm the first one in the fret to ask about skinwalkers. Dish, occult archaeology bro. What are they? Do they exist? Have you ever encountered one? They do exist, but most are a bit different from the Navajo accounts. They painted them with a broad brush, while the Mesoamericans were a lot more sensible about them. They are pretty much what the legends say. Sorcerers, with the ability to turn into an animal. Current research suggests this is one of the oldest surviving magical traditions, and that it appeared during the early Neolithic. The more spooky skinwalkers are closer to the Navajo accounts, but are not necessarily evil by choice. There's a phenomena I like to call mind-body disassociation disorder, which ultimately drives the afflicted mad, unable to properly merge their animal and human sides. Thus, they become something in between, a wolf with elongated limbs and fingers, an elk with a human face, stuff like that. Usually, they have very little control over their magic and are very dangerous because of it. Recently, we were tasked with hunting down one that crossed the US border into Mexican territory, leaving a trail of murder cases that had to be reported as cartel killings. We received help from an agua, another shape-shifting mage. Also, any info on Lush or Gajeth's idea that all our lives are fodder slash nourishment for the moon? I guess if you don't take it literally. The planets are the temples of the gods, so in a way, we nourish them, and they nourish us. You guys done any exploration under the ocean? Yes, but I haven't taken part in it, other than monitoring cameras for like a week while a colleague was on vacation. I didn't see anything, except a few crabs and fish. Like those pyramids they found on the ocean floor in Florida not so long ago? Any aqua expeditions that have yielded any interesting results? Those pyramids were discovered during the 40s, and only recently we finished mapping them. The crews found nothing, at least nothing alive. Also, what do you know about mermaids? Also, stridas in Antarctica, or any cryptids from that region? Mermaid is yet another enormously broad term. Some are spirits similar to the Fae. Others are cryptids, 
like the Ningen. I've listened to conversations with mermaids recorded back in the 80s. Part of my initial training also involved a video of a group of Japanese fishermen getting wrecked by a Ningen. As for Antarctica's cryptids, let's just say that Lovecraft wasn't far off about albino penguins. I've also seen specimens of giant crabs about the size of a small car and an amphibian that converged into an anglerfish-like body, enormous jaw, and bioluminescent lure. I will tell you this, yin and yang should not be separated. The situation with Lucifer is a lot more complicated than it seems, and if I were to explain it, even in detail, I would get a lot of flack here. Whether you heed the call or not is up to you, but be careful of usurpers and impostors. Many have dedicated their lives to Lucifer, or any other monarch, only to find out they were taken for a ride by a much lesser demon. I've read accounts of people who have had fatal accidents or taken their own lives, only to find themselves in another dimension where they didn't die, but there were differences in the world and the people, as if they were on different timelines. If this happens, is it the higher self that decides the dimension to complete the life experience? The research on this is quite inconclusive. The leading theory basically says that a lot of factors need to align in order for that to happen, such as both universes being chronologically aligned, both versions of you dying at the same time, etc. Do all people have souls, or are some just NPCs? Some are NPCs, but they have the ability to acquire souls, although this hasn't happened in a long time. Is time travel possible, as claimed by John Teeter? When will we be able to do this? Astral slash ethereal time traveling is perfectly possible and has been employed for a while. Material time traveling is technically possible, but not in the ways that movies or John Teeter have outlined it, at least not yet. Currently, it's possible to send and receive information encoded within a photon and have computers decode it, but that's it. Romania has quite the history of prominent mages. The problem is that many of them had to either go into hiding or move out of their land. It's funny that you mention it, because there is something about that place that calls people attuned to the occult back to their motherland. The more alarmist of the organization think it may be something that is awakening, in before Dracula, and your land asking you to stop it. Do you have any of your experiences in Mexico? Funny that you mention it, because that's where my last operation took place. I'm still writing the official report. It involved investigating a branch of prominent cartel, you probably know which one, and their blood sacrifices. Basically, we needed to make sure that their specific version of the cult to La Santa Muerta was not a front making sacrifices to the demon Grimory, because we really did not want another case of what I mentioned before about a cult pissing off a monarch with their degeneracy. What was the purpose of pyramids? astrologically aligned temples. Ideally, they would allow gods to take physical form. When people call a temple, be it in Mexico or Greece, the house of the gods, it's a lot more true than you think. Is CERN capable of creating timelines? As in, design timelines from scratch? No. But if you mean split timelines, technically, any atomic collision can cause that. Are there governments with the appropriate knowledge to manipulate timelines, create them, direct them, merge them, etc. Most of that knowledge is theoretical, and based on observations from different phenomena and related occurrences. I think it's no surprise that both the US and Russia have their hands on the research, but none of them have been able to do more than use astral time travelers or photons. You mentioned to be good, etc. You mentioned you wish to ascend. How can you reconcile taking lives, no matter what kind, and keeping secrets and withholding info? The taking lives part. While I've personally done very little of that, I've taken part in groups that do so. My hands are as red as those of the people who pulled the trigger, and I acknowledge that. However, I want to believe that some lives need to be taken for the sake of others. If anything, honoring every single sacrifice, including the mosquito I smack and the steak I eat, is the least I can do. As for keeping secrets and withholding info, I don't see it as something evil or immoral. It does, however, conflict with my freedom of information philosophy. That's in part why I begged my superiors to let me make this threat 
from months on end. I also understand that you can't just tell people everything, sometimes for their own good. It's one of those you wouldn't eat hot dogs if you knew how they're made situations. You mentioned you were given permission to post here. Can you reveal the purpose of these posts? Did you have an objective or a mission statement to explain these posts? I can't reveal the professional purposes, but I've hinted at them during the thread. My personal purpose is a mix of venting and because I think it's good that at least some people know. Do you have a clear conscience doing what you do? No. I fail to protect innocent people for mundane and human reasons. My seniors tell me it's normal and I should just let it go, but I still can't. Are the freaks in the underground real? You mean the pale crawlers? Yes, but thankfully we only deal with them when other organizations fail to do so. Then what I really want to know is how to deal with and counteract electromagnetic fields and pulses that can manipulate, paralyze, and harm others, and what a good first step to learning that would be. The most reliable way is to learn how to manipulate your own bioelectricity, but this isn't particularly powerful because we're simply not designed to do much. The more effective but less reliable is to use a device. The ones we have at the organization look like big laptop batteries. You strap them to your body armor and hope nobody shoots them. Replaced Individuals Hayax this time, I have a very long thread in mind. Sort of my thoughts about the subject of doppelgangers, with some anecdotal examples I've collected over the years. Please be patient with me, and I am sure I will make it worth your while. Also, I will use Reddit formatting because I think long chunks of text need to be broken up into segments for ease of reading. This doesn't mean I'm a Redditor though. Reddit isn't capable of providing me the information I crave. Now then, ever had a loved one disappear for a short time, only to witness them come back slightly different in very subtle ways, as if replaced by a very close yet non-identical copy? If so, please share your story. I am an avid collector of such tales, as you will see further on in this thread. Of course, you probably never had this happen to you, or anyone you know, but I'm sure you heard about such phenomena. The whole person dying and getting replaced by a double is a motif that can be seen all over history, and makes its way into popular culture every few years. As far back into history as the reign of Queen Elizabeth I of England, rumors circulated that she had a body double known as the Mask of Youth. The theory suggested that the Queen used the double to attend public events while she remained in seclusion. In the 1960s, there was Paul is Dead, a theory about Paul McCartney from the Beatles dying in a bike crash and getting replaced by a lookalike to save the band. There is of course modern stuff, like a theory about Putin having several body doubles, the Russian press even gave nicknames to, like the party-going Putin, or bunker-sitting Putin, or speech-giving Putin. These stories are very easy to believe. Of course they clone Paul, otherwise the band would fall apart. Of course they have Putin clones, because he is old, and if he dies, the whole corrupt mess Russia is right now will become as dust. Of course they made a mimic to look like Avril Lavigne, she was so popular. But ask any believer about mechanics of such copy making and they won't provide a satisfactory answer. Who clones these people? Why? If they hire lookalikes, why haven't they ever confessed or failed at their duties? And yet, many continue believing, despite the mechanics of such cloning being borderline science fiction. Why? Could it be because we humans have blood memories of mimics from ancient times? Hear me out. Imagine this. Our brains forgot, but the marrow of our very bones remembers them. Creatures that took the shape of our fellow tribe members to deceive us, lead us into danger, steal from us. Doppelgangers 
that watched us in the night, waiting for the right moment to pounce, and with a quick twist of the neck, murder us and take our place in the tribe. They had a flaw, of course. Their host body's memories weren't there. Sometimes their movements were unnatural, wooden, puppet-like. Their speech, emotionless, robotic, or pitch shifted. They gave themselves away and were dispatched. Only the best ones survived and evolved. They are still among us, careful, plotting, patient, ever vigilant. That's what I think at least. And to find at least some anecdotal proof of this wild schizophrenia, I made it a thing to ask for doppelganger or mimic stories from anyone and everyone I meet. Over the years, I've found a few really bizarre ones that I will share with you straight from my fat Google Doc. I will post them as long as there's interest. I hope for two things in return. One, that you give me more such tales. And two, that you will find what I post at least a bit curious. We'll now bump with my tales. Tale one, source, my grandpa. This one is the reason I first took interest in the subject. Year, 1945 plus. Location, Zizhov, Poland. Name, Alexander. Age, 27. Occupation, soldier. Disappearance. My grandfather's uncle's name was Alexander. In the Russian-Polish side of my family, the name Alexander has two short forms, Sasha and Shura. Like Bob and Rob are short forms of Robert in English. Before going away for three years to fight the Nazis with the Red Army, great-granduncle Alexander went by Shura. He was around 170 centimeters tall. There was no contact from him with his family for all these three years, for apparent reasons, the occupation of Poland. Return. When he came back from the war, his mother did not accept him as her son. She alleged that the man claiming to be her son was at least a head taller than when he went to war, and had marks made on the doorframe of his bedroom to prove it. She also cried that his teeth were not the same when he smiled. Not like scary monster teeth, mind you. Just not the same size and shape as she remembered. His army friends all called him Sasha. And he never asked them to use the name Shura, which he preferred before the war. He explained his mother's reaction by saying she went mad in her old age, but never seemed too depressed by her not accepting him as her son anymore. He worked in a factory and lived separately from the family home, in a common house for factory workers. In 1950, he was tried and sent to prison for 12 years for murdering a man while fishing. He said, as soon as I saw this stranger turn his back to me, I knew I needed to strike him with the knife. He died in prison, naturally explainable by misremembering things, people changing over time and schizo blood running in my family. Source, Discord. Location, Calgary, Canada. Name, Jake. Age, 20s. Occupation, student. Disappearance. As most acolytes, I have a fascination with Calgary, so I constantly pester its residents online for scraps of information on new urban myths and legends of the area. One such story I collected via Discord concerned a lit student called Jake who disappeared from the second story bathroom in his mom's house while paying her a short visit. His clothes and phone were found by his mom, neatly stacked in the bathroom sink, and his shoes were placed into the bathtub. Understandably, nobody even knew what to think of this, until return. A day later, Jake was arrested by the police for walking all naked and bloody and bruised on a back street in the historic center of Calgary. The charges were dropped after it was decided that the man was in a traumatic fugue state, kind of like in Breaking Bad. He alleged to have no memories of what happened or why he did what he did. Getting naked, 
crawling out of his mom's house like a sneak thief and making his way to the city center, then staying out of sight of everyone for a whole day before being apprehended by the hand of the law. The fellow who shared this tale with me was this man's friend. Key word was, because after that happening, everyone in Jake's friend group began distancing themselves from him. Various reasons were claimed, from a colder attitude to bizarre new interests, which concerned certain local phenomena, including the whole living history thing. A clueless normie before his brief disappearance, Jake now claimed to have certain occult knowledge concerning old buildings, the construction of which defies spatial norms and subtly warps reality. He claimed to have used such angles and spaces for quick transportation across Calgary, though certain beings tried to stop him. He also started to hit the bong pretty badly, then dropped out of college, graduated to meth, and his further fate is unknown. Source Hostel Roommate Year 1900s Location Varna, Bulgaria Name Chris Unpronounceable local name I choose to shorten to Chris Age 40s Occupation Hobo turned millionaire Disappearance It's basically a local urban legend popular in like the 1920s It's the 1900s There's a homeless person named Chris living in Varna's docks doing odd jobs, going to church, helping the church out, praying and doing kind things instead of drinking his life away like most of his lot. One night, sleeping in the docks underneath a boat, he wakes up to see his exact body double gazing upon him. The double has crawled under the boat and is now standing on all fours right above Chris, staring into his eyes, breathing stinking breath into his nose and mouth. The mimic is silent for a while, and Chris is paralyzed by fear. Finally, the mimic utters, now is a very poor time, then crawls away. Many years pass. Chris inherits a fortune from a dead relative, climbs his way out of poverty, gets himself a house, and vows to give the rest to the church that sustained him through the years. Then he becomes paranoid. Claims hearing now is a much better time, whispered to him out of dark street corners whenever he is going somewhere. Assaults a random person for trying to steal his face. Becomes a shut-in in his new house. Hires staff to do all of the things for him. One day, he disappears. Staff begins looking for him. They inform the police and the locals and such. Return. Chris returns several days later, looking the same but sporting a much different demeanor. Spends money he vowed to donate to the church on one of the first automobiles in Bulgaria. Begins drinking and gambling the rest away. Drives into a horse-drawn carriage one night and dies in the wreck. Remains never reach the morgue. Melt like ice cream on the spot. Source, friend, year, 1990s, location, Yugoslavia, name, Peter, age, 50s, occupation, nut house patient, disappearance, a friend from the Balkans worked as muscle in a rather dreadful Soviet-style asylum in former Yugoslavia. His favorite nutcase was a man by the name of Peter, most likely Petro or Peter or something. I don't know Balkan languages. Peter was placed into the asylum by his own family after assaulting them numerous times. He allegedly even tortured his little son, demanding answers. Why did Peter do that? Well, one day he took his family sailing on a little boat down the river rapids. Unfortunately, the poorly made old rickety thing got a leak after hitting a large rock and broke apart in the middle of the river. Peter somehow managed to swim ashore, while his wife, his little son, and his teenage daughter all drowned before his very eyes. Return. When Peter made his way home to inform the authorities, his wife, little son, 
and teenage daughter were all there, in his house, alive, well, and looking surprised, saying stuff like, Hey dad, didn't you say you were going for an all night fishing trip alone? Why are you back so soon? But he saw them drown though. He saw their deaths in the rapids. So he attacked those fakes. He punched his wife, demanding her to take her fake skin off. He tortured his little son with a soldering iron, asking him questions only his true son would know. He did unspeakable things to his teenage daughter. Thankfully, the family had kind neighbors who called the police from the village's only phone. The rest you already know. He was put into the loony bin. But was it called for? In a word, curiosity. In many words, I'm curious about things people don't take seriously, like mimics and squatches and stuff. I have talked to 100 plus people in real life alone over my years doing this acolyte thing. And these people, oh man, they told me stuff most won't even believe on here. Stuff I don't believe a tiny bit and won't ever probably believe. But they didn't tell me these things as if they were telling a lie. The way most told me their peculiar truths looked really sincere. I'm not a perfect people reader, but I'm not autistic either. I get cues. I see when someone is weaving a lie. They believed it, which got me thinking that there must be a new science out there. A study and categorization of non-factual personal truths. And an according realm of personal truths where things are possible that will never be proven by science. Brain farts, hallucinations, self-delusions, or actual glitches met by this person and this person alone. Later on, especially finding a few fellow lore enthusiasts, patterns show themselves. Phenomena witnessed by a man in Turkey completely identical to a thing seen in the corner of an eye by a child in Norway, separated by thousands of kilometers and decades of time. Get what I mean? Like the whole grey business. People in USA in the 1980s described the same beings as people in Belgium did in the 1970s. My rational normie mind knows aliens do not exist. But my deeply hidden schizo mind sees that they do not lie. They saw what they saw. My other mind knows the world science describes as a slim film wrapped around a giant sphere of total human knowledge and experience. I want to have it all. I want to know everything about this impossible bigger picture. It's like a hunger, and here I am, begging for scraps. Source, many. Year, 1990s. Location, at least three post-USSR Kami countries. Name, none. Age, eight to 10. Occupation, school kid. Disappearance. I have stumbled upon this bit of folklore on here. On Russian boards. On Polish boards. I think even on Reddit. Must be something we call Stazilka, or spooky story kids tell to kids. But I've never seen this one in specialized books that collect such tales. There is a school in a post Kami country where there is a legend. If you hide in the classroom after getting a bad grade, and nobody finds you before locking the school up for the night, a copy of you will come home instead, and this copy will receive all of the punishment from the parents for any bad grades you received, while you get to play around the empty school and do whatever you want. A kid supposedly did this, then fell asleep in his hiding place and awoke in the middle of the next school day. Return. When this kid climbed out of the closet and into the class, he saw that his desk was occupied by a perfect copy of him. When the copy's eyes met the kid's eyes, the copy began screaming horribly and tearing itself apart, shaking so hard that chunks of its watery flesh flew around the classroom, showering the other kids with milky, inhuman gore. When the thing was moving no longer, the teacher quickly covered the remains with a blanket and dragged them away. Not scared, not horrified, but with the annoyed and tired look of someone who sees and does things like this every other week. 
I sadly think I'm currently way too anchored in reality. I mean, I trust folks. I believe in the stuff I post. But I also don't. It's the double think modern society pushes people into. One day, I might make the leap and become a full-on occultist, like some of my fellow acolytes. Who knows? What I meant by I don't believe a tiny bit and won't ever probably believe wasn't anything you never heard before. Sexual demons assaulting your soul and dreams and you waking up with gashes in your back that bleed and swell up and actually take your shirt off in a public area to show the scars to me. All doors opening and all windows shattering in a multi-story kami blockhouse. When your neighbor the wizard dies because the devil came to claim his soul, you're a convicted criminal. You didn't pass the exams they do to figure out if you are crazy or a liar. Yet you still tell everyone you didn't do it. But it was a government man with a Geiger counter that put your wife to sleep, then put you to sleep, then shot her, then put a gun in your hand, all because you have seen lights blink over Latgale in 1991. You saw a bipedal naked thing in the cold Baltic pine woods that cooed like a mom would to a shorter bipedal naked thing. You only saw their shoulders and heads. They were on the opposite side of a two to three meter tall hill from you meaning they were like 4 meters tall. And you only had like 10 beers that day. You hear all radio related tech in your home. Which is a lot, because you are a professional radio engineer and ham radio enthusiast. Whisper to you that we are coming for you. So you barricade all entrances into your room and shoot at shadows. Clone Paul. The main theory is not cloning. It's they grabbed a guy passable as Paul. And or did some plastic surgery for resemblance. He was a guitarist in a different band, not noticeable enough to be missed, and had the qualifications needed. When Paul died, the unknown they elites didn't think it would be possible to move forward without him. The explanation out there was MI6 to whatever, told the Beatles they were so successful, if it got out, there would be mass panic if it got out that Paul was dead, so they should replace him quietly. I'm sure the Beatles believe that, but that explanation suggests that the powers that be, the elites, whoever, wanted the Beatles to remain in place for whatever reason, control the masses, etc., and weren't sure of the Beatles' ensured presence in music without a Paul. Here someone claims this is a fake Paul latex mask slip fail. I don't know about this. At some point, fake Paul would become the accepted Paul. So I don't see why bother, unless it was a body double of fake Paul, his fake Paul couldn't attend the interview. I'm including it because someone else might have a different conclusion to me. Source, colleague, year, 2016. Location, Lithuania. Name, never asked. Age, mid-60s. Occupation, grandma. Disappearance. My co-worker and friend, Jolanta, once shared a bizarre memory from her early childhood with me. Jolanta was an orphan since early childhood and lived with her grandmother in a rural area in northern Lithuania. She said that until she turned seven, her grandma was very kind and loving. She always cared for her as best she could, saved up from her pension to buy her toys and dresses and pretty shoes and even started to work again, despite being a pensioner, selling mushrooms and berries from the local woods on the market for an extra bit of cash. Since Jolanta was a clumsy little kid, the grandma never took her mushrooming, but made her breakfast and locked her in the house instead, then went to the woods alone. This bit is surely bizarre for an English person, but it was kind of normal in post-USSR in the 90s. I remember my folks locking me up in the flat for hours been going to work ever since I turned seven. Kind of babysat myself. The cat also helped. Anyway, Jolanta told me how she remembered a day when grandma didn't come back from her mushrooming expedition at 12 o'clock like usual. Six hours later and still no grandma. Jolanta was crying and very hungry by then. In six more hours, she was about to climb out the window to go searching for grandma in the night. Thankfully, it didn't come to that. Return. Grandma returned, 
almost twelve hours later than usual. No shrooms or berries did she bring. Not even the bucket that she went away with that morning. Jolanta said she remembered Grandma basically stumbling into the house like a drunk and falling asleep without even taking her clothes off or saying hello or feeding the child that was locked in for almost a day without adult supervision. Ever since that day, Grandma was like a different person. Jolanta said Grandma started to beat her for doing things wrong around the house, which never happened before. More precisely, Grandma whipped her feet with a narrow plank whenever she misbehaved or whipped her back with a wet rag. She didn't beat her reluctantly either. In fact, Grandma looked as if she was happy Jolanta provided her with another opportunity for punishment whenever she messed something up like kids tend to do. There were no more pretty dresses, shoes, or toys. Grandma still went to the woods on occasion since then, but she never traded on the market anymore, or at least did not ever tell Jolanta that she did. One year later, Grandma denied custody and shipped her once beloved grandchild to a government orphanage and never contacted her until she died in her late 70s. Jolanta said she hated her for all of her life, but when she remembered that night, she was no longer sure if she hated the same person that raised her until the age of seven. I can't find the giant Avril Fury video at the moment. I keep looking, but the basis of that theory is Avril coming from a small town. Being a punk rocker and having a lot of anxiety and depression left her never great at dealing with people in crowds. So, she was provided with a body double, Melissa, to help with doing meeting greets getting pat pictures taken, probably lip syncing at times, and Melissa was just a normal person who sort of looked like Avril and was styled to look like her. Melissa got paid to do that as a job. There's some decent evidence I don't remember of Melissa existing. There's photos of them together and some stuff about Avril talking about her. There's a few photos of Avril with Melissa written on her arm. It's pretty solid to the extent even if new Avril is the same person as old Avril, Avril was using a Melissa body double when she first started. Avril dies. Some people say taking her own life due to depression from the death of her grandfather. However, there's a stronger theory there I can't remember and harder to find of why she took her own life. And it has something to do with the typical industry shenanigans. Also, Something about she was maybe killed in a car crash in the rain, related to a song, and then was further staged to make it look like she took her own life in a warehouse or hotel room, depending on the version of the theory. The song is said to be about Avril taking her own life and Melissa taking over. Alternatively, Avril was high on something, crashed her car in the rain into a tree, and then drugged out MK'd slash voice of Goded into taking her own life. The powers that be tend to have like four plans if you're wondering why they would crash her into a tree and have her take her own life. They would want to serve as many possible agendas depending on the direction they took. Transition to emo music slash death of punk equals Avril dead. Money, life insurance, whatever version of death most profitable. Saw too much equals either version of death is fine just whatever would be the most digestible to the public. My theory is Avril saw something she shouldn't have, so was murdered. But she wasn't worth much debt, insurance-wise, so Melissa was an all-right option. Assuming the theory correct that Avril is dead and Melissa took over, there is a bunch of symbolism in Melissa's songs and music videos that Avril is dead and Melissa took over. People also use the fact that Avril's whole sound changed from punk to pop music, is evidence of this theory, saying that if Melissa kept doing punk stuff, it would be obvious it wasn't Avril. I am more partial to the explanation Melissa wanted to be a pop star, or her differences from Avril made her awful at singing the same type of music. Look at Skater Boy Avril, her face is narrower than it is now. Pay attention to the eyes of Avril versus Melissa. If it's Melissa's, there's a type of confidence in the eyes and body language that is never seen in Avril. Avril has the body language of a starving orphan. She has no self-confidence whatsoever. 
Melissa is the exact opposite. Source, Tuchan. Year, 2011. Location, Poland. Name, Mirek. Age, around eight. Occupation, kid. Disappearance. A Slav Anon shared this with me, on Tu Chan's hiking enjoyer board. Zakopane is a beautiful, resort-type part of Poland, with grand woods all around. Allegedly, a boy by the name of Mirek slash Miroslaw went missing in a certain forest sometime in 2011. You heard this story a billion times. Hiking with parents, gets off the trail for 0.001 seconds, vanishes suddenly. Rangers called. Police called. Dogs called. No luck in finding anything, even a scent. Return. Almost a month later, after the family lost all hope, he appeared. Disheveled. Covered in mud. Scratches and scrapes. The boy was found near the city limits, walking alongside the highway in the direction of his home. He could not talk for the first few days. When called to the hospital to check whether this was indeed their missing child, the parents had different opinions. The father was completely sure this was their child in the hospital bed before him. The mother was 50-50. She said the boy sure looked the part, but certain features were blown out of proportion. Slightly larger eyes, slightly slimmer nose, slightly thinner lips, slightly longer arms. And as if to prove her suspicions, the kid did not react to her, but clung to dad the moment he saw him, silently crying and whimpering like a beaten puppy and throwing angry and confused stares at his freaked out mom. There was even more confusion when the child worked through the trauma and began speaking again. He even gave interviews, saying how he didn't remember a thing, and about a cloudy fog man grabbing him off that trail a month ago and feeding him mushrooms and berries and such. But the weirdest part wasn't what he was telling people. It was the way he spoke. He had gained a lisp that he never had before. Anon said the mom and the dad divorced a year later, with the custody going to the dad, despite 99% of such cases favoring the mother in Poland. Might be seen as proof that the mother never stopped accusing the kid of not being her true son, and this drove to the collapse of the family. Ex-CIA here. Ask me anything. My area of operations was primarily Central Asia. I was involved in quite a specific scheme in Afghanistan, involving a strategic enemy's border region, I won't name who, but should be simple enough to guess. I'm probably not going to talk very much about that specifically, but it's a classic scheme, used many times before. Corruption covering up for transfer of arms and money to certain groups. I have a decent amount of general internal knowledge though, and a few internal rumors heard through other agents. Okay, so here is what I know about UFOs. My distinct impression is that our government and the Air Force actually have no fucking idea what they are. Some portion of UFOs are actually just us testing our experimental aircraft i.e. Area 51, but I'd say upwards of half are truly unexplained. I met the guy we had, who was like our resident Fox Mulder. He basically told me that it's embarrassing how little we know. He has fragments of information, very little hard evidence. He said he's almost certain they aren't from a foreign government. He thinks they're either actually extraterrestrial and we just truly cannot see them through sensors, or that they are some kind of natural phenomenon. Most of the higher-ups just frankly do not care about them, except in so far as we can be sure they aren't Chinese. That's why we have one guy on it, and not a team. No interest. No idea if the Air Force might know more though, but my guess is no. CIA founded all the military coups in South America? Not all, but many. This isn't even really classified info though. Like, we'll deny it. But it's like when Putin says he didn't try to interfere with 2016. Okay, since no one is asking anything, I would like to explain roughly how the intake process at the CIA works. 
because it's pretty extreme, and I've never really heard it discussed at length anywhere. So basically, everything will seem like a normal job interview during the first stage, with only a few hints at what will come. Then, in the second stage, they will put you through a thorough psych evaluation, and ask general questions about your history and reasons for wanting to join. Simultaneously, they will talk to literally every person you have ever spoken to more than a couple times, acquaintances even. They will take any and every piece of information they get about you and compile it into a dossier which you will never, ever have access to. The third stage is the shortest and most intense. If you get to the third stage, you have basically passed every background check and have been selected to serve. The purpose of the third stage though, which lasts anywhere from 1 to 16 hours, is to try and psychologically break you. Basically, they bring you into a room, hook you to a lie detector test, and you sit across from a veteran agent who is pretending to be just the lie detector technician. Then, they bombard you with questions about every single bad thing you have ever done that they found out. The absolute most humiliating shit. Stuff you never even told anyone about. They will have found out about it and confront you about it angrily. They will also, and this is crucial to the process, also make up tons of just absolutely false stuff about you and also accuse you of those crimes and yell at you for being a traitor, pervert, whatever. The only way to fail this test is to lie. The lie detector has absolutely nothing to do with determining if you told the truth. The veteran agent can tell much better than the machine, and your heart rate is jumping all over the fucking place during this too. It's actually a horrifying and traumatizing experience. Is Stargate legit? Does the US military still pursue parapsychological technology research? Yes, it was also more successful than is generally known. I believe research is still ongoing, even though they claim that officially it ended in the 90s. Is there some truth about that case that involved the US military finding a cave filled with some of Bigfoot hominid community and they killed every single one of them? I don't know anything about this, sorry. Also, is the USA struggling in some kind of Cold War 2.0 with Russia and China? Just China. Russia isn't actually a threat. Like, they're a threat to Ukraine, but not to the US. China is also kind of not really a threat either, but they could grow into one. Maybe there is a fourth party that is unknown to the public. If that's the case, could you elaborate? Thanks for the info. The fourth party is honestly Turkey. Much more threatening than Russia, and increasingly hostile. In order of threats to the US interests, I would put it like this. 1. China 2. Turkey 3. Russia Well, in order to keep the peace between the US and the Afghan government, we basically allowed them to do a lot of stuff we probably shouldn't have. Lots of corruption, abuse, sexual and otherwise, etc. Some of which I witnessed firsthand. I guess to some degree, we just accepted that the entire situation was a clusterfuck and that we just needed to get through it. Zero. I don't think China has the operational capacity to invade Taiwan before maybe 2025 at the soonest, and if they tried before then, it would probably be a disaster for them. They simply don't have enough experience with the type of logistics necessary to pull it off yet. The biggest tell that they actually aren't planning to do it right now is that they keep talking about it. It's all posturing as a show for the Chinese public. Then, if and when China tries to invade Taiwan, our main strategy, and the Chinese know this, is going to be to put up the full air-sea battle doctrine, which basically amounts to us destroying all offensive military capacity, then destroying all Chinese domestic industrial capacity, and then we will go home. We do not plan to ever even attempt to invade and conquer China. Just beat them into the ground and make sure that they can't get back up for another 40 years. We're only going to do that if we have to. Again, 
most of us think China will simply collapse in the next 30 to 40 years, unless they do a really large amount of domestic changes. More so than Iran? Iran is actually not only a threat, but it's a strong contender to be a really great ally in the region. Culturally, and even from a strategic perspective, a lot of our goals are aligned. Depends on if work can be done to adequately repair the trust that was built between us during the Obama era. The Iranians still don't trust us, but have the potential to be a much greater ally to the US than even Israel, and certainly much more than the Saudis. The Iranian interests in nukes are almost entirely defensive. They don't want us to invade them, and they think nukes are about the only way to ensure that that will not happen. Agents are aware that they are pawns. This is literally our job. We know it before we get sent anywhere to do anything. But this Rothschild Illuminati bullshit is just wrong. The military industrial complex is real, but the methods of influence actual companies use are not as direct as imagined by conspiracy theorists. Agents are pawns for the long term strategic plans of the US. Arguably, we're pawns for the blob, which is much less inspiring, but also probably a bit more true if we're honest with ourselves. Part of the process of selecting people to serve at the CIA is to select people that truly, honestly believe in the common concept and promise of America. People who are in fact patriotic, but not solely patriotic. We also have to have a morality that is conditionally flexible and lawful. We also need to deeply want to serve. The concept of service towards something greater than yourself is extremely important and I would say that all of us believe in it. No one at the CIA is a cynic or a nihilist. The process is designed to root these people out because they are dangerous and could flip against the US to other interests. We are all patriots, at least in our conception, but our loyalties are not to people we know, but to the concept of American governance and interests. We are almost exclusively ends focused, though in recent decades, there has been more thought given to the means since we cannot assume complete secrecy of our actions. What's the game plan for when America loses that conflict? So Taiwan is similar to Vietnam. The communists won in Vietnam, but the end result was a big fat nothing other than locally. If China wins in Taiwan, we will simply fortify the other points of constraint around them, Japan, South Korea, etc. Their war would be just beginning. And to be clear, I'm not saying it's not possible for the Chinese to overcome the US and actually become the leading world power. Just that we have made it very difficult for them and that I think we have a much better chance of winning than them. The president at the time splinters your agency into a million fucking pieces. Who would do this other than Trump? Hawley? Cruz? They tried to work at the CIA and were rejected. Even if someone did gut the agency. These plans and contingencies won't just disappear. SCP Foundation is the Saudi religious police because fighting witchcraft is one of their roles and they have made hundreds of arrests to that end. The Saudi royals are probably far more into witchcraft and shit like that than any other entrenched political class in the world. Probably the dumbest elites of any country too. MBS is dangerous because he is both clever and dumb. Like he's good at tactics, but absolutely one of the worst alive at constructing a realistic vision of the types of goals he should be working towards. The man is liable to do anything. He's like a Machiavellian that is more concerned with people seeing how clever he is than actually accomplishing anything. The entrenched death to America sentiment that is going to be a big hurdle. This is all Iranian government propaganda. The people of Iran don't give a shit about America or American power. They, if anything, hate the current Iranian government more than America due to decades of mismanagement. Iranians are extremely cosmopolitan and would gladly turn the state secular if given a chance. Was 9-11 an inside job? No. If we couldn't keep Iran-Contra under wraps, what makes you think we could have kept that a secret? The best movie about the CIA is Serrania. It got a lot of stuff right. 
tech levels are less important to CIA work than NSA. What do you believe the idea of America is? What is American governance in contrast to the rest of the world? So to paraphrase the Churchill quote about democracy, America is the worst of the global superpowers, except for all the others that have existed. I'm aware that America has flaws, has made mistakes, has done things that even I consider bad. In the end though, we have been the fairest and least oppressive global hegemon the world has ever seen. No other world power has ever left the seas completely open and mostly safe for everyone from every other country. If the Chinese were to succeed us, they would almost certainly not do the same. The fact of the matter is that the US serves an important role and that if we and our forces disappeared from the global stage, the world would be returned to 18th and 19th century chaos. Except this time, a lot of countries have nukes and not all of them are going to be deterred by mutually assured destruction. This is simply not true. In fact, we still have a large amount of legitimacy. China is sort of less popular than ever now. They have immense soft power from trade relations, but they cannot go on being the world's factory forever. Everyone in the Western world, apart from Russia and a few post-Soviets, want the US to remain the preeminent power. We take a lot of stress off of them. Most Asian countries want this too. Better for the power to be held by us than by a hostile neighbor. It's true that once you are out of the CIA, you can still be called back in if they need your specific expertise for some reason. But there is a definite distinction between working for the CIA and having worked for the CIA. The world is a jumble of intentions with millions of political, corporate, and private actors all working constantly at cross-purpose. No one is in control. The world is Hobbesian. The United States is the Leviathan. We are the closest thing to establishing an actual order in world history, and we actually did set up an international system in 1945 that is remarkably more stable than the ones that came before it. That does not mean everything and everybody is controlled. You, and most conspiracy theorists, simply do not understand how power works and how it is actually exercised. The key to our limited successes is that we enforce minimal rather than maximal rule sets. The Illuminati stuff is funniest, like just the thought that there is a secret group of rich, powerful people pulling the strings of society in addition to the normal rich and powerful people in society that we all know about. And the degree of control that people suppose is possible is also hilarious. It's insanely difficult to get assets, even compromised assets, to follow through on things you tell them to do already. The idea that everyone at every level of culture and politics could be controlled in that way is pure fantasy. Like, there are social, political, and economic groups like Skull and Bones, Bohemian Grove, Bilderberg with lots of important, powerful members, but they just aren't secret and don't do very much on their own. Like, Bilderberg is basically the same thing as the World Economic Forum, or Davos, except that it isn't public facing. What are the contingencies for a large-scale collapse, say in the next 50 years, brought on by climate change and economic crisis? There are none to my knowledge. Painfully little has been done by the US on this front. CIA wouldn't really deal with that though. Are there any plans to expand the two-party system? Maybe people won't believe this, but we don't get involved in domestic affairs. FBI does a lot more domestic stuff than us, but also, the FBI does not and could not control the course of American politics. If I had to guess though, I would not be surprised if the DSA left and the ethno-nationalist right got together at some point as the opposition to the establishment liberals. Who would you say is the most powerful and influential American politician today? Please don't say Biden. Give us something with a little bit more optimism. The most powerful individual is Trump. He wields undying, uncritical support from probably 30% of the population. But they, largely old, dumb, and low propensity voters, so his power will only weaken with time. As for who is the most powerful ascendant power? Establishment wing is probably Buttigieg. On the left is probably AOC. On the right it's basically no one. Trump Jr. 
DeSantis, Cruz, even Hawley. None of them have the juice. Hawley is probably the most ambitious, but he's a trust fund kid and is never going to get the loyalty of a working class Trumpist base. There is going to be an immense power vacuum on the American right when Trump dies. What do you think is the future for radicalism in the US? Bleak. Basically, it's impossible to forecast. I have no idea how Trumpist will respond to him not being restored to power by voodoo magic or whatever the latest Facebook influencers are saying. Will our social situation improve with the death of the boomer elite class? Probably. Do you think power brokers and authorities in Gen X? There are no Gen X power brokers. Too apathetic. Why has the CIA organized the overthrow of numerous democratically elected leaders and replaced them with tyrants? I'm not old enough to speak for everything that happened in the agency's past. Basically though, the prevailing thought at the time was domino theory, which probably shaped thought until 89 when the USSR collapsed. The democratically elected governments were generally socialist or communist leaning, and the fears from policymakers were that they would end up in the Soviet sphere of influence. The thought was that a strong man in our sphere was better than a democratic government in their sphere. My opinion, in retrospect, is that we, meaning the US, did not really understand the internal political dynamics of these countries and made rash decisions that materially harmed these countries and our ability to form positive relationships with them in the future based on a fear that was not really founded in reality. Was the CIA serving the interests of the American people? The agents almost certainly conceived of these as serving American interests. I'm sure that you must be aware that a predominant feature in American conservative thought is a trust of capital and market forces, which happens to align with the interests of these large companies. The CIA, universities, companies and basically all establishment forces in the United States were overwhelmingly aligned with the conservative movement until probably the mid-80s, with the real split coming in the 90s. Gingrich neocons and being solidified by the misuses of intelligence in the invasion of Iraq by the Bush admin and specifically Cheney. I recommend Robert Draper's recent book to start a war if you are interested in leaning more on the types of things that forced a realignment of the CIA's institutional thoughts. Why has the CIA repeatedly been implicated in the traffic of drugs and arms? The CIA has its own institutional approaches to problems, but works at the direction of the president. The Reagan admin conceived of and directed Iran-Contra, and they told us to obscure the source, intermediaries, and destination of funds from Congress, which had specifically ended the funding for ops in Nicaragua. Again, the purpose was to overthrow the communist-slash-socialist leaning because conservatives were still convinced that containment of socialist thought was necessary, and everyone, at every level of the establishment, was basically conservative at this point. Why has the CIA financed human experiments using unwitting subjects? I mean, this is essentially how all medical care research works. You cannot tell people what they are signing up for because it influences the results, no? The justification for these extreme measures, again, is called war paranoia. We thought the Soviets were working on exactly the same programs, and to be clear, they were, and so we decided that it was better that the technology be in our hands than the Soviets. Elite Insider here. Ask me anything. You are speaking to an architect of globalization. I have been a member of many secret societies and a personal friend of David Rockefeller. I am acquainted with Samuel Huntington and Henry Kissinger, both of whom I personally despise. My countries of origin are Germany and Hungary. I will answer questions about the long-term plans that are being forged at the hour and the esoteric undercurrents that have shaped the environment that you live in. You will address me as Atlas. The significance of Corona is an esoteric reversion or inversion of globalization. The same way economical and political dynamics spread over transnational environments around the globe. The corona puts a poisonous crown on this process by reversing it, spreading the disease. The same way 
globalism once spread. The process seems to be interluded with the Eurasian war. The Ukraine war took me by surprise, and I don't know the meaning or strategy behind it. Kissinger is highly sympathetic towards a Eurasian idea of which I don't know much. Other than the fact that it's KGB inspired and Solzhenitsyn and Jeltsin were part of a group called Golden Eurasia. No, I have never been to CERN, but I have familiarized myself with some quantum mechanical laws when I was younger. I lost interest in this topic soon, however. The experiments at the LHC are of a pure, materialist character to some, but the development of the World Wide Web is seen by some as inspired by a chaotic energy derived from CERN, of which I have no further knowledge. 2030 is the year when, supposedly, Agenda 2030 will come to an end. Many people over the last few years dreamed of a city of man in which humanist principles are ingrained. This metaphorical city, when reformulated into a cypromorphic consciousness city, which became the smart city, in line with certain technocratic belief systems that are all too present at the WEF. The idea is to establish a smart city network around the world, which is governed by artificial intelligence. Global governance is a code word for the confluence of transnational circles with local authorities. Hello Atlas, you speak of esoteric undercurrents. What could they possibly be? If you are a globalist, as you claim to be, you are a progressive, hence no real connection to hermetic tradition. If you are in esoteric secret societies, you must, by definition, be a traditionalist. I guess my question is, elaborate on your esoteric undercurrents and how they affect real politic. The events of the profane world have always been subject to the formation mechanisms deployed by aristocratically minded people. Traditionalism as an ideology is a highly systemized mindset, which reduces the whole to a confused sum of its parts. The key to wisdom is not the adaptation of a traditional set of rules or ideas, but the transcendence of time, if you will. So-called conservatives often say, conservatism is not about the preservation of the ashes, but the transmission of fire. Globalism is such a thing. We have built an empire which allows all, or at least some, pure souls to guide themselves. A philosophical empire as envisioned by Francis Bacon already. You shall read all my other answers, and your confusion might be partially redeemed. What sort of hermetic tradition do you follow? Dear Atlas, did Christianity first emerge in Europe before Semites got a hold of it? Sincerely, Mars. Christianity is eternal and cannot have evolved or devolved in any way. It has been the subtle and often unknowing ingredient of many ancient schools. In your sense, historically, the answer is yes. Best estimate for introduction of the dissolving of the EU and the introduction of the one world government and single global currency? These developments sharpen at this very moment, but it's unsure how much of these ideas can actually be put into practice soon. The global currency will be a cryptocurrency, and it will be introduced after an economic collapse as a consequence of climate catastrophes. The sequence of events will roll out to 2030, which is the next focal point. Before, 2020 was the focal point because of the Great Conjunction. When are they going to start the persecution of Christians? Catholicism is hugely discredited already, and it will lose all influence in the religious sphere. The new religion will not be New Age spirituality, however, or only from a specific point of view. It will be the religion of the Watchers, a religious hierarchy that will be externalized in the not-too-distant future. New Age was the vocalization of this very process in astrological terms. When are they going to fake aliens slash Project Bluebeam slash Galactic Federation? After or around 2030? When will they reveal that we have access to single point energy? We don't. When will the true nature of our planet be revealed to the general populace? 
state your presupposition, else your question is meaningless. Atlas, is it common among the elites of the world to do deals with demons? What is asked for in these deals, and what is the price? It's usual in all kinds of places. There is an entire entertainment cult that revolves around this sinister affair, and that is visible in occult mega-rituals and mass media. Most view the devil as an abstract form of energy that they can manipulate. The lower end of the hierarchy that is not God might be solidified into what is considered a form of consciousness, which are partnered with elementary spirits, entities that are of a much more general kind. A lot of people are bound by these entities. Mostly, it reflects the classical story of trading your soul for riches and fortune. It is not made literally, but by choosing a certain path and a set of mind which is beyond good and evil, and at one point is subject to the lower spirits. By what methods do elites extend their age to beyond what is attainable for plebs? They used specific diets and ritual meditation techniques once, but nowadays it's mostly improved surgery and the kind of benefits that are granted to them by the lower spirits they are engaged in. They demand blood sacrifice, for example. Is adrenochrome harvesting commonplace? Is ritual child abuse commonplace? The former isn't, the latter is. Does it serve religious, ritual, or medicinal purposes? Mostly religious and ritual purposes and blackmail. Intelligence agencies deliberately created conspiracy theories around this topic to indirectly include the masses in the ritual. It's also cultivated within the entertainment industry. The most important dates to look out for are the 5th day of October in 2024, as a highly symbolic biblical time span finds its end there. There will be an occurrence in New York City around that time, which will set the course for the period of next years until 2030. What is the Achilles heel to the Globo Homo agenda? Self-reliance, as your colleague already said, but self-reliance alone is not sufficient. You are not merely despised because you are reliant, but because you are incapable to grasp the world around you. This is not entirely your own fault. The historical situation has condemned you to be passive spectators. You can only react to what we do. We are the planners and the architects, and you are the audience, the gray mass that stumbles through the halls of history. And before you even began unraveling the meaning of the age you have been in, you are already dragged into the new hall. This dynamic cannot be broken, so you have to focus on self-reliance, consciousness, and divinity. I have already answered similar questions. The Antichrist is not a principle, not a person. One signifier of this principle was Otto von Hasberg. Another might be Prince Charles, but in the limits it will be a creature made by man himself. This concept has been alluded to in various allegories. Frankenstein and Metropolis are examples. By creating another species in his image, it is believed that man can achieve godhood. This can be signified by an artificial intelligence, which is no intelligence at all, or the alchemical new man himself. There is hardly any measurement for the power of one government over another. The United States government is under control of the Transatlantic Pilgrim Society, which connects to British intelligence and aristocracy, and the Jewish dominated military industrial complex, which is by far not limited to the Atlantic, as the Cold War shows. China is under high Western influence since the beginning of the 1970s, and a specifically Chinese branch of Freemasonry is being established there. I might send you more material pertaining to this topic. Then there is the Eurasian project, of which I am not sure which circles are exactly involved, but it plays a huge role in the biography of many inhabitants of the transatlantic NATO environment, especially Henry Kissinger. Most elitarian circles are very fond of chaos energy. There was a whole branch of directed psychological warfare 
focalized in Discordianism that made use of many chaotic archetypes, like the Fool in Tarot. There are also educational programs that specifically cater to chaotic, schizoid personality types, of which a lot of speculation exists under various guises. In that regard, the Schizo is a personality type that is closely monitored by the types of Letarian groups that also engage in satanic behavior. Children are very important as they are believed to be in purer contact with a spiritual realm and can be made spiritual ambassadors. As for the information gathered by schizoids, these elitarian circles themselves have often a very fluid understanding of truth and encourage schizotypes to filter information through a highly perceptive and solipsistic mindset. A lot of the conspiracy information is being deliberately made available to these types, but not all. Sometimes the information gathered by these types is even helpful in the assessment of a situation, which shows that the border between the elites and the masses is not as strict in certain areas as one might think. Atlas I have trouble believing the current administrations of the world you string pull for aren't deliberately bad for a reason. What is the reason? Is it that you intend to form chaos so that you can later step in with the UN to create your techno gasist state under the guise of helping people? Or is it to cause the deaths of many for depopulation agendas? People are well aware that these leaders are incompetent and that it is a dangerous game to play. This could go either way and you could lose. All it takes to ruin your plans is for the governed to revoke consent. What will you do when they do? They are deliberately bad, especially the blueprints that have been created by the circles of the World Economic Forum. The WEF is an intermediary organization that ties members of highly elitarian organizations, mostly specific kinds of transnational lodges, the same that are tied to the military industrial complex, to people of lower rank who are affiliated in one way or another with technocratic organizations universities, and simply business people who are looking to invest. Its intermediary status has allowed it to become involved in almost every major political dynamic of the last few years. You should read my other answers in the first thread as well. The leaders themselves are not as unintelligent as they seem. They seem incompetent because the act they are playing has become more and more absurd in the last few years. How exactly were you introduced to Lucifer? What's the process like? God is the Eternal One. I respect and sympathize with Lucifer, as he is an aspect of God and man. It can appear in multitudinous forms. He reveals himself as man's desire for ascension and completion, the will to power, and the reminder of humility before God. He is the supreme wanderer and hermit, a law of nature you might or might not engage in. Should I at least own one rifle if located in the USA? Yes. Ah, Atlas, welcome back. Your thoughts on the destruction of the Guidestones? Does this have any import to you? And who do you suppose did it and why? It has no import to me. The Guidestones were created by a group of entrepreneurs and philanthropists who were dedicated to the ecological ideas of the Club of Rome environment but associated to a transnational lodge that calls itself Thomas Paine. The monument encapsulates the astrological and philosophical aspects of the New Age. It has been created at a time when many transnational cynicals started working together under a global pact, of which I have written previously. Its destruction was discussed before, and it's to do with the dissolution of the current alliance that has been set up after 2006. The Broad Alliance was officially established in 2006 and came into fruition in 2008 during the economic crisis and the big tech Silicon Valley utopia of the 2010s. It was clear from the beginning that 2020 would be a focal year because of the great conjunction and different aspects. The Guidestones, which had been the marker of a global alliance per se, as it reflects the progressive Ecological philosophy of almost all elitarian environments was a symbol for global alliance per se. Now that two years have gone by 
since the appointment of the Corona. Many aspects of that alliance have shattered, as I have indicated before. The destruction of the Guidestones is a reference to the fact that the transnational environments are again isolating and remixing their cards. The dialectical opposition of these environments has never been shattered, as all know that they are members of a shared global context, a condition that might never be reversed. The Guidestones reflect noble ideas from a different world. They are the yearns and passions of men who do not want to see this crucial new age fail. Yet, it is known that they are not blueprints. There will always be conflict because conflict creates niches of growth. Atlas, why did the Ukraine war take you by surprise? It was already basically in progress, and we can see that Globo Homo wishes to expand its influence and Ukraine was a natural choice to tie Putin up on his borders. Clearly, the West desires the neutralization of Russia so that they can pursue China, as there is no reason to poke the bear otherwise. In light of this, why your surprise? In the works of geostrategists and social engineers like Halford Mackinder, there appears the notion of an age-old geopolitical principle. The eternal battle between maritime powers and land powers. In ancient times, this was typified by the Roman Empire and Greece. The rivalry between Russia, power of the land, and the British Empire, power of the sea, in the 19th century is a reflection of this great game, according to Mackinder. He created the Heartland Theory, which posits that the land mass of Central Asia is a pivotal zone for any strategic world power because it's inaccessible by any maritime nation. Whoever holds continental Europe controls the heartland. Whoever holds the heartland controls the world island. Apart from geostratical speculations, this whole matter has an esoteric dimension. The great game reflecting the battle between the heirs of Atlantis and Hyperborea or Shambhala, a mystical kingdom in the area of today's Tibet and Central Asia. The United States being the new Atlantis, as envisioned by Francis Bacon. The great game is reflected in George Orwell's 1984, where the continental superstates Oceania and Eurasia cover most of the planet, and it has been continued over the confrontation between NATO and the Soviet Union in the 20th century. The so-called collapse of the Soviet Union was, however, only diversionary, as the Eastern intelligence architecture remained and the Western aristocrats advertised globalist humanism in the 1980s and the 1990s. The ground was paved for a resurgence of the Eastern idea as an antithesis to the Western political correctness. The idea was to cultivate a side stream parallel to the mainstream, which should unite all of the dissident people, especially in Europe into a parallel society entertained by the cryptocracy and, once the Western European slash North American failure becomes overt, the alternative side stream should become the mainstream as part of the new Eurasian order. The war itself has been long anticipated, and it seems to serve as a diversion from the fact that the current crisis of world economy stands under the sign of the corona era which will manifest as staying authoritarian lockstep governance, especially after 2024. I was surprised, however, that the war began under the circumstances of February. This war, although to a certain degree internationally coordinated, is as well an indicator that the 2020 alliance is drifting apart. Atlas, what is it that you want someone like me to do with this knowledge? Disseminate it? Also, can you tell us why the elites allowed the public to get hold of the internet before it was fully controlled. Did they underestimate the power of such communications? The spread of the internet was seen by some people as the receptacle of chaotic forces, out of which the grounds for a new reality emerge, a reality that will allow for the release of creative and subversive powers. Many adepts of this mindset had deceitful motives. Others were technological naivists and thought it might liberate mankind. The development of the internet was always closely tied 
to intelligence agencies, to the point where people would create and share their own intelligence files. I would not say that the power of the internet has been underestimated, quite the contrary. It emerged out of the technocratic environment adjacent to our own circles, and it has been a great undercurrent of global integration. Thanks for breaking that down for me. Seeing you reference modern entertainment made me curious. Have you seen the show presented in this image? What do you think of it, if so? If not, could I suggest you check it out if it seems interesting to you? Next, if you'd allow us, is there a chance you could reveal anything about your role? Maybe elaborating on what kinds of duties you perform or responsibilities you have. Also, is there a way that you would define your family for us as it relates to factions or teams brewing? I don't mean to invade your privacy or ask for you to tell us anything you don't want to. The only reason I ask is to calibrate my perspective on what you reveal as it aligns with what I understand. I suppose, mainly, I'm curious about your family's philosophies. It's my understanding that some members of important families are not pleased with current events and tire of what's been unfolding and wish to set a new, more respectable course. If you feel inclined, I'd be pleased to hear you explain a little to these ends. I ask because you clearly see some form of value or entertainment in allowing us to ask you questions. Whereas it's rare that those who oppose us don't tend to feel compelled to do the same. My father was an engineer and a mathematician. My mother was Hungarian. Father was quite distinguished and renowned for his expertise. And I myself am quite talented in these fields during my childhood and youth. I wanted to become a mathematician. After World War II, we emigrated into the United States where my father was involved with a space program in the 1950s and 1960s. After two years at the university, I dropped mathematics and in favor of the study of esoteric teachings. I was initiated into Freemasonry at the age of 22, 1964. In the years to come, I gathered more and more insight about the workings of the military industrial complex on both sides of the Iron Curtain and I too became involved in the space program of the Johnson era. During that time, I had met dozens of people from the Vanderbilt, DuPont, Rockefeller environment. I also met Stanley Kubrick in 1968, whose movie 2001 A Space Odyssey left a lasting impression as it was ripe with brilliant esoteric significance. In the same year, I was involved in the founding of a transnational organization around Rockefeller, Brzezinski, and Kissinger, the Free Architects, as they were called back then. The first major influence I had on the Club of Rome, whose work, The Limits to Growth, I co-authored. I consider myself, and am widely considered, to be the architect of ecological market society. During the 1970s and 1980s, I have been the main influence next to the Free Architects to whom I was a mediator and advisor in some regards, with the exception of Henry Kissinger, who always worked against me from early on. Is there more than a single human race? I consider primordial man to be a different species, a more complete and perceptive man, an archetypal form from which today's material man was separated. In any other sense, the answer is no. Individualism and collectivism individuals who are separate from all that is not themselves are those that will become creative, perceptive, and analytical architectural minds. There is also strength in collectivity, if the collective is bound by solid and devoted men. The facis is the holy symbol of this collectivism. What we have today is the weakest possible combination of both. Isolated men who are like everybody else. Concentrate not upon this lower end of the hierarchy. As an illegitimate child born outside the family but within grasp, what is the benefit to being bonded with Moloch? There are no benefits. Do not pursue this bondage. It will make you miserable in ways you cannot imagine. Antipsychotics, while meant to treat psychotic behavior, 
also serves a secondary function. It's a vague question with many answers, but I am looking for an answer which weaves in the esoteric. State your presupposition more clearly. Antipsychotics have been used in medical experimentation on the psyche. Many were the hangers of the mind control experimentation environment that emerged in the 1950s. Antipsychotics limit your perception, spiritually and materially. I'm afraid there might be no more interesting answer to your question. Mostly curious, who are the allies of the House of Rockefeller? Mostly importantly, the names that many are familiar with. Morgan, Rothschild, then Vanderbilt, DuPont, Ford, myself, and my environments that I cultivate. The Rockefeller family has been the leading family in the creation of intelligence agencies, mass media outlets, NGOs, and the modern form of propaganda, per se, along with the Tavistock environment and many of our outlets. Who are their enemies? Certain circles and groups that consider themselves hyper-progressive or democratic mostly. There are smaller families as well who look for constant alliances in Southeast Asia, especially India and the Silicon Valley environment. The main enemy of the Rockefeller family, however, is time as their people are dying out. The posterity seems not so much interested in inheriting the Rockefeller legacy, and they are now highly disjointed in circling around environments that are not precisely their own. I was in the military, and I had more than an inkling of this, though never confirmed, because I worked at the secret underground Antarctic military base. The reason I got the sparse information I did was because a lot of the personnel sent to the moon worked slash trained at the Antarctica base first. I never went to the moon though. Were you ever stationed in Antarctica, Ope? I think a lot of the same technology was used to create the base in Antarctica was being tested there first, etc. So very hard to hide from the rest of us. But also thinking that Antarctica was a test for whether people could be trusted with more secret information about the moon. Pick related, not real by the way, something I shooped from memory. Still get the creeps thinking about some of the areas I had to be in that place. Making this kind of thing is like some sort of therapy I still feel the need to do somehow. Now and then, and I intentionally change slash remove key details so I can pass it off as fantasy art if I ever get challenged on it. But some of the basic details and the emotions they are supposed to convey are very real. That job paid really well, but I still have the uneasy feeling that the stuff I was doing there, or otherwise involved with, was good for humanity, or not downright evil. That first picture is about when I was first going into the base, with some other noobs. I have expertise in geology, one of the reasons I was there. Nothing I was seeing made any geological sense, and I mean none. Zip, zero, fucking nada. And increasingly so. Tunnels and caverns were obviously man-made, and, as I found out later, there was pretty standard military and construction equipment on the base that was used day to day, and working outside the base. But there was no fucking way on God's green earth that anything like that shit was used to create this place, or even modify an existing natural cavern. So I was getting really creeped out the further we went. We hadn't interacted much, but only one noob with us has any geological expertise as far as I know, and me and him were increasingly sneaking surreptitious silent glances at each other, like, dude. Are you seeing this shit? You just noticed that, right? We both know what we're looking at isn't even close to fucking possible, don't we? I still get the heebie-jeebies just thinking about that first time, and occasional nightmares about experiences I had there. Nothing bad per se happened, but that fucking place, man. Something just not right about it, and in so many ways. Feels like there's a background evil to it. That's the only way I can describe it. But nothing we did was overtly bad. 
like you can shake it off as paranoia or understandable fears about where you are, but it never went away from me. It's how I imagine feeling if I were tricked into doing the bidding of Satan himself, but couldn't prove it, and no individual act was anything I could morally object to. Like there's an Asimov story, where a guy uses robots to commit murder, even though they are programmed not to harm humans. He basically gets one robot to put poison in a drink and leave it in a certain place, then tells another robot to collect the drink and unknowingly serve it to the target. The main cavern was a comfortable temperature, with no visible signs of anything keeping it that way. That and the long-term activity inside should have had some effect on the ice walls, but simply didn't. For reasons I can't go into too much, I came to believe that the ice was somehow impregnated with metal or was some kind of composite that looked and seemed to otherwise behave exactly like ice, but just wasn't ice. Occasionally, I'd notice brief metallic flashes within it, like something caught the light, but attempts to see it again by trying to view it at the same angle were inexplicably fruitless. Where I did my day-to-day -day work, I was pretty close to the main entrance, so I'd see people, supplies, and material coming and going. I had good reason to believe there were no other entrances to the base that could accommodate the movement of that kind of thing to keep the base fully supplied, and people I'd never seen before would just seem to show up out of nowhere, sometimes dressed completely inappropriately considering the outside environment, like odd out-of-place camouflage patterns that would be useless on ice. Just the glaring incongruity between incoming supplies was enough for me to make subtle inquiries into other possible entrances, and where all this shit and people were even coming from. Just one of the things that didn't make any sense, and one of the most obvious, but there's plenty of more shit major and minor. I tried to ignore a lot of it while I was there, but in the cold light of day, some of that shit was just fucking banana cakes. Communication was not strictly allowed, but monkeys find a way to convey information subtly anyway. I don't know about any area that killed you, but pretty sure if I went into certain restricted areas, I would have been killed. Like, I could never find out what the unknown light actually was in previous pick related, despite being able to sometimes see it from a distance. Not sure if Antarctica itself is evil in some way, not a flat earth guy, but sometimes you gotta wonder, especially when they try to shut those guys up. It's deceptively beautiful if that's the case. Being able to live and work there in an otherwise relatively normal way was kind of cool, no pun intended. Great to be able to go outside and motherfucking full on Antarctica and then just come back onto the base and it be like you walked back into your house. I'd imagine living and working on the moon at low gravity would be the absolute shit under those conditions. Not sure if they'd even have low gravity all the time, which would cause problems, or have some artificial gravity, but if they're going outside, like OP says, then that would be cool enough. Relatively certain people who were showing up and disappearing were going to moon and back, but not sure exactly how. But if they had to return to Earth gravity now and then to avoid problems, then that would be one way to explain it. It seemed relatively regular, but not like it was always on a strict schedule either. But maybe I didn't see everyone all the time, so I could never be sure. Like I said, I suspected that this place was some kind of test for weird shitness tolerance, and one's ability to go along with it and shut the fuck up about it afterwards, before possibly going to the moon or whatever. I don't think I could put on a convincing poker face, and weird shitness tolerance turned out to be low, so probably why I'm no longer working there. The fact I have nightmares, make therapeutic art, and I'm even talking about it as much as I am, means they were right about me, I guess. There was a restricted tunnel, where I could see a light at the other end, like previous pick related. It wasn't always present, but I could kinda sorta make out some kind of shapes 
because of it, while at the same time, the glare obscured the source. It was just very weird. Like it was massive and extremely powerful light source, but too powerful to be explained by being there just to light the area it was in, or the tunnel. Like you wouldn't have a 5000 watt floodlight in your living room. There was something odd about the light it gave off too. Kind of yellow slash orange, but not like any light source I'd ever seen, natural or man-made. Also, I could somehow feel when it was on. When I was close to the tunnel entrance, but not seeing it, or anywhere I could see light coming out of the tunnel. Like, I'd know before I even got there, if it was on or off. The whole thing was just weird as fuck. Also, some of the extraneous tunnels and caverns that I saw don't even seem to have any discernible purpose. Yet. They are all kinds of weird shapes, sizes, and even different textures sometimes. But the striking thing is just how monumentally vast they are in every sense of the word. Getting there or even crossing one on foot can take several hours. Some contain buildings, vehicles, or equipment. Many so sparsely, it's like the equivalent of building an aircraft hangar to store a single bicycle and an outhouse. Some are completely empty as far as I could tell. Walking into one feels like a half-constructed, textureless Tomb Raider level, crossed with the back rooms. And yeah, that kind of video shit triggers my figurative PTSD, something awful now. Often the ceilings are hundreds of feet, even, I'd swear, thousands of feet high, despite that not seeming to make any sense. I don't know how it's even possible for a ceiling to span that large an area and not show any signs of fracture or collapse. The weight of the ice per square foot at that depth is just off the chart nuts. I also always wanted to do some kind of spectral analysis of the light, but wouldn't have been able to get that equipment anywhere near it without arousing suspicion at best and getting myself killed at worst but really wanted to, because light was so goddamned weird, like an RGB combination that can't exist. When I said there was weird shit major and minor going on, I wasn't kidding. This is just one example of shit not adding up that would be well enough all on its own. That's the other thing, as powerfully bright as this thing obviously was, it just didn't light up the cavern it was in, or the walls of the tunnel like you'd expect. They were lit slightly, like previous pick related, but they should have been lit up, like the fucking sun itself was on the other side of that tunnel. Nothing made sense. I wasn't even sure if that effect was a property of the tunnel walls itself or the light source, but I'd lay money on the latter. I couldn't fuck with the walls of that tunnel, and nobody would go near the walls or talk about them anywhere else, but I did get a few opportunities elsewhere to chip off samples of the walls. It would melt to what as far as I could tell was normal water, and behave in every way like normal ice. But the walls themselves weren't behaving like ice at all. Also wondered if reflected flashes I kept seeing were some kind of random quantum effect, and why I couldn't reacquire them afterwards at the same angle like a reflecting faucet off a crystal. Seems like in order for that whole place to even exist at all, it was impossible not to expose anyone with any knowledge of science, geology, physics, chemistry, engineering, slash common sense to some obvious logical issues. Like, they just couldn't effectively hide the bizarro world nature of the base itself, let alone any secret projects going on there. Of all the stuff I saw that was spooky, the one that really spooked me the most was Pick related for some reason. I never got to see much of this cavern, just a brief glance basically, and only as much of it as Pick related. But dude, what the fuck am I even looking at? Had to shoop Pick together and try to get it as accurate as possible to what I saw. Not perfect, but you get the idea. Literal fucking pyramid that looked like it was a relatively accurate recreation of something you'd see in Egypt, 
but made of ice. It was really hard to gauge scale, like it was a life-sized copy of an existing one, or half scale or some shit. I don't really know. Even top missing, invisible variations in bricks, like real pyramids, missing bricks at bottom, etc. But inside cavern, with textured angle roof near wall, not even centered in the cavern, which struck me as weird. Two guys at the foot of it, in the distance, working on it, or doing something, hard to tell. Massive crates nearby. Yellowish studio lights of different sizes, strung up, almost at random, like pick related. Some on, some off. Obvious assumption is that they found the pyramid under the ice, right? Maybe the stone just had a coating of ice, but that's the weird part. Shit that I overheard at the time, gleaned and confirmed later on, made it pretty clear that it was built by us after the chamber was created, and was solid ice. I've racked my brain to the point of madness trying to figure out why in the fuck would anyone build a replica pyramid out of ice, underground, in the middle of Antarctica. If it was like made of regular bricks, came to a point, etc., I might not find it so confusing, and just assume pyramid power or technology was real, or ley lines or something, but this makes zero fucking sense. I originally wondered if the random positioning of the lights was supposed to represent stars or something, but I couldn't get anything to even come close to matching up with even the most generous interpretation of what I remember. If the walls were created by the action of some field on normal water to form super strong ice somehow, that would explain a lot. Like how when I removed a sample, it acts like normal ice slash water. But then one wonders how it could hold up the roof, and me being able to chip part of the wall away. It wasn't unusually difficult or anything. I had hypothesized that the outer layer was normal ice, formed over the fake ice or some of our structure, but I remembered the places where I chipped ice away, and when I came back, the walls were healed, or maybe repaired by somebody, and I was worried about that. But nobody ever said anything about it to me. I tend to believe they were self-healing somehow. Maybe a field was attracting water from the atmosphere or something. Some of the tunnels had patterns that did look similar to magnetic field lines, but not all either. I'll have to think about that. One hypothesis I initially had about the flashes is that it was random, because it was like when the retinas of astronauts get hit by cosmic rays, and they see a flash, so I was thinking there was some kind of radiation involved. But I quickly dismissed that, because the flashes were very much like seeing large faucets of a crystal. Large but localized area with more or less definite shape. Also, try as I might, I couldn't detect any unusual radiation with any equipment or tests that I could devise. The place should have been awash in it, if my hypothesis were correct. I believe there was some kind of field or emission having an effect on the eye slash brain itself that affected what was penetrating through the walls which is why I could feel it before I could see it, which would also explain the impossible color phenomenon. I did some quick and dirty color perception tests and field and radiation tests around that location, but couldn't confirm that hypothesis. I couldn't stand there looking at color charts, doing eye tests, and walk around with a Geiger counter or anything in such a highly restricted area, so I had to be very careful and pretend I was doing normal things and passing through. Couldn't look like I was snooping, especially since, although nobody talked about it, the weird nature of that light was one of the things I figured everyone couldn't help but notice and was also curious about. That's one of the main reasons I had such a severe case of blue balls over that light and not being able to do a full spectral analysis, which would have told me quite a bit about what I should have expected to see. The tests I did were also mostly further away, where it was easier to not come under too much scrutiny, but where the field might have been fairly weak, so might not have had the full effect that I got when I was looking at the light. 
only my ability to sense the field, so maybe that's why they seem to turn up nothing. Water has some serious, heady, and unrecognized qualities as a higher dimensional form of matter, so that they would craft a pyramid out of ice actually makes a strange kind of sense. There are reports of ancient crystalline ones being found under the ocean, at sites where advanced civilizations that existed before the last ice age or younger dryas and aligns with a world grid of energetically and astronomically aligned megalithic sites around the globe. For them to have one underground seems odd though, so I would guess that they were running experiments with it rather than doing something more deliberate. One of the most impressive caverns I got to be in only once was the largest that I saw. It was one of the totally empty ones, in a relatively regular symmetrical dome shape. I'd swear that this thing was miles wide, and the highest point of the ceiling a thousand feet at least. Though perspective and reference points and size were an issue in that place, not least, because the floor was perfectly flat, and like a fucking uber mirror made of ice. And when I say uber, I mean it. A normal mirror reflects only about 80% of light, and you can sort of tell under the right conditions. High grade optical mirrors get to like 99.9%, .9%, but are super smooth, polished, and obviously not something you want to be touching with your hands, etc. But we're just casually walking on the shit with no special precautions, and somehow leaving no scratches, smudges, or marks whatsoever. I saw 14 men in perfectly normal boots walk a considerable distance over the shit and back, drag and drop heavy equipment on it like it was nothing, but I couldn't see a single blemish of any kind. When we first went in, saw it, and they just started walking on it, as I comprehended what I was looking at, I was triggered, because it's like watching someone just bumble fuck walk around on the mirror of the JWST telescope. I almost said something just out of instinct, but quickly suppressed my gut reaction and just followed along, gritting my teeth, thinking about the damage that we were doing, but there was none. Apart from that, I didn't find the high reflection so perturbing in a scientific way, because there are such things as 100% internal reflection, etc. But the light reflection itself, I knew. It was no ordinary mirror, or even some kind of somehow bulletproof, high-grade optical mirror, either. And though I couldn't logically be sure it was made of ice, the same ice that the rest of the place was made out of in different forms, I'm certain it was. Also, the surface had normal traction, not slippery at all. If you're not lying, what you're describing sounds like as above, so below. Whatever they had down there, beneath the ice, is meant to recreate what is above, and may be why it's a gateway or passage to what is above. One time, I was assigned to a group with the task of installing sensors in one of the ice caverns. For those of you not familiar, the military has long had systems where you put seismic sensors into the ground that detect any footfalls or vehicles in the area, alerting you when tripped, and even early devices could distinguish between single people, groups, wheeled vehicles, and track-driven vehicles. Just about any soldier could use this kind of sentry gear, so I'm not sure why they assigned me, except that they figured seismic gear should be deployed by a geologist or something. So we go into this cavern that did not have the highest ceiling, but covered quite a large area. There were ice columns from floor to ceiling irregularly distributed. The most distinctive thing about it was how bright diffuse white everything was, despite apparently being made of the same ice as all the others almost like everything was giving off its own fluorescent light, which I guess it was, since there were no visible light sources in there. The effect was that while you could see the columns, they would tend to blend into the background quite a bit, since it was all white on white. So anyway, even before I deployed the sensors, I had the feeling 
there was something in there with us. A lot of somethings, moving around, that I just couldn't see blending into the white. I wasn't supposed to be looking at any of the data from the sensors, but naturally, you have to open a screen and check the thing is working before you leave. And yeah, there were a lot of things triggering the sensors basically all over the entire area and all around us, showing up as mostly personnel. The place was alive and on, the walls moving like blood in veins, living ice. That day I was in a weird headspace, and frankly, I just didn't want to know. I'd kind of exceeded my weird shitness quotient earlier that week. Didn't want to be assigned to this job in the first place. Didn't want to risk being suspected of any snooping or tiptoeing around, and just wanted to get the fuck out of there ASAP. I just really wasn't in the fucking mood. I closed the screen, left it recording data as ordered, and announced I was done, and we did just that. Now, I regret not taking a closer look when I had the opportunity. Several obvious explanations besides just installing the shit in an apparently empty cavern, but was not assigned there ever again to collect data or retrieve equipment or anything. But also raises questions like, if they could get the ice to fluoresce like that, why have conventional lighting in other caverns and tunnels? Grandpa said he worked with a Lamaus. Ask me stuff. Grandpa worked for the US government. I don't know what his exact role was, but he died last month of cancer, and during the last few weeks of his life, he spilled the beans on some stuff regarding alien shit to me. I don't know if it's real or just an old dude on his deathbed pulling my leg. I love Gramps. I have some time to kill. Ask me anything. Just to start off, here's a few random tidbits of Gramps lore. Some of this is pasting from a Google Doc that I made of everything, so the writing is a little more formal here. Majestic, or MJ-12, from conspiracy theories and stuff, is not real. It's an OP used as a distraction. The US government has a huge hand in UFO conspiracy theories and such. Several prominent UFOologists on their payroll. Greys are the first aliens he met. He was told this is because they're already so ubiquitous in popular culture, to the point where they pretty much cease to be an alien. So it's the easiest and least unsettling alien to meet. He said it would be shocking how accurate our popular depictions of them are, if not for the fact that their description was an intentional leak in preparation for the disclosure event that was to occur in the 1980s was being the operating word here, because it never fucking happened. Reagan prevented disclosure in the early 80s. There was too much money to be made, and large corporations can't benefit from making ET tech available to public. Some ET tech has made it into the private sector, Gramps wouldn't say though. Greys are artificial, but also organic. This is why some people have reported that something is wrong when they are face to face with them like they don't belong. This is because of some sort of uncali vani kind of effect going on, because we are looking at something that was not the result of the natural processes of evolution, but of careful genetic engineering. Don't get me wrong, they're not robots, not in the way we think of robots. They are fully organic. You ever see Blade Runner? They're like the replicants. They're robots, but they're flesh and bone. No idea. I was told he worked for government, but he had a degree in engineering. Depends on the species. The greys are weird as fuck, because they're not real in the sense that we are. They're not organically made. Greys were created by a race that we call precursors to be worker drones. Precursors were a highly advanced civilization originally from the Zeta Reticuli. Went extinct only a few thousand years ago and left behind these little guys. Because they can't reproduce sexually, greys use cloning, but because the tech they're using belongs to the precursors 
and they have been created for very specific tasks with limits to learning and creative abilities, they don't quite understand it, just how to use it, so they're still figuring it out. The way Gramps explained to me is that they can't create stuff, so everything they have is made by a more advanced race, and they just know how to maintain it. So they're advanced, yes, but not like how we would say a civilization is advanced, where they're able to create new tech. I mostly know about the Grace. Gramps didn't go into too much detail about the others. Hmm, that's a hard one, because so much of what we know about UFOs and aliens and shit from popular culture and conspiracy theories has kind of prepared us for it. Like, it's not surprising at all when he told me that the US government turns a blind eye to fucked up shit that the A. Lamaus do. But they did try and prevent it with a treaty that Eisenhower signed, but they broke it really fast because the Greys didn't think they had to follow the treaty. They don't give a shit about anything. The treaty basically said, we provide cadavers for their genetic stuff that they're doing, and they leave live people alone, and that didn't last at all. The stuff that kinda got me is that the US government started actively abducting people and working with greys on their experiments sometime around the 70s. That's where the Dolce base rumors, mostly fake and gay but some truth there, started. Oh and before I forget, let me just lay out the other species for y'all, pasting from my good old Gramps Google Doc I made. The Precursors, who are extinct. The Greys. The Draco. Original Terrans. Draco is the name we gave them. Their true name is unpronounceable. The Zetans, from the same system as the Greys. Grey physiology is based on them, often referred to as praying mantis aliens. Zetans are not much more advanced than us, save for the introduction of Grey precursor tech a few hundred years before us. And the Nordic, a group that calls themselves Eta, which are actually the same as the Tall Whites. Almost nothing is known about them and they are not as human-looking as others say, nor are they blonde-haired, blue-eyed. Sorry, this is something I don't know. Gramps just said that one day, they met the aliens. Sorry, I know that's lame and a non-answer. Gramps only got specific with some things. Also, he wasn't all there when he was telling me this stuff, but whatever. Depends on species. Most of them come visit. Draco have been around for way longer than we have, and are from here. Some greys and some zetons live underground. I think it might get boring if I just wait for questions, so I'm going to post more from my handy Google Doc. There is no such thing as Dolce Base, at least not anymore. It moved to the Pacific Ocean, in what Grandpa called Pacific Base, but he said it went by a different name. He jokingly said he'd get sniped if he spoke the names. The Greys violated the treaty that Eisenhower had them sign, which outlined sanctioned and unsanctioned procedures. In a nutshell, a sanctioned procedure is anything that the US government has deemed acceptable for the Grey to participate in. At this time, the Greys could only perform these procedures on cadavers and livestock provided by the US government. They had to stop abducting people. They reluctantly agreed to this. Mostly just because the greys do not like inconveniences, even the most minuscule ones. And the US government represented a not insignificant inconvenience to them. Even if our technology was severely behind theirs, they didn't want any trouble, and they wanted to be able to conduct their work the easiest way possible. And us giving them genetic material was a pretty sweet deal for a while. But it fell short of their goals. When asked why they violated the treaty, they were just like, we don't see what the big deal is. It wasn't working out, so we stopped following it. Like, they had no concept of what a binding agreement or treaty was. They just did what we asked for a while because it was the easiest way forward for them. And then when they wanted to do more, it was only logical that they disobeyed us. Very focused on pure logic. Makes sense given their origins as worker drones, without the ability to create. There are ruins on the moon, but no actual settlements. Also, the Soviets put people on the moon first. 
they all died. Phil Schneider is an OP, like a lot of UFO kooks. Gramps' word, not mine. Some things he said are true, and some are not. Every OP is like this. I don't know about his death, but it was definitely not a natural one. He doesn't have that knowledge, but told me that the Draco, who predate us on this earth, were very interested in our evolution, and studied us from the very beginning, trying not to interfere. They thought seeing our evolution would shed more light on theirs, so he thinks we evolved naturally. No clue. He had an engineering degree, and since I was little, they always said he worked for the government. He never explicitly told me what he did, even on his deathbed. We asked a bunch, and he always moved on to something else. My brother and I theorize that he may have some moral conflicts, or be ashamed of what he did. One thing that was interesting was that he knew six languages, so I have floated the idea that he might be a xenolinguist or involved in communicating with the aliens. Name doesn't ring a bell, sorry. The only name he dropped was Richard Dottie. Yes, Antarctica is chock full of stuff that the Draco won't let us touch. They are also really worried about the ice caps melting because of what's in the ice. Have no clue how his engineering degree played into his work, if even at all. He also spoke six languages, so I wonder if that had anything to do about it. As I said in another post, even on his deathbed, he would not explain his actual job. He just wanted us to know what he learned. No, he was stationed at what he calls Pacific Base. In the ice caps, ancient bacteria and viruses, he says. Things that are the reason why the Draco no longer live on the surface. He said there was a hive mind microorganism that the Draco were terrified of. Nothing very exciting. The same deal they have with people. Genetic material. The greys are still trying to figure out how to keep cloning themselves without degenerating. More from my handy dandy Google Doc. If you ever hear a story from someone who claims to have met greys, ask them how they talk to you. If they say anything other than telepathy, they're full of it. But the cat's been out of the bag for a while on that one, so the liars know to say that. They communicate via telepathy, which used to require more than one human present at all times in order to verify, for the record, what was said. They can't direct information to a single person. If you're in their sort of telepathic range, you'll pick up on it. We have developed, with their help, a technology that allows us to record this telepathic communication. So now these groups are no longer needed for record keeping. It's this thing that picks up these waves that contain what they say, and then synthesizes a voice like a radio. Hopkinsville encounter is real. Rogue greys. They still don't know why they did what they did. Reptilians, yes. Running the government, no, Lamar. They work with the government, but they don't really like doing so, so their interactions are limited. When we made contact with Grace, the cat was sort of out of the bag, so they revealed themselves begrudgingly. Yes, underwater crafts are often directly involved with the base in the Pacific, and then the one in the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. The Draco want to study us, or so they say. Also, when I say Draco, I just mean the governing body we have contact with. There are other nations in cave systems around the globe that think differently, but I don't know jack about them, except there are some in South America and in Vietnam. The greys want to use our genetic material. The Zetans are not sure how humanity can be of use to them, so they are cordial. The Eta are worried we're going to destroy ourselves. Gramps was optimistic, but I am not. Based on what happened when Ronald Reagan killed that initiative, I am pretty sure they'll hide it until the aliens up and do it themselves. All he knew about the moon were ruins, and the fact that there were dead Soviets up there when we first arrived. The dead Russians were an accident. By the time we landed on the moon, it had been deserted for hundreds of years. What's the point of visiting Earth? We're way off in the boonies of our galaxy. Aren't there more interesting places to visit? Do the different types of aliens get along with each other? Okay, maybe last one, because this is a good question, and it's another one I asked him directly. The Draco were already from here, and a lot of them still live here underground. 
The greys are after our genetic material, and the other aliens followed suit. There are very few sentient alien races out there that they know of. We are all very rare, so naturally, they're drawn to us. The Draco keep to themselves. The Eater are very nice apparently, but he never saw one, or even knew anyone who did. Just that they existed and were interested in our civilization continuing on to interstellar travel. The Zetans are nice to us, but he thinks it's because they're trying to figure out if they can exploit us. The Greys, or just Greys, just little guys who don't really have personalities, or culture, or interests, or anything beyond the survival of their race. Maybe. He never said how many, but he said there were monoliths on the moon that are remnants from a past colony that didn't really go anywhere. Do not know, but he did tell me that a lot of people probably already know. Some of the A's are concerned about how we are a danger to our own existence, the Eta in particular. Again, he never met or knew anyone who met them, but there was documentation he was made privy to sometime in the late 70s slash early 80s that detailed meetings between the Eta and members of the extraterrestrial intelligence community, which he claims to have been part of. That is literally the most I got out of him in terms of his job and what it actually was. He said they had seen other races like ours die out because of similar things that we are doing to each other and the environment. The Eta pushed for disclosure and democratization of their energy sources in order to fix the issue of accelerated climate change, but you can probably guess why Reagan squashed that. Gramps is pretty conservative, but he hates Reagan. Draco biology is similar to ours, as they are from Earth and have a common ancestor, the same one we share with all animals. He doesn't know about the other races. Greys have been using human DNA in their cloning since the 50s, so by now, there is probably some similarities. The Greys don't physically speak. The Draco speak in a weird, growling, clicking speech, but can pronounce English words. But they don't like to speak English, so they use devices around their vocal cords or speakers that translate what they're saying to English. He says he has heard them speak English without the device before, and they had weird sentence structures on top of just sounding like growling. Like, their words all strung together in a singular growl, and they structure their sentences like, if you were to say, I'm going to the store, they would say, go I store. Here's another extract from the Google Doc that I'm comfortable sharing. The US is kind of a big melting pot, so if you're looking for a diverse gene pool, the US is a good place. That being said, of course, we know that some parts of Africa have greater genetic diversity than anywhere else on the planet. But if you're an alien looking for genetic material and see a country full of all types like ours, you're going to think that's a good spot for harvest. The other thing was our weapons and tech were advancing pretty rapidly, and they were observing it. It's not a coincidence that they started upping the ante around the time we developed nuclear tech. They did the same with the Soviets apparently, but due to some issues, they had to stay out of their airspace. Dolce was a base set up by the race known as the Zetans, who began working with Greys some time ago, at least a couple hundred years. They are what some people call tall Greys, or praying mantis, because they resemble the greys when not wearing their armor. When they are wearing it, they look sort of insect-like. Some people have come into contact with them while they're wearing their more traditional flight suits, and that's where you get the term tall greys, but others prefer to wear armor as they see humans as hostile. So the people who describe praying mantis aliens, they're probably talking about suited obsetans. So the Zetans and Greys have been working out of Dolce for a while, but prior to Roswell, kept most of their observations of humanity remote and limited to a small area around Dolce. It wasn't until they began catching wind of our advancing weapons tech did they start getting a bit more bold. We first discovered Dolce during Eisenhower's first meeting with the ETs. That's where he met not just the Greys, but the Zetans, and sign the Granada Treaty with the Greys. We are not sure if or what he would have signed with the Zetans, because Granada only covers the Greys, 
but given the physiological similarities between the two races, we wouldn't doubt he thought they were the same. And the Zetans would love that, because it allows them to scapegoat another group. Behavioral Programming in Entertainment A guy is hiding from the police and yells, I've got a gun. I've thought about this movie trope a lot. I've probably seen it dozens of times. It is probably not the best thing for a person in this situation to do, but it's certainly convenient for the police if people think that is the best thing to do. Other Hollywood examples might include how people react to sightings of aliens or demons. Rarely do people think critically in these situations, and it seems like programming for blue beam type scenarios. Or, consider how people in movies act toward authority in general. I was watching Dr. Strangelove the other day, and there is a scene where the phone is ringing and she asks if she should answer it. You have to, he responds. And I wonder if this is also programming designed to make life easier for police and debt collectors. Can anyone provide any other common examples of this sort of subtle behavioral programming, or perhaps some resource that has already gone through the trouble of listing and cataloging them? Thanks in advance. What you're talking about is also discussed in the area of subliminal messages. The examples you presented are great. Basically, they want to make behavior more predictable by implanting or teaching that type of behavior to the masses. Look into mass marketing tactics. The end goal is the last man slash hollow man type NPC of complacent people. We can see that most people are already like this, including stupid criminals. Another one I can think of is the push to show conspiracy theorists as unhinged, weird loners. They did this around the mid to late 1990s. Example, Conspiracy Theory, Mel Gibson Movie, X-Files, Neo and the Matrix, Fight Club, Loner guy who can't get laid goes crazy and does a Tawawism with all his male crew because they hate post-industrial consumer society. Big one that comes to mind right now is how everybody in America thinks that you have to wait 48 hours before calling the police about a missing person, when that is a total bullshit rule that was made up out of whole cloth by Hollywood. This has never ever been known to affect real life cases where people wanted to report a missing loved one because they remembered this rule from television. The implications are quite dark if this false information was spread on purpose by the media. That had been going on for several decades before the 90s. I remember reading the Warren Commission report on the JFK assassination and they state right up front that the commission was formed to debunk all the conspiracy theories that were spreading out of control. It was quite interesting to know that so many people in 1963 thought the president was murdered as part of a conspiracy. It puts the supposedly naive, innocent 1950s and early 60s in a new light. People were already deeply cynical about their government at that time. Regarding feminism, if you look at the way relationships are portrayed, usually it shows the woman leading and the man obeying. Pick related comes to mind and covers the macho meme as Vin Diesel's character in Fast and Furious attitude of I never back down from a challenge and my friends or my family, which men may adopt as legitimate ideas when they are actually bad ones. Ready for the MK Ultra pill? You think MK Ultra was about dosing people with LSD and using electroshock therapy, or putting Illuminati symbolism in Lady Gaga music videos all misdirection. Official documents put forth by FOIA say that MK Ultra failed. Oh, we were never able to create sleeper agents who could be activated by saying a random string of words, tee That's all bullshit. Why do they need sleeper agents to be activated when they can assassinate people in a thousand different untraceable ways? The real goal of MK Ultra was mass mind control and contrary to popular belief, it was unbelievably successful. MKUltra may have subdivisions of research, but its primary method of mind control is video media. Why? 
because out of all forms of media, text, audio, pictures, etc., video media has the most powerful effect on people and groups of people. From now on, I will refer to video media as movies, but it includes TV, advertisements, TikToks, etc. Research has shown that when different people read the same thing, they can form very different opinions. However, when different people watch the same video, they usually cluster closer into forming similar opinions. 1. Humans are unable to distinguish between reality and movies. Everyone will say they can, because they don't want to sound dumb, but our brains did not evolve to process movies. We literally think they are real unless we consciously make an effort to separate them from reality, which basically no one does, because no one thinks that we think movies are real. In fact, if you tell someone this, they will probably mock you for being low IQ or something, and being unable to understand that it's just a movie man. Yes, you probably don't think that Thanos is out there cruising the universe for the Infinity Stones, but subconsciously, you absorb all the behaviors and attitudes of protagonists in films. Human beings are evolved to emulate people who are socially successful, wealthy, beautiful, etc. This is an evolutionary survival strategy because it works in real life. If you emulate how Jeff Bezos behaves, in that he's a cutthroat, megalomaniacal asshole who crushes competition and isn't afraid to take literally what he wants, who studies people's flaws and exploits them for his own gain, etc., you will probably be successful. Or if you emulate your local business owner with a great work ethic who works seven days a week and focuses on nothing else than his business, you will probably be successful. But what do movies do? They present you with a fictional character who is usually very socially acceptable. The problem? You will try to emulate this fake behavior, which fucks you over in real life. I'll use women as an example, but men are also vulnerable to this. Sex in the city was legendary in how it turned an entire generation of women into 45-year-olds with no husband or kids. Bitter, angry, psychotic, addicted to wine and prescription pills, and hateful of the world and of men. This TV series shows women four very socially successful characters bound around New York high society, fucking chads and living their dreams and doing whatever they want. And in the end, it works out for all the characters. Therefore, women decided to emulate this successful behavior, and it ruined their fucking lives. What about for men? Men might look at someone like Tony Stark and think that is realistic, to be some kind of super genius who can solve anything instantly and create anything they want. Or they might look at someone like Vin Diesel in Fast and Furious and think it's good to never back down from a challenge or shit like, my friends are my family and they always come first. These things are not true in real life, but many men believe them because they have subconsciously absorbed successful social behavior from movies. Movies can do this to you because they literally create false memories. Movies create memories in your head that are not real and not based upon the rules of reality. Once you understand this, you begin to realize how fucked up everyone is, since everyone consumes like 50 plus hours of media a week. People spend more time watching video media than they do interacting with real people, which means that people have more fake memories than real ones. This is not good. Good point. Pretty Woman in 1990 was originally supposed to be a cautionary tale about prostitution, and the producers instead turned it into a light-hearted romantic comedy. It's quite fucked up. The film was initially conceived as a dark drama about prostitution in Los Angeles. In the 1980s, the relationship between Vivian and Edward also originally involved controversial themes, including Vivian being addicted to drugs. Part of the deal was that she had to stay off cocaine for a week. All good points, but they do create a stark character of the crazy conspiracy guy who is basically an outcast, or if he is in the group, it's a group of socially maladjusted losers, like the lone gunman from X-Files. 
the crazy conspiracy guy was actually right in examples 1-4, to four, but also at a high cost. Wouldn't you want to just live a comfy, conformist life working and spending? Thanos could have been predictive programming. That movie was released before or near the start of COVID pandemic. You are right, they had no reason to put extra effort into giving Thanos a deeper reason for wanting to exterminate half of all life. You're right about the Stark character, crazy conspiracy guy. I just can't think of any better examples at the moment. Sometimes it's more subtle than a Stark character, like a character making a suggestion that the powers that be are behind something and getting shut down immediately. Not a Stark character, so much as taking a moment to condition against asking certain questions. So that would be a lens to look through. When is asking questions a trait of a character who is otherwise portrayed negatively, versus a one-off behavior of a good character that is corrected by his peers. The CIA invented the term conspiracy theories to immediately shut down anyone who refused to accept the official story. If you doubted the government, you were automatically a crazy person. This worked over the course of decades, and thus, we now have a lot of MPC normies who just want to keep their head down and never question things. We're becoming like China, where they fear that the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. But even in China, there were anti-lockdown protests in 2022. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. Maybe stock character isn't the accurate term. Take a movie like Fight Club, which was a cult hit at the time, and people who enjoyed it kept repeating the line, don't talk about Fight Club. It captured the late 90s discontent with consumer culture. Then it showed what happens when a guy rebels against it. He goes from a comfy apartment to living in a disgusting abandoned building. He has a split personality where the normal side of him is sexless, and the Brad Pitt side does whatever he wants. He also has to touch nasty bags of human fat from liposuction clinics. If you saw the movie, you know all these details. It's an adventure, but also chaotic, and ultimately, we don't know what happens next. He blew up some buildings, big whoop. I see movies as mini simulations that show us what if. What if you went down this crazy path? Look what happens. How about you just stay on your current path? It's safer. You got a glimpse of exciting adventure. Now go back to work on Monday. Talk about it around the water cooler, then forget about doing anything similar. This is a thinker, Anon. I know just what you mean. With recent events, we were all shown just how many good people behave like literal herd animals, especially when stressed. Maybe cinema and other so-called entertainment is used like a tool to herd humans. We already know about the power that simple memes have in shaping behavior. Maybe cinema and sound do the same, but on a very large scale. Entertainment media also distracts people away from looking into serious, important info. After watching a two-hour movie, you feel exhausted. If you watch two movies in a row, or one to three episodes of a series, you will definitely feel exhausted and slightly disassociated from reality. Note how popular the binge-watching trend got in recent years. Also, note how much time and energy people spend watching porn, OnlyFans, campsites, etc. Lastly, directors, producers, and actors get paid millions for doing an unnecessary job with high supply of competing media. Why is that? Where is all this money coming from? It's because it's highly useful to the powerful controllers to both distract our energy and control our minds. That's why entertainment biz people got paid a lot, including their lawyers, realtors, doctors, etc. Here is an example Anon. When I was a small kid watching cartoons, I was annoyed by how many cartoons had hypnotism in them. You are getting sleepy, very sleepy, with the pocket watch. One cartoon character would do this to another, who would then fall under hypnosis and be told to do something, and in a stupor, they would do what they're told. The casual destruction of cities and property, and natural structures, and mass murder of random bystanders when the good guys face off with the bad guys. Yep happens in every major superhero movie. Prepping sheeple minds for collateral damage. It's okay if half the Mideast or Ukraine gets blown to bits. We're the good guys, fighting the bad guys. 
how there's always the big boss brain telling henchmen to do the dirty work, and they do it without question. The henchmen are expendable. The henchmen are not held responsible. Only the big boss is. Even though, without his henchmen, the big boss's evil doings wouldn't get done. Good point. Here is one. Husbands are always very stupid and sex-hungry. Wives are always mean and do not enjoy having sex. Usually in sitcoms. I never got the joke. Great topic. One example comes to mind that always bugs me is the US military slash intelligence agencies slash government being painted in a positive and even heroic way. It's more insidious when it's not central to the story, because it affects people's attitudes subliminally. MCU is a perfect example of this. I mean, just look at this poster. This nerd is a CIA agent and a good guy. Remember back to the early to mid-90s? The cops were usually portrayed as stupid, slow, and last to arrive at the crime scene. Then something switched, and they started showing cops in a more positive light, along with FedGov agents, like you point out. Lots of secret agent movies. I saw a movie recently that made reference to shadow government and portrayed the CIA in a negative light. This movie was released on Netflix. Title is The Grey Man. It was not a good movie. Hmm. I wonder if they're gearing up to switch the narrative again, to suit their purposes. It all seems to be pendulum swings with this stuff. The literally me genre is a current one. People relate to a movie character whose problems are mostly self-made, or made worse by an action, and instead of taking action to improve, they usually self-destruct. That, and the current push of literally me and I'm schizo, seem made to force people into not being an individual, and to being incoherent, and to have no credibility. Both seem to encourage individual instability. The literally me also mimics the earlier female type of mood. That's so me, and the I'm schizo mimics the earlier female, I'm such a crackhead, I'm feral. I'd also wager the built different and NPC memes were pushes to make people think they were born special and superior which is a surefire way to compel people to be nothing. If you think you're born as something, why waste energy becoming something? It feels more and more as if memes originally caused great change accidentally, like when everyone became obsessed with eating ass, but now can be used to cause great change, such as making groups you dislike think they're born special. They should seem unhinged, and they should just mimic film characters' personalities. The most obvious one I can think of is that every movie I've seen involving undercover cops, there's always some scene, like in The Departed, where the crook asks the undercover cop, are you a cop? There's some kind of urban street ghetto legal theory that if an undercover cop lies when asked to identify himself, that this absolves you of any wrongdoing he might witness you do. I've seen this in at least a dozen different movies and TV shows I can think of. It's gotten to the point where it's like a meme unto itself. You gotta tell me if you're a cop. This is, of course, total horseshit. An undercover cop can lie about being a cop. That's the entire point of being an undercover cop. All good points. People are herded into certain personality types. Or to rationalize their actions a particular way as they emulate destructive movie character behavior. Another thing I've worried about is the selective aspect of this programming. E.g., someone who is autistic might think that the goofy character that everyone laughs at is a good character to emulate. Only a certain type of person would fall victim to these destructive suggestions. So it would seem that the purpose is not so much to program society at large, but rather to make certain people expose their ineptitude, perhaps to yank them out of the gene pool, while hopefully leaving others untouched. I suspect that a lot of the way gay people are portrayed has this purpose, to make them express themselves in ways that others are likewise programmed to identify. In any case, there is this sort of compartmentalization of the programming. The different sorts of men will focus on different characters and will be programmed according to those different characters. So an analysis of these tactics can get complicated. In many 60s, 70s, 80s media, You'll notice they often have a token youth character who is sick of the adults always telling them what to do. 
an other really midwit rebellion against adults slash the system narratives, centering around this youth character. A prime example is the young ape in the first Planet of the Apes movie. Looking back, obviously this was a psyop to push the destabilization of society and values that occurred around those times. The NPC meme is really just another continuation of that. Targeting youths and getting them thinking other people are NPCs, not human, lacking souls, forms a good base for radicalizing yet another generation to be able to see portions of their fellow citizens as disposable whenever necessary. Another thing I frequently see in games and movies is scenes where a dead person has their eyes closed by someone as a kind of gesture of respect or mourning. In reality, this wouldn't work. Your eyelids don't just glue together when you're dead. If you actually did this to a corpse, the lids would just open on their own. You probably also shouldn't touch a corpse in whatever state you find it in, as that will hinder any investigation into the person's death. We've definitely been programmed to follow emergency procedures with our country's emergency number. I know this because I had a non-lucid dream in which the house I lived in with my family started to set on fire in the middle of the night and I just immediately went to the phone. Dialed 000, live in Austria, and just went through the procedures fast and efficiently, like I was a robot outputting a command, like I already knew exactly what to do although I had never done it before in real life. One example that is real is that the government told people making gangster movies to make them point the gun sideways. This then made real criminals do this, and it greatly reduced fatalities because the criminals would basically never hit their target, pointing like that. Another one that comes to mind is regarding Christianity movies, like The Boondock Saints or Father Stew, want to portray Christianity as an edgy, tough guy thing, when it's really a vehicle for, well, the thing that elites love to do on a mass scale, and was created by the elites for that purpose. They make it seem like the authorities don't want you to be a Christ cook, but it's exactly what they want you doing, and they created it to ensure that you are enslaved and your history and culture is wiped. There was a repeated line about how we don't negotiate with terrorists, in movies around the late 90s to early 2000s. A major example is Air Force One, 1997. If I recall, the president's plane gets hijacked. I don't remember anything further about the movie, but there's probably that line. Anyway, it doesn't have much to do with our day-to-day -day life or shifting behavior, but note that this movie came out before 2001. I remember seeing some local news story when I was a kid about gangs killing people who flash their headlights. Now, as I am older, I realize clearly that this urban legend was started by the government to keep people from flashing their lights to warn others about speed traps. Now we know that these little time filler stories are provided by national media companies to local news stations all over the country, but we didn't know back then. So, in hindsight, the myth about the headlight killers is almost certainly a psyop to keep people from behaving in a way that deprives the justice system of fees because we all know that traffic citations are big business. I think the TV show Cops, Forensic Files, etc. is a really good example of this. It shows police as this sort of godlike force that will catch you, no matter how fast or far you drive. Notice that when you watch car chases, etc., you never actually see anyone get away. Police were never depicted in a way that would paint them in a way they couldn't find or catch you. A common trope in movies is the lunch room category tour. At some point in the movie, the protagonist goes through the cafeteria of his high school and we're informed of the cliques at school. These are invariably some formulation of the following. Jocks, nerds, popular girls, stoners and goths, weirdos and freaks. Somehow, it is only the protagonist and his immediate friend group that defies categorization. A lot of times, the central conflict is a member of the protagonist clique tries to befriend people in a different clique, and chaos ensues. It's a not-so-subtle way to say, stay in your lane. We're actively told that people never interact with people different from themselves, and that doing so always invites problems.
UFO knowledge. I have intimate knowledge of what the US currently knows about UFOs, minus the last two years. UFOs are primarily unmanned drones. UFOs are built to spec each time they are deployed. UFOs are created by a mobile construction facility that hides in the ocean. Construction facility destroys anything that comes close to it and will disappear for days when approached aggressively. US believes the facility has been active on Earth for at least 100 years or much longer. Fire away on questions. I'll answer what I can. You won't be disappointed. Is there a working theory on the origins? If so, care to elaborate? Quite a bit, but we think the construction facility has been around since at least 4000 BC. See sightings slash paintings from the early eras of history. Has any form of intelligible communication been established? Yes, it also depends on your viewpoint. They mostly want very little to do with us until we start to talk about war and nuclear options. It's one of the reasons why you see them so often at critical events. Do they know who or what is creating these craft? Yes, as mentioned earlier, the mobile construction unit is responsible for their deployment and construction. Any potential that they are made by a higher branch of the US government? Absolutely not. What allows them to fly so fast? What technology? Gravity manipulation and the materials they are constructed from. We think the construction unit is driven by AI. The response time to threats is almost instant and usually very calculated and well thought out. You all should pay attention to this. The majority of UFOs as I mentioned previously, are built to spec and purpose. This is why they are always different sizes. The contents and equipment usually mimic the intended purpose too. Is it related to that one under the rock in that one Scandinavian country? The one that deploys within tectonic spaces? No, this one almost never leaves the Bermuda Triangle. Bullshit. Governments have, and have had for a while, advanced anti-gravity crafts. You asked if the particular UFOs we study are the result of a foreign government, not if other governments have shittier versions. Speed alone tells us what we are looking at. Do the UAPs return back to the manufacturing unit? Yes, some come in and leave the planet, but very rarely. Usually, the same number that comes in goes out, unless special circumstances arise. It feels more like a carrier, but with construction capability. What are the purposes of the UAPs? Surveillance of humans? The US believes they are not here to harm us. They only seem interested in us once they realize we are destroying things around us, including each other. One of the officials in charge said something that stuck with me. They act like keepers of a zoo, uninterested in the daily life of wildlife until there's a problem. I can approach the facility without being attacked. Lol. The last unit we saw approach the facility didn't even have time to communicate they were being attacked before it was over. What's buried under the Mesa on Skinwalker Ranch? Is that show even legitimate? It seems like some of the most legitimate research on anything paranormal that I've ever seen in my life and I'm very curious about what they seem to be finding. No idea that the project, if any, is likely to be kept separate. There were two rare elements found fused together that were under the mesa, and I'm very curious what's going on there. No idea about that either. The crafts we recover are built with numerous elements. Some aren't even obtainable here. Are they friends? They cut their losses when crashes are recovered. Same with personnel. Zoo keepers aren't friends with the animals. Do you know if the entities behind the UFOs are native to the Earth? Like an older civilization, breakaway civilization, or a civilization of humans that escaped a previous cycle of cataclysm due to their advanced tech? Limited expertise, since my role is more craft slash analysis. US believes they are foreign to our world. A previous cataclysm could make sense. They also show up in times of strife, such as natural events. Also. I think that the other guy who was talking about approaching the area without being attacked 
is a remote viewer. I lurked on other boards, but haven't really been to this one since I was comfortable with the answers I had. I wasn't aware that was a thing on here. There were rumors among my coworkers that had psionic abilities, but honestly, it rarely comes up in a conversation. Give it a shot. Have you tried sending in a raft of hippies? The AI may not recognize them as a threat. JK. Based on previous disappearances and acts of hostility, we believe the construction facility has learned what is and isn't hostile. Usually, it will just move away or stay deep under the water. It doesn't fire on civilian boats, for example. Exceptions apply. We have seen one or two go missing, usually after sharp turns, etc. Any relation to Antarctica? My section monitored just this craft and any interactions it attempted. A previous co-worker did mention something in passing of Antarctica at one point, but I ignored it, if I'm being honest. Talking about other projects is considered career suicide. How about the destination of the space orbs? Is Jupiter a potential destination? I believe they are keeping a massive orb inside of the gas giant, though I have no evidence but many dreams of it. No idea. If it is a project, I haven't seen it. No orbs out of the construction facility, just UFOs. What units have been lost approaching the construction machine? Why have they not sent a sea wolf to investigate? The Jimmy Carter with its nanotech. Everything you can think of really. At one point, nuclear missiles were being toyed with again, and we deployed fighters and a sub with serious intent. Everything except the sub was lost. How have they come to the conclusion the UAP being released are ET? If they don't know what the UAP are to begin with, or if there is nothing inside them, it's a pretty big jump to go right to ET. They crash sometimes. Parts fail, and gravity engines near the surface of the planet can be like crossing an intersection. We recover these and sometimes find passengers. We mostly see drones now. Back in the earlier days, we saw a lot more piloted craft. Why do you not know anything about the last two years? Just curious. Moved on from the project because of new management that didn't trust older proven methods. Also, any details on what happened to the pilot that didn't have time to communicate? Normal approach details. Pilot responsive and actively talking. The feed cuts out pilot still talking, suddenly nothing. Poor guy likely had no idea it was likely a suicide mission. Based on what we've seen, construction facility has far superior weapons than the UFOs do. This weapon destroys the matter it hits entirely. It also shits on anything electronic in the vicinity. The contents and equipment usually mimic the intended purpose too, like the equipment share a pattern specific to its purpose. Yes, usually when we find a thinner model. For example, it would have no pilot and a lot of sensory hardware. My favorite is finding one that is fitted for research. If we are lucky, we find things we have never seen before. Before I left, we were looking at what we thought was a lab of some kind for genetics. Are you talking about the one shaped like a pear or a burger? Be more specific. This regard is the burger ones, isn't it? Size, shape, and speed are usually the factors we use to determine what the purpose of the UFO is. We get it wrong sometimes. They can be quite large, and both pear and burger shapes are known as builds. Is this the burger-shaped ones or the pear-shaped ones? Both. I've had two orange orbs approach me to within 100 feet one night, glowing translucent, but rather dim like the setting sun seen through smog. They were flying in 45 degree formations like this, about 50 miles per hour. Research slash science vessels sometimes have mobile light producing cameras used for multiple purposes from scouting to keeping threats contained or at bay. These are shaped like hammers and when operated are extremely bright. Red lights are a sign of hostility or caution to deploy weapons. Orange lights are usually for spotting minerals or living things. As soon as I blinked my flashlight at them, they accelerated to several thousand knots and disappeared over the horizon. Searched YouTube and found several videos of the same objects, mostly near San Diego. 
I'm not surprised. The range on those is quite large. The UFO was likely somewhere above you, quite high up. Is the underwater base near Catalina Island creating these? No. This one has only left the Atlantic Ocean twice. Both times were before I arrived. Are aliens human or humanoid? Humanoid. Very humanoid. Then, do you know anything about abductions, forced breeding programs, etc.? Bodies are removed before we are allowed to perform work. We definitely see some passing by, hence changes in older proven methods by new management. Also, real true disclosure anytime soon, the Air Force is extremely frustrated with the lack of progress on their end. We felt similar, but are unable to share details with them. Jack's Valley is somewhat close then. I believe he was the closest so far to what's really going on. No one really knows, and anyone claiming to is full of shit. We know quite a bit about it all, but the shit is about five steps ahead of us. I believe there isn't a situation in which we aren't bamboozled by them. From what I understand, we biologically operate on a point-by-point -point time basis, and it's operating on a range of time. Still a nebulous phenomenon that is impossible to be precise about and plays tricks. How do you study something that doesn't want to be studied? You absolutely nailed it with this comment. The moment we think we start to grasp what's going on, it'll either throw a curveball with its nature or intentions, or seems to instigate global conflict. We're playing checkers while it's a hyper-dimensional Magnus Carlsen. So I'd assume this was sort of AI design that seems to be advanced yet already prepared for the get-go. Can you rephrase this? Basically, when designed to, let's say, be a miner, you will usually see hardware dedicated to resource collection on the vessel. If the vessel is something scientific, you may encounter things like tools, and as previously mentioned, something akin to a lab. We thought of it more as a, I need to go hiking. So the construction facility builds you a car, UFO, and packs it full of hiking supplies, and even adjusts the shape to fit what was packed. Do you think there are fewer piloted crafts because the population of the facility, if any, is declining? No. The common consensus is that they are just being careful. I've heard recovery of living pilots doesn't usually go well for either of us. We suspect they piloted a lot of initial craft due to early complications. We also saw more crashes. Any bodies recovered show any ranges of aging we can recognize? I wonder if most of the inhabitants are either old or dead at this point, though younger bodies would disprove that, I suppose. No idea about age. Not my specialty. And asking about it would have been a net negative, especially now. Previous higher-ups were better about being open with information, since discovery happened quicker. What do passengers look like? Are they biological or android? Bio. Did you know anything about people such as Stephen Greer, Lou Elizondo, or whatever, etc.? Are these people in the know, or LARPers, or controlled misinfo, etc.? No idea. One name sticks out you didn't mention. Mentioning Bob Lazar by name would likely have taken you out back and put down like a dog. Do the math on why. Out of everything ever found regarding UFOs in general, what is your personal favorite? New engine was deployed with a very large model that I had never seen before. We usually see three to five gravity producing engines. This one had seven. Favorite object or find? Probably the lab, since we never fully understood how it worked before it was destroyed. Makes me wonder whether a meaningful distinction between scientific study and amusement still exists for them, if it ever did. This was before my time, but they talked about a bus UFO that had more occupants than hardware. Most of the intended purpose appeared to be for physical viewing. I wonder if they ever just wanted to look at the animals. How long until we can hang with aliens? Have any stupid cousins that destroy everything they touch? When do you want to see them again? This is a strangely recurrent theme. At a minimum, they have Cytronic devices of some sort. This reminded me of something in my first year. UFO crashes, they remove the bodies well before my team arrives. We start to look, and the craft is unpowered at first. A few minutes later, the craft powers on and starts to close up. 
we radio out and get a response from the unit, removing one of the occupants that they are working on. Ship powers off, and the other team asks if we are good to go. No mention of how access was possible. I suspect the pilot may have interfaced with the ship by remote or psionic ability. Not really translucent, but maybe the outer shell was. They definitely had an inner core that wasn't see Lots of tools they used to produce light. If this is still about the orb, the shell that you may have seen was just the light around the device. I called the hammer. Why did the UFOs fuck up all those people in Brazil? Sauce? Might let me give you more insight. Was it by accident of them not knowing we'd be damaged by their equipment, or do they not care? If found, they usually monitor us. If approached at an uncomfortable distance, they flee. When cornered, it doesn't end well. Their tools can do harm to us, even for just scientific purposes. We think they just don't care. Do you believe we are under their control in some way? Or were sometime in history? Possibly, but I have no way of knowing. The higher-ups I worked for seemed hell-bent on discovering more about them. Usually not a quality found among controlled beings. What were the main reasons for the crashes? I'd think random lightning or freak accident, seeing how advanced they are. You'd be surprised by how many mistakes they make, especially the further you look back. One area they seem to avoid like the plague, we suspect is due to issues with gravity and flight. Before they figured it out, we collected quite a few mishaps there. They've tried to shoot some down, mostly over nuclear incidents, but failed miserably. Did you see written symbols in the craft? Yes, usually marked by doorways and key objects. Written language appears frequently on tools and critical items. Also, it reads like their objective is to observe and preserve. I agree. The idea was pitched that they are waiting for us to mature or perhaps something bigger to arrive, and they don't want us to ruin the planet in the meantime. What do you believe to be the reason for the uptick in sightings? Once again, my knowledge was cut off about two years ago. If you mean very recently, my guess would be the Russians and US having a secret little dance amongst themselves. When nuclear anything gets involved, we see large deployments for long periods of time. Strife seems to be the catalyst. Also, what is your scariest experience while engaging with the phenomenon? What was your favorite, if any? Doors closing on us as mentioned above made me wish I had brown pants. Still fascinated with the lab we found. It was damaged by accident and I never really got much time with it. Are you aware of any foreign A-tech that was successfully reverse engineered? Yes. We used to laugh at Russian and Chinese designs. We stopped laughing at China when they produced an operational but buggy version of their mining equipment. Still stumps most of our engineers. China also lies out of its ass, but from what we saw, we deemed it operational and working. Countries listed above have flight-capable craft, just not very good ones. I'm honestly surprised no one has asked about the energy source or internals. Heading out for the night, but we'll be on tomorrow to answer more. One example was shortly after I joined. They said one was downed, but two occupants were alive. The first team couldn't get close without being attacked. Aliens never seemed to recover their lost UFOs for whatever reason, so they just waited a few days until they died, then recovered the UFO. Hostility is usually their last option. Genuinely confused about what you're asking me. Recruitment isn't something easy if that's your goal. They usually recruit people with extremely clean background checks, and I never saw anyone under 35. What is their energy source? You mentioned Bob, so I think I know already. Correct, Tish. The power source is E-115. The thing no one talks about is that usually. They seal it within the craft because it produces its own gravity field. Bob Lazar handled E-115, which was already pulled out, which is rare and weird. Protocol now is that only one person is allowed to handle E-115. I was forbidden from touching or interacting with it. We still have trouble producing this shit too. How do UFOs travel? In the context of those Tic Tac reports and Bob Lazar's report slash video where they seemingly jump through space time and light to appear in a new location. Notice how it just phases to a new location, like staggers? 
This is common when moving at high speed from a standstill or slow speed initially. Gravity distorts time and the object inside the field can stagger when traveling. I've heard the craft can detect the presence of a camera and when someone is filming them. Not unless the craft is put into a mode to detect a lens, no. If the UFO is standing still or hovering though, they won't miss you. You can see a face like you're standing in front of someone a couple miles out. Doesn't look like a camera though, their eyes are different. How are you able to talk about any of this? Didn't you swear to secrecy? Yes, liver cancer sucks. Wouldn't the government already have their eye on you, considering you could turn out to be a loose end? I'm not going on national TV or radio. I'm on a 4chan board. I'm sure they look at stuff like this, but cancer makes you feel a little different. Also, did you or your co-workers experience strange things outside of work that couldn't be related to what you saw? No. Usually most people working there had no prior interest in UFOs, or at least feigned not having interest. Ask me anything, I'll answer what I can. Your LARP is bad, and you should feel bad. Learn to read and on. Not true. Most zookeepers love their work and love the animals a great deal. I've wondered if some of them do like us. They definitely have the ability to destroy us. The spheres are a type of unmanned surveillance drone. Shaped like a hammer, but when activated, yes, they appear like spheres due to the intense light. They see light differently and looking into the sun for them isn't an issue like it is for us. I can't speak for the psionic abilities, if any, since I've only heard rumors in passing. We believe the lack of communication was inherent to their personal beliefs about us. As mentioned previously, but active, serious discussion about destruction gets them going. Do you think they're playing some role in stopping rogue entities and dangers from space, hurting us on a large scale? That was another theory, yes. We think they are more interested in keeping the planet safe from us. Two main suggestions are that we don't spoil the planet before they arrive and take it from us, or they are letting us evolve and grow while preventing devastation. What do you know about this claim? Sadly, not enough to give you a good response. Remote viewing is a very strange thing. It's shown to work at times, but most of the time it doesn't. Or the conclusions have fuzzy connections, as if forced. As for the interdimensional aspect of it, I don't believe there's anything actually interdimensionally happening. It's just our best way to try and grasp slash perceive what's going on behind the veil. From what I understand, whatever is behind the phenomenon is the ability to manipulate matter slash energy in similar ways that we can manipulate information. We can create 3D realities and manipulate them via our understanding of machine code and linear algebra. It also seems to be able to play around with space-time, almost as if we're sitting on or perceiving time that's been homogeneously transformed into projective space, while they are free to move about homogeneous space. If they haven't entered the projection space, then they could freely move about our space without interacting with it until they collapse their space coordinates into our projective space, normalizing their position with their homogeneous coordinates. Why does image analysis by someone competent on the original UFO always show weird stuff? Gravity and the reflective nature of the craft usually. Am I right in assuming the disco lights is just air absorbing radiation and being completely saturated by it? No. What materials are these UFOs made of? That answer gets complicated quickly. Short answer is an alloy that we cannot reproduce, but only repurpose. This alloy is kind of like a film that fits over the frame of the craft. I mentioned they were built to spec. That's exactly what I mean the shape is always officially designed. The actual frame itself is heavier and composed of more elements. Both of these alloys have a lot of elements we cannot reproduce. One of the main problems when repurposing these alloys is getting them hot enough. They absorb heat very well and shaping the metal is a tedious process. Can you quickly walk through the process of identifying the contents of a crashed UFO craft? First team leaves that deals with occupants and initial discovery. We arrive and meet with an external member of the team who can touch and examine parts 
we are not allowed to interact with. We never have to cut our way into the UFO. We enter the first order of business is checking for E-115, then leaving the ship together to send it away. We return and look for any tools and loose objects that can be extracted. We then start to strip any specialized components on board, such as sensory equipment or navigation. We leave and a third and fourth team arrive, likely to remove the bulk of the craft. Tell me about the mobile construction facility making them. Shaped like an extremely large UFO, but as one mentioned before, more of a burger design. Almost never leaves the Atlantic Ocean. In fact, it will sit through hurricanes and only move elsewhere to release or receive a UFO. No visible weapons or cockpit from sat footage. It also does not use any lights, unlike other UFOs. Are there no other things making UFOs? Yes, UFOs arrive and depart Earth, but very infrequently. These UFOs are usually quite large. The US has been itching to get its hands on a freighter UFO, when inbound or outbound, but the chance has never presented itself. Leadership openly stated securing one would result in promotion. That makes sense for the ones like in military videos, but what about the saucers with multi-colored lights? I highly doubt these are drones or military, except for the triangle kind. Never seen a triangle UFO. Lights are usually on bigger vessels and are sensory in nature. They are also used to spot each other. Gets asked genuine questions, ignores questions, ignores bonus question. See below. Take less DMT when you ask questions and people might take you halfway serious. People you wouldn't trust to work on your car engine claim they are the go-to guy for examining UFOs. This seems very unlikely. I'm not here to convince anyone. You'll notice yourself coming back to things I've said over time on your own as understanding increases. Pay attention to the Space Force. We were told this will be a long project disinformation was one of the key takeaways. New management was hell-bent on going back to secrecy. They thought we were way too open with our operation. Sounds like OP's ship is the later form. I would not be surprised if the pilots are in sentient craft. No, they are remotely controlled or directly controlled. The zookeeper analogy is strange. Agree with another here that most zookeepers like their jobs and care about the animals. They display high levels of empathy. Some of the tools designed for abduction would make you rethink this. A lot of them cause pain or harm. A common tool we find is one that seems to scramble coherent thoughts and make the subject childlike. The best way I can describe its use is like forcing a stroke without actually having one. It makes you delirious, but also childlike for a few hours. Are these beings incapable of empathy? Do they have emotions? I assume they must have learned something from the recovered bodies. Never interacted with them. Only heard information passed along. They can be upset though with previously mentioned topics. They definitely have emotion. Are they from off-world and true ETs? The US and leadership were adamant they were off-world. Why the cloak and dagger? You're asking the same questions leadership struggled with. We were not entirely sure. If the Air Force is confused like you say, why is it the only agency we know of that is not cooperating with Congress in the AARO? You might get a laugh out of this. The USAF is kept in the dark. We operated above them. A close co-worker wondered if even the president knew. Namely, Trump. Because we thought he would just tell anyone. Any idea what they might be waiting for? Personally, I think they just want us to grow and become sentient. UFOs arrive all the time and dock with the mobile construction unit. The way I see it, travel time is quite fast. If something was coming to destroy us, it would have arrived already. Finding out the truth made them cry and fear for the lives of their offspring's will to live. I've always suspected my department was under a much higher one with more information. I can't speak to any horrors or worries since none were mentioned, unless we were pitching theories. As I stated above, I think a lot of US top brass don't even know about it. I heard the phrase 
fuck Bill Clinton thrown around regarding access to information. I'm pretty sure he asked, if I'm not mistaken. Are they human looking, or do they resemble something else? Is it something we've seen written about in the UFO topics or pop culture? They are smaller than humans, and look like your typical grey aliens that you say. Holes for ears, and they can look at very bright objects without being blinded. I've never seen one move their mouth, but I've also never interacted with one. What do you know about these? Operation Fishbowl. Nothing. Vergina Crash. Nothing. Roswell Crash. They were accurate on some things. The material could have been internal components or small pieces of the alloy around the craft. The alloys I saw look different from the pictures. Operation Moondust. Rumors only. Do all nations coordinate their effort studying this Bermuda Triangle factory, or is each doing their own thing? Each of them do their own thing. US is pretty greedy with what it finds. We will usually extract information, but never offer any in return. What is the mining tool China has supposedly reverse engineered capable of? Hard to explain if you haven't seen it. Basically, it extracts the minerals via beam slash light directly out of the rock. It has the ability to fill the rock to some degree. China was able to figure out how it works and make a similar version. The problem with the one they built is it only operates for a few seconds before it runs out of power. They still don't understand E-115. It also exploded one time and they had to remake it. Are the made-to-spec craft you described just the metal-looking spheres observed and brought up in the latest AARO hearings? Seems to be a lot of orbs, discs, and tic-tacs. Yes, this is exactly why they always look so different. Things like triangles and hard-edged squares don't exist though. Pill shapes are extremely sought after, and some we think are freighters. Not a huge variety you would expect from a made-to-spec craft. The best analogy I can give for the variety slash spec comment is I think of it like wrapping food in tinfoil on a plate. It's a bad analogy, but you get the idea. Usually, they will always be round, or oval sometimes, even pill-shaped. The tin foil fits the intended function of covering everything without squishing it. Even stories of MJ-12 suspect the president didn't have a need to know. Staff at our agency were usually older and had been there forever. This tracks when considering term limits. Many abduction stories seem malevolent. Previous post I mentioned tools. I think the harm they cause is the same as cutting open a mouse to check the local population for signs of bad health. Collateral damage. Do they just not like humans and like the planet? What's to stop them from just culling us all? They could absolutely destroy us if they wanted to. They have started launch sequences before that we suspect were tests on what they are dealing with. My personal view is that they have to stay out of our way, but keep us from destroying ourselves. I imagine life elsewhere in the universe often destroys itself. Do you think we will get more answers from the government, disclosure, as in them telling us aliens exist, or will the cover-up continue? At one point, they briefed us about opening up information about the craft, but not the construction unit. Nothing happened for months. New leadership shows up, Suddenly, it's back to bullshit and secrets again. As to the USAF, they must have the images and video of these things pretty close up. You'd think they would be the agency with the most knowledge of the subject. The USAF's goal is to fight other countries. They have footage, but it was mostly discovered and recorded by sheer chance. The Space Force, however, will be an entirely new thing. Their focus is similar to ours with a sprinkle of disinformation. Are all craft related to this factory in Greys? The ones we looked at, yes. Or are there more species coming here? Possible, but I wasn't made aware. It wouldn't shock me. I've wondered if we are being protected from others. Do we produce it, or is it collected from other craft and just recycled? Because that seems to be the case. We tried to produce it and failed. We produce a shitty variant of it, and use it for certain parts that we build. Most of what we use 
for things that cannot be replaced is recycled. Our ability to rehash through shit has gotten better slowly. Or is it used up, to the point we need to produce it to continue testing? They set aside certain amounts for research. Most of it goes towards reuse. Is there tech that was gained from these craft that the military widely uses today? Or civilians for that matter? A lot of your stealth, aircraft, sport, smoother designs for one. Learning to track them also helped with targeting software. Laser technology comes to mind, since it's a crippled version of what they use. Most of what I saw was way above us. It's hard to put the hammers in, and how you see through them into words. It's not like a drone camera, and it's not a clear image, to us at least. Can you clarify? They have a distinct fascination with radiation. Remember how I mentioned they don't go far from home base? When Fukushima happened, the construction facility deployed multiple UFOs to the location over multiple weeks. They were also very interested in Ebola at one point. We can't confirm abductions there since the local population is... You get the idea. No one cared. According to Alessandro, Italians seem to have a good grasp on the phenomenon, including that they originate somewhere from the Mediterranean. Is it possible that there is another UFO factory there? Starting this thread and seeing everyone mention the Arctic has me worried if there were others. It would make sense with other sightings, since as previously mentioned, far from home is rare. Does the moon hold anything of interest? No, not that I'm aware of. We know that UFOs entering and exiting the atmosphere do not go towards any known planet often. Are the flying orbs just scouts, research drones? Do you mean orbs in the sky? Or do you mean landed craft deploying them? I previously mentioned that there are tools that are shaped like hammers. They emit extremely bright light and are used as a sort of drone or scout. They are able to view almost 360 degrees and detect everything from minerals to bio. If a human encounters them, they are usually deployed to keep watch and figure out when to wrap up and leave. Do you think they interfere with our general science or investigations? Yes, they do not want to be studied. They also do not collect down craft or occupants. It seems to be an oh fucking well approach. E-115 is the exception. They don't seem to enjoy the idea of us toying with it. Do they seem to learn when the craft get caught? Yes. There is an area they actively avoid in Mexico, among others. They also deploy more drones than piloted craft, unless absolutely necessary. Do they become harder to capture next time? Yes. Is the technology they reproduce increasing rapidly or lags for years? I wouldn't say it's an increase in technology. It's more like adjustments slash better understanding of how to operate. It's one reason we fought about 100 years for the first deployment of the construction facility. If we're here for years, we would have seen the majority of all adjustments made. Is your department using AI to learn more about the findings you make around their tech? Not when I was last around, no. Does the factory produce any signature, heat, electromagnetic? How do you track it? Both. We rely mostly on detecting the gravity it produces. It normally doesn't produce heat outright. When it does, we believe it's in the process of construction, since a small heat buildup can be detected when a craft returns or exits. We think this happens when it's being broken back down into parts or assembled. We can only detect these heat signatures when it's near the surface of the ocean, so sometimes a UFO will pop out on us. How do you know about other countries' efforts? We don't obtain the information directly. It's passed along to us. My guess would be the typical way we get to know anything, such as spying or bribery. And why does the USAF not know about the other country's efforts but your department does? My department sits above the USAF for UFO recovery and information in the same way the USAF sits above me on military plans for Ukraine. We were told at the time if we had to give away information, only tell the public what the USAF knows. I'm pretty sure other countries, no departments like mine exist. Alternatively, do they know about US efforts? 
Russia and China, yes. Others, it depends on the level of information. Some governments still don't know aliens even exist or aren't sure. How do we know you aren't some FBI agent or other glowy? There's no way for me to prove that to you. You should always be asking though. All I can say is pay attention to things as time progresses and you'll be able to look back and see I was right. How many craft do we have at the moment? I don't know. I can tell you I've seen about 18 different models pass through for testing and research. Is Lockheed Martin involved in reverse engineering? They are a great company, aren't they? Can you describe some of the other tools found on wrecked craft? We have found things as simple as basic tools akin to tweezers in the lab. One that sticks out to me was an oval shaped silver ball that would change colors based on how close it was to a source of energy. Another would be a sheet of metal that allowed you to view bones by placing it near someone's hands, etc. Can you describe any injuries or deaths that occurred involving alien craft? I've witnessed no deaths or injuries aside from corpses. I've never got to see one we had with an abductee, but they weren't sure at the time if she died on impact. UFO knowledge. It's been a bit of a rough week for me. It's still going to be a rough week for me, so I may not reply as much. Drop your questions and criticisms, and I'll answer them as best as I can. I'll address some other questions I saw elsewhere below. I don't know anything about the Moon Men post. No interest in a trip code. It sounds pretentious. You should be skeptical. Over time, though, I think a lot of people will find themselves coming back to what I said. How do other countries know about the existence of this underwater facility? The same way we do. They've been looking at crash sites as long as we have. I know, last Fred, you said it's an all-hands-on-deck situation if the crafts start messing with our nukes. Correct. Does this happen often? About once every 10 years for the US. We suspect other countries have had similar issues and reactions. What kind of reaction is there when these events occur? A higher up joked months after the last one I saw that the phones ring everywhere but the president's office. In the same instance, I mentioned above they deployed multiple aircraft and a sub with serious intent. The sub didn't arrive in time. Fighters probably never saw the end coming. Is this related to the underwater structure that Gordon Cooper cited and Discovery Channel had to cancel that show for season 3? Nothing in those pictures ring a bell. If you see the construction facility, you'll know. You can't miss it. As for if they were instructed to leave, that could be true. Your answer on tools you found in vehicles makes you seem like you are LARPing. There must have been more advanced and intruding tools than a fucking toothpick. I had to think a bit about this one for multiple reasons, and I think I'll cover the abduction tools in greater detail. There are tools that induce a childlike state or something akin to having a stroke. We covered that. The tools I didn't talk about are the ones that are designed to take objects the size of pills and push them deep into your tissue and stomach. These tools aren't friendly and don't account for extreme pain. There's also another tool that looks like a circular battery you would find in a key fob, designed for keeping your eyes open when deployed. It also stops the eyes from moving almost perfectly. How on earth would it be possible to maintain a secret with such a large amount of people constantly in the know? Not just over years, but literally decades. That's just it. They haven't been able to maintain secrecy. That's a major reason the previous management didn't mind us being so open with each other. If you mean more historically, as in the past 20 years or more, now you know why I find references to MJ-12 funny. Secrecy is all gone, but now it's just about obfuscation and misinformation. What is the extent of contractor or third party involvement in their work? Not as often as you imagine. We use them though. And Anon mentioned Lockheed last Fred. Such a great company, aren't they? Definitely wouldn't be the type to try to leak things to the public. 
are there work contracts that go out for UAP work? You normally have to sign and agree to a contract. What kind of language is put out in the government's acquisition channels to indicate a project is UAP or UAP adjacent? None. They show up and tell you where you'll be and what you'll do. You have to be top tier in your field. You also have to be so clean you've never seen a speeding ticket. Compartmentalization. Most don't know 100% what's permissible to discuss, but they know what slash who 100% isn't. Add on the threat of legal and criminal action and family loved ones, it's quite easy to understand how it happens. Anon nailed it perfectly. This was changing until new management showed up. Any ability to prove it? I'm willing to work with you on ideas. You might like what I have up my sleeve closer to the end. Favorite ice cream? Vanilla. Sprinkles. When Oumuamua was spotted, were there concerns in your circles that it could be related to the construct? A few places panic with every outsiding here and there. We know almost instantly by looking at gravity and speed. Why is there so much alien activity in Mexico? Bermuda Triangle is right next door to Mexico. They also avoid certain parts because they crash there often. The A's are literally hanging out with an Indian tribe in Sonora and taking the people on tours of other planets. Sauce? What do they do with one of these drones once it is finished with its task? They are not exclusively drones. It returns to the construction facility. You said that they only make them right before they use them. Yes, built to spec every time they launch, as far as we can tell. What do they do with them after it's been used? Based on heat signatures, likely smelted back down into parts. Either way, it's probably related to Blue Eisenhower November, whether he knows it or not. Explain, I'm learning as well. Why this image to start your friends? Saw the release on TV and laughed because the USAF is so far in the dark. Is this a project you worked on? Not that specific UFO, probably not. The one in the picture of my post is definitely real. What sort of reporting structure do you slash did you have at your UAP job? I'm hesitant to go over this in detail. I would love to explain though. Are there any guidelines or procedures for releasing info to the public that you're aware of? For me, it was, you know what the USAF knows and nothing else ever. And things like the Space Force are going to be disinformation based. Any idea why new management was so hell bent on changing course? New management coming in, thinking they can make sweeping changes and fix everything, while impressing their leadership, if I had to guess. Should be on tomorrow night, if all goes well. Back again for a bit. Does Karen Seamount in the Atlantic between Bermuda and VA have anything to do with the A's? No idea. It moves constantly and doesn't really leave traces. The ones with or without probes. I figured most people realized the anal probe joke was an obvious cue we haven't seen any females. We did talk in great depth about the reasons why. We think it's mainly a military operation or they just don't have them, hence male only. Could we find evidence that the factory mothership has extracted materials from the ocean floor or the Earth's crust to produce the UAPs? It sends out UFOs to extract quite often, yes. We have yet to really see them mine the ocean floor, since it's harder to know that far down. The last miner we looked at had a huge haul of gold, iron, and silver. No dirt. Where does the most exotic material, Moscovium I assume, come from? Offworld. I don't think Element 115 is that big of a deal off of Earth. The main source of power. We really wanted to see how the construction facility is powered. What is amazing are their alloys. They have alloys that are impossible to reproduce. Correct. Element 115 nuclei lasts for milliseconds before disintegrating under lab conditions. Correct. Still a massive problem. What race of A's we know actually exist? Never had another one mentioned other than the ones I described. If they interfere when there is a nuclear threat, 
why didn't they prevent the World War II nukes? We talked about this a lot, and honestly, we never came to a solid conclusion, other than they may not have realized our capability until we used them. They were interested in test sites, but never actually stopped the ones that we set off. Do they have portable weapons like phasers or ray guns? If so, please describe. They do have weapons. I've never seen or held one though, and suspect the first team always took them away. Looking at the abduction tools and the general capability of the construction facility, I wouldn't want to face off against one. I like how OP asked you for a source on this. Don't confuse interest with the burden of proof, while being totally unwilling to provide their own proof. Sure, let me just walk on through the Golden Gates and get that for you anon. Would you like me to drop off your resume while I'm there? Is this factory craft on duty as a fire watch of sorts? The US believes this is the case. That, or its preparation for something more. Conversely, is their population enough to say that they are a colony coexisting here? It wouldn't surprise me if they had a base off-world, nearby, or even on Earth. We never saw consistent stops that would indicate a base. I also now believe it may not be the only facility with everyone talking about the Arctic. These craft never really went near the Arctic either. What resources are they mining or monitoring slash attracted to? They consistently mine gold. Want to talk about mapping on LIDAR? Interesting you mention LIDAR. I mean tech we don't know how to use slash distribute yet. You should keep watching the development of laser technology. Looking at it from a sieve with a higher understanding, it looks like the do-all tool. Mining quite literally takes the resource out of the rock without leaving much dirt. China still scares us. Are they using resources from Earth to build these ships slash drone? We think the harder to find elements come from off-world, but yes, partially. If so, does that mean that we would have the means to do the same and just don't have the knowledge? Lack of knowledge and a few other elements. The thought was passed around frequently about the level of heat required to ship the alloy. We've wondered if that's another reason it sits in the ocean. What form of language do the aliens use? I mentioned that in a previous thread. I asked for images from another Anon. It looks similar. I want to see more. If you were to classify them on Kardashev scale, what type are they? Not my area of knowledge. Perhaps they want us to know that they exist. I think they don't care that we know. If anything, the threat of them being able to arm our nukes is enough alone. Are they carbon-based lifeforms like us? What are they based on? Not my area again. From what I could see and tell, yes. Do you think there is a chance we are their creation slash experiment? We both look very similar. It wouldn't surprise me, and I'm inclined to think so. What are your theories on the UFO frenzy of February? They downed free crafts, and then nada. We never see that many downed, unless we found a good way to intercept them. Can they manipulate consciousness? Are they related to the mystery of life after death? No idea. I don't know if you've answered this already, but what do they know about the underwater pyramid and complex near Cuba? First, I've heard of it. Did you work for the government before your current UFO job? If so, mind telling us? Yes. And can you tell us what you studied back then? Absolutely not. You can probably guess easily though. And is this construction facility somehow related to the incident that happened back in 2019, west of San Diego? Rumors and questions, because we weren't tracking them at the time. Lurker from K here. Do our conventional weapons have any capability against the UAPs? They look like they would go down to a pistol. In reality though, I'm not sure. What about the lasers that are being tested against UAVs and rockets? Wouldn't surprise me even slightly. They do nearly everything with light and lasers. What are your thoughts on the Baltic Sea anomaly? Crashed UFO or just a weird looking geological thing? Doesn't stand out to me. I also don't know what a few decades under an ocean does to them either. Speaking of which, the main construction facility does not rust or deteriorate from what we can tell. It was even stopping electrical equipment when ships were sailing over. They have this ability. 
Did anything surprising or unexpected ever happen at the crash site? The first Fred has a few instances. The first body I ever saw spooked me. Almost didn't think it was real. Why not tell everyone if there is so much evidence? Because most governments think the local population is stupid. They're not wrong. You're not AF? Air Force? No. Karen Seamount. The construction facility never goes near it. I can say that much. Could a human physically best them? I'm not an expert, but probably. Their size and frame are the one reason they don't make it through crashes often. Why do you think this is? Do they hate glowies as much as we do? Perhaps, but I've never heard of them being outwardly pleasant to anyone. Wouldn't it be easier for them to mine all the gold they need in some asteroid and then bring it to Earth? I haven't really covered much on the resourcing end of operations but we believe they do this for certain elements. Gold doesn't appear to be one of them. Purely efficiency ad engineering driven? I have never seen anything emotionally driven in their craft. If so, maybe they really are a soulless race, drones, genetically degenerate or engineered. That's one theory. The US mostly believes they are just military, as I previously discussed. Do you know the stealth capabilities of the ships? I assume not all have the same characteristics, but there is some baseline. These crafts are so rare we almost never see them crash, because we can't track them. We only recently started finding craft with stealth capabilities. Maybe 1 in 20 has stealth technology. But there is some baseline. Different internals, same stealth tech. Made to spec, like I said. I have to perform two abductions. Make me a craft to fit two prisoners and four crew, and shape it to fit perfectly with all my tools. The truth is here. Hello X, you might remember me from a few weeks ago. I posted a thread also using a screenshot of Mulder. I don't know if anyone else has claimed to be me, but if they have since then, they were lying. The first thread got much more attention than anticipated. So here's a second thread. I wanted to make it earlier, weeks ago, but work got in the way of my free time. However, I have nothing but time this New Year's, and I'm significantly inebriated. Just a recap for those who don't know or don't remember, I'm not a 4chan user. I'm just someone who's involved with the deep dark stuff everyone knows about but pretends doesn't exist. My speciality is as a fixer for an organization that doesn't officially exist with an overlap into the occult. My personal interest is in cryptids, but that's not my job field. I know a lot about a little and a little about a lot. Ask me anything you want, but I can only promise the truth. I'm not here to change minds, so I won't argue with anyone who says otherwise to anything that I have to say. But I'm here to hopefully make things clear to others. Clear as I understand it anyways. But also, I'm drunk right now, so my writing might be a bit off and someone mentioned in the last thread that I should use a name or a trip code. I thought Fox was fitting, given the peripheral association to my actual name and the use of the Mulder picks. Ask away. I only offer the truth. I read about a theory that Thor and Odin originally created humans, and that they're really aliens from outer space. Christ wasn't exactly an alien, but he was a protected person, who everyone loved because of his nature. Loki killed Christ and blamed Thor, so Sin slash Allah and other huge factions buried Thor in the ground, but didn't kill him, but badly injured him, and a war ensued. How true is this? Not true at all. The following isn't something I'll stand by as true, but just something I've extrapolated from what I do know. Christ was a prophet, but he wasn't the physical manifestation of God. What people call God is essentially a force, tied to the basic foundations of the universe. Everyone is connected to this force, but prophets are people who have a stronger and more unique connection than most. Christ was an individual who had one, of course, if nothing the most, strongest connections to this force. Nothing to do with Loki or any Norse bullshit. How fucked are we really? In full seriousness, there's not enough words in the English language I could string together to express the degree to which we are all fucked. Every day is another day I want to splatter my brains across the wall. People have been ranting about the end for 2,000 
years. It was only a matter of time before they were right. Storms on the horizon, and the rain's about to start. I can't say a date, but I'd say the turn of the next century. Imagine a world of permanent darkness, and imagine nobody could lift a finger to stop it. That's cool you've returned. I remember seeing your Fred, but I miss most of it because of work. So forgive me if you've already addressed any of these questions. What are the roots of the organization that you work for, to the best of your knowledge? I mean this historically, but also philosophically. Like, is there a particular historical event that you can pin its origins to, for instance? What is the current or most recent project slash job slash task that you are or were involved in with this organization? Again, can you point to any event specifically or even hint at it? The roots have to do with the founder. He was a guy who knew that there were two jobs that had the ultimate job security, sucking dick and killing people. Because someone always wants their dick sucked and someone always wants someone else dead. So he worked and built the connections for an organization oriented towards the latter. It's evolved to being something that doesn't even have a digital fingerprint. All personnel records are physical, and each personnel has an alias assigned, though I imagine there's other organizations with a similar structure. As for recent jobs, that's something too specific to say. Someone's always watching and all that BS. When does it come back? Or why aren't the ones with power doing anything about this shit? It being what exactly? Sorry if I don't understand, but like I said, I'm fairly drunk. I've been working at a bottle of Jack for the past five hours. God. Yeah, I honestly don't think it does. I've got a theory that the book of Revelations is fairly irrelevant to the future. I think it used real details to create a narrative that gave the world false hope, that made people think no matter how bad things got, they didn't have to do anything, because in the end, it would all be alright. That despite their laziness, God would swoop in at the last second and save them all. But he won't. Nobody will, because that's the point. Christ didn't die to save the world. He died so that everyone in it would have a chance to save themselves. Same thing applies here. Only the people can save themselves from the hell that's on the horizon. But nobody lifts a finger. Because the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was making the world think he didn't exist. It was making the world think that in the end, somebody else would save them. But nobody is coming. Not that I can tell, anyways. He was American, yeah, it's an American-located organization. There might be parallel ones in other continents, but I know that if we have a job in another continent, we always have a contact to supply hardware. He used familial ties to get it started. He was well-connected in the old boy network, so getting things started didn't take much. As for my guns, I keep a HK USP 45 on my nightstand and at my side always, plus a Colt manufactured M4 at the ready on a weapons rack in my bedroom. I remember you bro, I'm glad you're back. I asked about the crawlers and where they reside in Europe. I would like some more info. You said they hunt humans, so they eat us like a zombie would? Or do they kill a human and then devour him slash her? Do they rape as well or just eat human flesh? How do they reproduce, and where do they come from? Also, you said an AK was better than a Mossberg against one. Why? My Mossberg semi-automatic has a 10 shell clip that I can put any type of slug or shell into. Dragon's breath, exploding shells, whatever. Can a crawler withstand a headshot close range from a shotgun? And if so, what the fuck are those things? Have you even seen one eat a human? Please elaborate if you can. No, they're flesh and blood. A slug to the head will kill them like anything, but I'd personally rather have an AK just because of the higher magazine capacity. They kill humans because they're pure evil. I don't know the real origin. Maybe natural evolution. Maybe they come from one of the other dimensions. I genuinely don't know. I just know that they've been here for a long time and we know it in our DNA to be afraid of them. Let's just pretend that humanity was capable. What would they have to do? They'd have to make a hero play. You'd have to kill people, straight up. Men, women, children. You'd have to go full fascist because you can't afford to let anything slip through the cracks. So you'd need to make sure anything that might pose a threat was ashes. Of course, it's all just a temporary fix. The threats against humanity don't come from the physical world. 
You can kill the servants of Moloch all you like, but there will always be Moloch, and he will always find new servants. Do crawlers have a specific environment that they like? Do they leave signs of their existence around, tracks, sounds, things to identify that they live there? Are there any legitimate videos out on the net of them that the US military hasn't made disappear? A lot of videos show things like what you describe, but it's hard to tell them real from fake. So have you seen any real videos floating around where someone caught a crawler on cam or audio? They like the dark, caves and mines. It's my understanding that they usually live in them. So any signs of their presence on the surface is nil. As for videos, I don't have any links, but I've had a few come to my attention in the past that I definitely call legitimate. What happens when you die? Do we reincarnate? Is Earth a reincarnation soul prison? Additionally, when is the coming polar magnetic shift? It's not a reincarnation prison. Reincarnation is so rare that you don't have to worry about it. It would be like being struck by lightning while you bought a winning lottery ticket. What happens when you die is that your soul no longer has a body to tie it to this world, and it moves to the next. The next world being decided by the vibrational frequency range of your soul. Positive frequency, a positive dimension. Negative, a negative one. I know nothing about polar shifts. I think that's just some BS people say to keep people that are conspiracy minded in a state of fear. Thanks man. Are there any other cryptos to be aware of? Creatures that live underwater or things that live in the forest? Giant spiders? Werewolves? Wendigos? Vampires? Things like that. Vampires, maybe, but not like in the movies. There's vampiric blood drinking creatures like the chupacabra, but nobody wearing a cape and living in a castle. Werewolves are real, but not that Hollywood shit. They're a subset of astral projection, a projection of the soul that exists in the physical plane. That projection taking the face of a wolf. Wendigo is just a crawler. Mythological BS from ignorant natives applied to a flesh and blood creature. Like how the natives in Africa said that we now know that the gorilla was a magical being that could shapeshift. You mentioned to the other Anon that maybe crawlers come from another dimension. Are there any other things that have entered our world from another dimension? And all those people who have gone missing in national parks. What happened to them? Did they step into portals? Or were they eaten by crawlers? Please tell us about the national parks, and what is really there if you can. As I said in the last thread, cryptids are a personal interest of mine, not something my job specifically entails. But the national parks do have a degree of cryptid activities. Some are from crawlers, assuredly. Some from other things, no doubt. But I've heard some stories. Stories about portals into another world. A more sinister world. And honestly, I believe them and may God help any man who unknowingly wanders through one. How does your job overlap into the occult? And what occult? Magic? Demons? Chaos mages? What magic is real? Is Moloch a demon or alien from another dimension? Can we kill him? Moloch is what we call a demon, not in the fallen angel sense, but in a sense that it's a word applied to any negative entity. Can we kill him? I don't know. I honestly don't. I don't know that we can kill any being that's of the spirit, but I hope and would crawl through a thousand miles of broken glass for even a 1% chance. I just don't get it. Why do these people love it and think it's all cool and want to be edgy when it will eat them alive in the end? When do we get a more balanced world and why do we live in a world where we get terrorized 24-7? The people running the world don't care about the next life. They're hedonistic and only care about this one. That's why they'll sell their soul for riches and fortune. But on some level, they're still afraid. It's why once they make the deal with a devil, they focus on trying to find ways to get an extra year or month or week. Because they know once their hearts stop beating, their soul isn't theirs anymore. So basically similar to the movie John Wick, you said it's very rare to reincarnate, but in the next post, you say that you're certain you will reincarnate. How does this make sense? One thing that forever struck the modern generations is porn. I want to know why it's supplied in a mass. Is it to weaken you? What's your take on fapping and sex? Who is behind all this? 
Hope you'll answer. Uh, maybe? I don't really like those movies, so I don't quite know the specifics of how their world works. I guess it's not particularly that I'm certain that my soul will reincarnate, but specifically that I'm sure that my soul will stay in this world, or return to it at least. I'll find out which route it'll be when I get to that bridge. Not exactly my field, so I can't give a rock-solid answer that I'll stand behind, but I'll spitball based on what I do know. I don't think it's any one answer, I think it's a multi-faceted problem. Primarily, it generates a lot of money, and it encourages a spiritual decay within human society, the latter being a necessary piece to what the enemy wants, demoralization, and for humans to prioritize hedonism. Where do the threats from humanity come from then? Be specific. And what are the threats that come from here? Again, please be as specific as possible. Fighting in the physical sounds useless then. From the next world and from the last. The most grave threats against humanity are spiritual entities that come from other worlds. They interact with ours via the non-physical planes. It's my understanding that the big head honchos humanity has to fear are Lucifer and Moloch, though they have a dozen different names and forms throughout various cultures. You fight in the physical the same way these entities wage war in the physical. You fight the agents of their will. I typically don't reply, but you've intrigued me. What can you tell me about familial deities? Who are those with amber slash yellow eyes? Why are bloodlines so important? Thank you. The thing with bloodlines has to do with blood itself. Your blood is unique, as much as your body is unique to you. It's a signature, in a way in that only your blood can be yours. Hence why it has a place amongst occult ritual. It serves to tie the ritual to the person conducting it. Blood also is tied to life. This is another element to why blood is spilt as a sacrifice to entities. Blood is holy. It's why I've always refused to donate blood. Bloodlines matter to the elite for these reasons. They need their blood to continue on the earth, because in a manner of speaking, it lets them continue on the earth as well. It's why there's lots of interbreeding between the elite families. It keeps the blood in the family, so to speak. I also have a theory about how it relates to psychopathy amongst them, given that's a genetically inherited type of ASPD, but that's a separate topic. Few hours without a reply. Probably that you're gone now, but if not, is there something that makes you think such a future is entirely unavoidable? Without being able to explain the situation, it's going to be hard to really nail down why. Besides, people don't want to help themselves. And I understand that, but there must be some type of analogy you could offer otherwise. Something as simple as, it's self-inflicted, an outside force pushing towards an end, or another thing entirely. If it's shoe on head, then I can see your main issue. But if we are to fail to an outside force, simply because of that, I'd like to argue then that things aren't as dire as you'd want to believe. It's an outside force using human actors. It's evil. There's this common idea that the force called God is the most high, but it's sort of a yin slash yang situation. God, the light, has an antithesis, the darkness, evil. They're both fundamental forces of the universe, more like gravity than a human being though they both have will and intent. This will is carried out via human actors. You see, the quote often attributed to Tolkien about how evil can only corrupt that which good has made is more true than most know. Evil does not create, God does. What evil does is twist those creations into a corrupted, fun house mirror version. Evil must grow. It wants everything. From where I sit, slowly but surely, it's well on the road to getting what it wants. Know anything about traveling to other universes? Like if I had a specific one in mind and wanted to take someone with me? Nothing concrete that doesn't involve dying. I've only heard rumors and speculation, though it's not enough to rule it out. I will say that it's not that bullshit that you read online where you meditate and suddenly you're in a universe where our world is sunshine and roses. There are other universes, other worlds, but there's only one like ours. So you're basically a hitman, 
A killer slash assassin hired for getting rid of unwanted? Why, and why do you think posters here won't? You seem pretty demoralized yourself. Something like that. There's problems. Word from on high gets passed down to my cell or someone else's. Then we use the resources and assets at our disposal to get the job done. It's organized in a manner to give complete deniability to any other agents as well as to whomever needed their problem solved. Demoralized, but only to the point where I get the big picture. I think I'll stay in this world because my work won't be finished. I know it sounds exceedingly arrogant to say, but I am different from most. I've mentioned that there's a connection to God, to the light, that people have sometimes. Those people have been called holy men throughout history. Jesus being the man I theorize having had the most direct and strongest connection. I've got it too. Not enough that I'm running around doing Jedi shit, but enough that I have visions. Sometimes seeing things before they happen, and it always happens. I have an intuition for things that's always bordered on the spooky. When I was in the Marines, my buddies used to say I had a direct pipeline to God. In the field, they'd ask me to ask God for the weather, and we'd always get the weather I asked for. It is arrogance though, since you're simply implying that you're better than others. Everyone is created in the image of God, not just you. I think you're also demoralized because you're a killer. You can't do this job and expect to be good. You're sort of a neutral, I guess. I'm surprised someone like you would out themselves on 4chan. So you don't have a wife with this job, right? Do you have sex at all? Do you fuck prostitutes? Do you jack off all the time or live the life of a monk? Are there things you're allowed to do or not allowed to do? Or things that you're told explicitly to do? I'm not better than others. Maybe when it comes to my capabilities or my intelligence contrast to the average person, but I don't think I'm better than anyone when it comes to my value as a human life. I'm saying I'm different, not that I'm better. And yes, everyone is created in the image of God, but what that refers to is that human beings have a soul, the us that's comprised of a divine spark. It's what makes men different from all the other entities. They don't have that spark. I wouldn't consider myself good, but maybe most would at first glance. I'm very charming. I don't consider this outing myself though. Just sort of putting what I know out there and leaving it for the masses. Maybe people take note. Maybe they don't. But I put it out there where people would see it. After that, it's out of my hands. I don't have a wife, no. There was one girl though. Someone I love and know loves me back. But I pushed her away a long time ago, and have kept her at arm's length since. In my line of work, anyone you love will only get hurt, and I refuse to let anyone hurt her. As for sex, I don't do prostitutes. I have a couple times in the past, but I was bored. I'm tall, broad-shouldered, and know how to dress well. I get with women periodically, but never any real relationship. Honestly, it's hard for me even to begin. There is a one who's in charge above all, the evil I mentioned in a previous reply. But that's a metaphysical force of the universe, and not a person like I'm sure you mean. There's dozens of organizations and groups, the Moloch worshippers, Catholic Church, Masons, etc. These groups can sometimes butt heads, but they're all each their own thread in a winding web of darkness, all interconnected on some levels. At the end of the day, they all take their orders from this agent of darkness, of this evil. My catch-all name for them has always been the Syndicate. I can't speak for your own experiences, but it's my understanding that entities witnessed while on hallucinogenics are beings within our world, just residing in the non-physical planes, places that we can't perceive on the physical plane. There's all kinds of entities that come and go on the non-physical planes, some may be good, some may be evil. They all have their own individuality, much as we do. Some serve the light, some serve the dark. But no matter what you see, always be wary of them. The entities on other planes can fuck your life up. A way to fight back against spiritual entities? Sure. To combat them on our plane of existence? I don't know if it can be done. They aren't entities tied to this world and this plane like we are. 
They can move between planes and only appear in the physical plane when the right circumstances are present. But even doing that takes a lot of energy. They can't stay in the physical. In terms of killing one, you're thinking in far too human of terms. They don't have a body. How can you make them bleed? And if it can't bleed, how can you hope to kill it? Maybe there's some means with which they can be killed. I don't know. I know they can be hurt, but to what capacity? I can't say. I've heard enough rumor and hearsay about entities being held back by the threat of harm by physical items to think that to be the case. But would plunging an enchanted dagger into the center of an entity on the physical plane cause it to cease to exist? I don't know. You're thinking too much inside the box in regards of this topic. Really, almost no one can touch these things because you can't see them. Only ones who can see them, or have the ability to see them, can talk to them. To gain the ability is the question though. Close, but no cigar. You can't see them because they exist on other planes, the negative and positive ones. Whereas we exist on the physical slash neutral plane. The negatives and positives overlap with ours, though we can't sense them. Generally, anyways. Some people with a greater connection to God have the gift of being able to communicate with the entities without the use of ritual. These entities can take a physical shape, but the frequency of our plane doesn't rhyme with theirs, so they struggle with it. Like trying to swim up a river. A physical manifestation eats up a lot of energy and they can't maintain it forever. This is why demonic hauntings always start small before they escalate. The entity doing the haunting will do small things to build a fear in the people at the residence. It feeds off that negative fear energy to give it the strength it needs for physical interaction and then manifestation. It's also why being steadfast and not having fear is the easiest way to get them to fuck off. Fox, what is the best way to purify the soul? I want to be a better person and closer to God. Be a good person, unironically. Don't lie, don't steal, don't hate or be evil. Try your hardest to be good. It's funny, because as much as I dislike the church, they sorta of got it down right on what it takes, even if they don't understand why or how. Be a person of positivity and kindness, and that's your best bet to move on to a positive dimension. Your soul exists now on the physical plane, tied to your body. Once you die, it'll move on to whatever dimension it best resonates with either someplace positive or negative, which is where the ideas of heaven and hell come from in religion. For it to resonate positive, you have to have tried as best as you can to be the best that you can. Don't be a piece of shit. It's like karma. Everything good and everything bad you do, and have done, will come to affect the frequency of your soul, and that will decide where it moves when the time comes. Be good. Love your fellow man. Hold the door for an old lady. Help your brother when he's fallen down. But know this, to be good is not to be passive. Sometimes the good choice is to take action, to fight. For as much as Christ preached forgiveness, he still knew to toss tables and throw hands when people had filled the temple with their greed. This is very close to a personal theory of mine. You see, the soul has that aforementioned divine spark, and through that, Humans can do incredible things through meditation and the focusing of their energy. This is where prayer gets its power. Not asking God, but using and focusing the energy that is God given. If the people believed enough, then it can produce results. I think, if face to face with a demon, and you truly believe the bullets in your weapon will do damage, then damage can be done. Because through that divine spark, you willed it to be so. What do you know about the underground cave systems? That they exist. I don't know if it's some big expansive network that's all connected like some mega anthill, but there are caves and they can be dangerous. There are very old and very wicked things that live in them, the previously mentioned crawlers being one of them. Killed more than I can remember. All records of anyone killed are physical and incinerated as soon as it's done means nobody can hack anything and nothing can get missed. I show mercy by not prolonging suffering, but sometimes people will get in the way or try and crush you, and you make them watch as you put their family into 55 gallon drums of lie. 
but that's only for people who should have known better, who should have known not to try and get in the way of the machine. I don't particularly feel about it any which way. I have something of a deterministic philosophy of life. Anyone who's in my sights did something to put them there and to get into my sights is to be fired upon. Who am I to deny them their fate? They put themselves on that road. I'm simply the destination. I'm not quite sure you're getting it, but I think I've said as much on the topic as is worth saying. Never heard of that guy, but sounds like BS. MK Ultra and mind control style assets don't change and they'd never go public. Those are a whole different bag of worms, way worse than me. As for me, the bad guys pay my bills, yes. I kill the good and the bad alike. All depends on the orders that come down from above. Do they deserve it? I don't know. It's not for me to decide. They decided it. It's a big egotistical, but I like to consider myself an agent of death. The people I've killed made their own choices and those led to me, to their death. Sort of like that guy from that movie, No Country for Old Men. I don't personally consider anyone to be good. Not really. I'd consider them to be passive. Everyone knows the evil that exists, but yet it prevails. Is this because good men do nothing? I would argue that a good man does not do nothing. A good man is a man of action. The people do nothing and so evil prevails. If they let evil do so, then how can they be good? I have more respect for the wicked. At least they take action. They are not passive. People do stumble across crawlers every now and then. But of course, any video or photographic evidence will be dismissed. Any undeniable physical evidence you'd need to go through certain channels to get it verified as real and get word out into the world. There's always somebody watching. And when need be, they'll contact me or someone like me to handle it. It's where the stories about men in black suits with strange faces and black sunglasses come from. We wear hyper-realistic masks when conducting such business. But it's not perfect like in those Tom Cruise movies. At a close range, you can tell it's a mask because of the eye holes, hence the sunglasses. With that, all someone might think is there's something off, but not anything worth voicing concern. Fox, my line of questioning will continue. Glad to see you are still here. Morlock and I have been bound for a sacrificial ritual. Most families have a familial deity associated with them. A common one people have heard of is the Astor family and Ashtoreth. These are, as you know, considered to be branch families. I have been subjected to certain programming as is common in these types of families, and I am hoping you are aware of which family line I descend from by giving you the familial deity. Now the line of questioning is as follows. What is the counter-organization to what you call the Syndicate? Why do you assume Moloch is evil? It may seem like a simple question, but we are dealing with entities that are directly influenced by the wielders they are attuned with. I asked you about who those were with yellow eyes. This is not meant to be a troll question, but it follows a common theme played out in movies, games, depictions of those who are more in line with left hand path practices. What is the purpose of pineal gland extraction done by the syndicate? From personal knowledge, this is done when the subject is experiencing extreme fear. The exact procedure is done with a needle inserted through the eye. A very fine precise needle in which the subject feels no pain or sensation. Targeted individuals. Can you classify or make a distinction for me about the categories they fall under? Thank you, Fox. A counter-organization. In the same capacity and strength as the syndicate? I don't believe there is one. But I have heard whispers about a small group led by whom I've been heard called a prophet. Don't know much about them, but there is still some that fight for the light. It's the nature of the beast. Moloch is arguably the prime entity worshipped by the syndicate. It's the most worrisome agent of the darkness, if you ask me. I'd call him much worse than the Lucifer entity. I don't know, but I can spitball about why it's commonly used in media. It's been said that the eyes are the window to the soul, and yellow is often viewed as a negative color subconsciously associated with corruption. Perhaps its use is to reflect the corrupted state of the soul. I assume this question is about adrenochrome. It's a drug used for ritual and leisure purposes, but it originates from the idea that it'll help keep you younger. Those in power 
want to eke out as many extra years as they can on this earth. As in, gang stalking? I've read a bit about that. It's a lot of bullshit mostly. Some people are targeted, but it's explicitly because they hold a threat. Flak heaviest above target type stuff. If the mission isn't to kill them, they'll be gang stalked and exposed to V2K, which will slowly test their sanity until anything they say is instantly discredited. A question as old as time, how does one fight monsters without becoming one? I think the context makes all the difference on whether the killing will damn you. It's not thou shalt not kill, it's thou shalt not murder. There's a difference between the two. Murder is unjustified. To kill the wolves that prey on the sheep, maybe there's no more justified killing. Maybe that context for one's actions is enough to give them heaven. Or maybe it's not. Maybe becoming a monster and damning yourself to hell is the only way to stand against them. But maybe that's the point. Maybe the most heroic thing one can do is to damn their own soul so that others might be saved from the jaws of the monsters. I don't believe there is a point. That there is a day and time when the storm will arrive and the streets will flood. It'll be like boiling a frog. It won't be all at once. It'll be gradual. First the storm clouds will gather. Then it will be a few drops. Eventually, the storm will be a downpour, and the streets will flood. The people on the streets will drown, and as they are, they'll look to the men in their high towers, the men to whom they gave the reins of fate, the men they trusted to keep them safe. They'll cry out for those men to help them, and the men will laugh. Then they'll turn their eyes to the gods they've forsaken and cursed, and they'll beg for salvation. But they will get no answer in return, because even if they didn't realize it, they all knew the storm was coming. They just did not listen. Like the rest of humanity when Noah built the ark. But there is no ark. Humanity has to save themselves, or be forever cast into a world of permanent darkness. People joke about 1984, but 1984 will be a joke compared to the future that's coming down the line. The dark clouds are already here. Do you feel the raindrops yet? I don't know if they are distinct, but there is a relation obviously. It's hard to tell a lot of times. Entities' names have changed across cultures, and are often given pseudonyms by practitioners, so as to not inadvertently draw the attention of such entities by speaking their real name. I've never looked too well into Zoroastrianism, if I'm being honest, but taking a cursory glance at Araman, I suspect it's not necessarily an actual entity, but a personification given to the force I've described as evil. The antithesis to the force, Christianity as anthropomorphized as God, to though I refer to it as God simply because it's more easily digestible term. Lucifer and Moloch are distinct entities. I've never met him, but I've always suspected that Lucifer may reside at the highest echelons of the syndicate. Given he is an entity that walks this earth, what form he may be I do not know. I'm familiar with Event Horizon, and vaguely familiar with what you're talking about in 40k. I don't know if it's exactly as depicted in that media, but I suspect its real world counterpart would be one of the dimensions the soul can move to after death. The truth is here. I'm here because I have things I want to get off my chest. You know how secrets are something we always want to tell someone? Well, I'm here to tell things X, and this seems like the best spot. Or maybe B, but Given the paranormal nature, I feel here it works better. So what do the Xers want to know? I can't say who I am, but I can answer questions about me in vague. I know a lot about a little, and a little about a lot. I promise this isn't a LARP. Any questions about skinwalkers, Bigfoot, mind control, angels, aliens, the soul, God, anything you want to know about, I probably know something about it. To a degree that will satisfy. I'll be giving the truth all night long. Maybe even into tomorrow. The nature of space isn't something I can honestly divulge. My knowledge of that is next to none. So I have no reason to believe what's in the sky above us is of any importance. As for the multiverse, I can't say that it exists like it does in the comics. Where for every time you took a left, there's a world where you took a right. Like with space, I have seen nothing or been told nothing, so I don't consider it a probable reality. 
What I do know is that the core of the universe is an eternal struggle between light and dark, good and evil, positive and negative. I don't know much about the other universes. I have spent my entire life in this one, and only ever met things from others. But I can say that what makes our dimension special is the existence of multiple, overlapping dimensional planes. Some are positive planes and some are negative. It's these planes that most interdimensional entities reside when in our world, whichever plane best aligns with their vibrational frequency. We humans live on a neutral plane, the physical one. It's my understanding that this organizational structure of our world is unique amongst the universe. You aren't your body, you are your soul. Think of your body as like the hardware and your soul as like the data. Your soul is tied directly to your body. The reason for this is because your soul has a unique vibrational frequency and it ties directly to your body. Sort of like a radio picking up a signal. This is why when you astral project, when your soul leaves the body, you can always find your way back. What you do in your life here impacts the vibrational frequency of your soul. When you die, the soul is no longer tied to the body, but it has to go somewhere. So it does. The soul moves to whatever dimension has a frequency range compatible with the frequency of your soul. If positive, it moves to a positive dimension. If negative, to a negative one. This is where the concept of being good or being bad, meaning you'll go to heaven or hell, comes from. What religion is right? Neither. All religions have aspects that are right, but they usually take those and run with them until they become wrong. If you're asking me which religion you should partake in, I'd encourage Christianity, but real Christianity, aka read the Gospels and follow Christ's examples, not all that bullshit the various denominations spout. I wouldn't even encourage going to church. The reason for following Christ's example is because it's the best one for living that will help your soul to attain a positive frequency, thus allowing you to move to a positive dimension when you die. There's a lot I could say about Christianity as a whole. I'm not fond of it, and about 95% of its followers are going to be real surprised where they end up when they die. Is the universe really as horrible and bad as we see it, or is this just our shit human brains? Yes and no. There is goodness and beauty in this world, and it's something truly special and worth protecting. But there is also bad. And that bad? It's worse and more horrifying than anything you've heard or seen on TV. I think if most average people knew, and I mean really knew, even a tenth of what I know, they'd put a bullet in the brains of everyone they love and then themselves because it would be a mercy compared to what's out there. The bad in real life is the mist. Are the people who rule us evil, or are they just grossly incompetent? Evil, sometimes incompetence. Evil needs permission, like the old stories about how vampires can't come into your home unless you invite them in. Evil needs permission, because then the acts committed by its servants won't impact as negatively on their soul. This permission is given for the apparent incompetence, things we know about yet seemingly do nothing. Our passivity works as indirect permission. It's why movies will contain subliminal and metaphorical messages. It's why The Matrix was a smash hit back in the day. It was evil, letting the world know exactly what's going on, even if people don't know that's what was happening. But because no one lifted a finger afterwards, permission was given. Don't have family or loved ones, just a loved one, singular but I've kept her at a distance to keep her safe. I'd do anything to keep her safe. I have done everything. I could never bring myself to harm a hair on her head, and I'd crawl through a thousand miles of broken glass to wrap my hands around the throat of anyone who would. As for myself, I might someday. I was at one point. There was a period where I spent every day I could getting drunk. I was going to do it. It was something a friend said to me that held me back. Funny that I don't remember what it was anymore, but I took the bullet that was in the chamber of my Glock and put it in a small sealed baggie. 
it still sits in my dresser. Because if I ever do, it'll be that bullet I chamber again. How hard or easy is it to manifest the reality that you want for yourself? Hard. The ability to subtly alter aspects of reality through thought can be easier or more difficult depending on the person in question. It's easier if it's a collective doing it. This is why group prayers are done. Initially anyways. Doubt most people know that's the purpose it serves slash served now. Mind over matter type stuff. I'm presuming that you didn't mean that reality shifting bullshit that's all over TikTok. Correct. The matrix construct represents systems of control. Ones that exist not to help humans, but to use humans to further its own existence. Systems of control that people will fight and do to protect, because they don't know better, and most will never be ready to. There's too much to say honestly. I wouldn't know where to begin, and if I were to just start talking, I'd assuredly forget things in the moment. This is why I'm letting you ask the questions. Letting people pick where I start and what topics I talk about. Hellish in the sense that there's fire and the devil poking you with a pitchfork? No. That's a simplistic analogy provided because it gets the point across. Dying and going to a bad place is bad. I genuinely don't know what awaits us after death. Not specifically. My knowledge extends to this world, and anything beyond that is mostly extrapolation from what I do know. I only know that there is a next world, that some are good, some are bad, and some I have no idea. I honestly don't feel well equipped to answer this question. I'll say no. That Christian mysticism and Gnosticism are two different things, but any further in-depth discussion on the two of them is a bit out of my ballpark. I'm familiar enough with Gnosticism, but not so much Christian mysticism, mostly because I intake whatever information I can regarding the occult, and none of it is divided into religions for me, but for simply what's true and what isn't. Alright, I'll bite, because I was about to hit the bed and now I'm squinting and typing this shit. First, how did you even enter this field of work? It can't be that every Fed or free letter agent knows this information. What are the general pathways into this field of knowledge at the federal agencies? Is it engineering background or science or what? None of the above? Second, what is something that the average person does not know exists, but does? And if possible, could you give me an example of something I could test for myself, so that I could see it for myself? Third, is Tom DeLong and his company for real or is it bullshit? Is it half and half? Honestly, a bit of luck in the circumstances of your life and a willingness to go down the rabbit hole. I come from a military family. Uncle was forced recon, then went on to do contracting work, and dad worked in nuclear for the Navy. And now it is one of about half a dozen people that can do his current job kind of military family. So having a military family aimed my life in the right direction, but it honestly wasn't until my own personal encounters with an entity when I was young that set me down the path. I spent so long pouring over everything I could because I wanted to know what or who that being was. That helped me be the kind of person who wanted to know, who would listen to what anyone had to say and would seek it out. Maybe an engineering background might help, but for me it was family. Personal connections I accumulated myself over the years, being ready and willing, and a bit of what boils down to divine intervention. I know a lot of things man isn't meant to know, and I've seen my fair share of things people wouldn't believe even if I took a picture. I know a guy for everything, and if I don't know a guy for something, then I know a guy who knows a guy. You want any kind of drugs? I know a guy. You want a fire team dispatched anywhere in America? Give me a phone call in 24 hours. I would love to know the origins of dogmen. Are they naturally evolved, genetically engineered, or both? If so, how and why? I've heard that they act like the police of the forests and wild places, hunting and killing anything unnatural like rigs and stuff. Is that true? Are they transdimensional, like I've heard Sasquatch are? What does the US government know about them? And how are they handling interactions and relations with them? Dogmen. I wish you'd have asked me about Bigfoot or Pale Crawlers, lol. Dogmen are the one thing I don't have a definitive answer for. 
I have a few personal theories gathered from various testimony and myths, but it's actually a subject I've been meaning to tackle in person soon. So I'll tell you what I know based on my personal report that I've assembled prior to my future ventures with them. They are flesh and blood, just like Bigfoot. And like Bigfoot, people attribute various supernatural aspects to them, but that's just tall tales. It's worth noting that the natives in Africa used to tell the white people that gorillas could shapeshift. Same principle here, they're flesh and blood, just like us with bullshit lore added from people who don't know better. They aren't werewolves, they're two distinct things. Werewolves are supernatural, dogmen aren't. They may be Bigfoot, it's possible they're a different breed or maybe even people reporting a Sasquatch with some features that they mistook in the moment. The policy with them is the same as any cryptid, cover it up and deny. Even though they are flesh and blood creatures, too much supernatural gobbledygook has been attributed to them. If the existence of any cryptid was confirmed to the masses, they would panic. Because if Bigfoot or the Dogmen are real, then what about the monster under the bed? Is he real too? There'd be mass hysteria and Mossberg stock prices would skyrocket. So they are covered up and dismissed. And any evidence that is allowed or manages to slip through the cracks is discredited. DeLong and his company isn't my area, I'm sorry to say. My area of expertise is the occult with a personal interest in cryptids. As for seeing anything, summoning can be difficult. An important aspect is that you actually believe. Your soul has power, and any attempt to summon something when you are in doubt will actually work against you. The easiest way is taking hallucinogenics, DMT, ayahuasca, the usual suspects. It's my understanding that those allow you to perceive the other planes that cohabit our dimension. If you want to see a cryptid, You'd need to go hunting though, but that has many dangers and is not something I can encourage anyone to do alone. You'd never see me out in the field looking for something that goes bump in the night without at least two additional gunmen to watch my back and a medic. Two questions, one simple, one complex. One, are there any cryptids in the vast forests of Western Canada? Two, what do you think is the most horrific thing in store for humanity in the near to distant future. Nahani Valley, there's some creatures there from what I've heard. Like I said elsewhere, the cryptids are a big personal interest of mine. I love to investigate them, but getting adequate firearms for private ventures in Canada is difficult. 2. The end game. It's coming a lot faster than you'd think. For 2,000 years, people have been crying that the end was nigh. It was only a matter of time that they'd be right. Not the end is in a giant meteor hitting the earth, but the end of the world as you know it. Life will go on, but it will not be lives worth living. Everything you love, everything you take for granted, it's all going away. Imagine a world of permanent darkness, and imagine nobody knew the world could be better. Skinwalkers, Wendigo, the Rake, it's all the same thing, and yes, I'm aware the Rake is a fictional creature. But the basis is a real thing. Pale crawlers or simple crawlers is the preferred term. Doesn't have the same pre-established connotations that the other names do. Where they come from? I don't know. They're natural though. Flesh and blood. They're an old enemy of humanity. I know that much. It's why any time you see a depiction of a thin pale humanoid, you get an uneasy feeling. It's in our DNA to fear them. They live in North America and Russia primarily. They're tall, but usually crouched, so they appear about the size of an adult human. They're fast, they're strong, and they're just about the only creature on this planet I consider truly evil. They are nothing short of pure insidiousness. They love humans, they hunt them. They're basically our natural predator, but we've been fortunate enough to outnumber them. They have black eyes with shark's teeth, spindly fingers that end with claws. You don't want to look them in the eyes though. In most humans, eye contact with these creatures produces one of two fear responses. The first and most common response is to freeze up. Your brain will scream to run, but your feet aren't listening. The second is that you'll just break down sobbing. Neither is optimal for survival. 
They are like hunters, though I have heard the occasional report of two or more crawlers working together. So, maybe they're learning. What is the best way to prepare against this endgame? We talk in nuclear war or slow drawn out slavery. If you had a nephew that you wanted to warn about this, what would you tell him to do to prepare? Slow drawn out slavery. What I'd tell anyone is to learn. Learn anything you can. Join the military. Not out of patriotism, but so you can find like-minded people and learn some skills. Get guns. Get connections. If you don't know someone with a farm or a compound, then get on it. People tell you to buy gold. I'm telling you to buy bullets. Buy guns. Power is a finite resource in this universe. A gun is power. As long as you have them, you have power. And the more power you have, the less they have over you. That's why they don't want you to have them. The biggest problem is that we're not looking at something fast. It'll be slow. At the earliest, the youngest users on the site will probably be in a nursing home by the time it's all the way there. Nukes don't make me laugh. It's everything you see around you. It's life the way it is. Society. The prison that mankind has been convinced to build for themselves. And once it's done, they will be proud of themselves. For even though they now live in a prison, it's one they made themselves. I've always been a fan of System of a Down's prison song. God. That's a big one. It's not a man with a beard and a white robe up in the clouds. That's just a simplistic view for kids to understand. Part of what I call Sunday School Christianity. God, less a person, and more like a fundamental force of the universe. It's a force that is around and connects all things. We are all connected to it, some more than others. That's why some people are gifted in supernatural ways. Thank you for answering so many questions. What is the US government, or any world government, doing about these crawlers? Is there some kind of covert operation in place or being proposed to systematically eradicate them without public knowledge? I just want to know that we're fighting back, or if we're able to at all. Eradicate? No. The procedure for them is like all cryptids. Cover it up. There is no fight back, because it's not a concern of those running the world. It's a free time thing for me, but that's just me. Me and some of my best men in the woods with high-powered rifles. What else could you ask for on a weekend off? What's the absolute scariest fucking thing you've ever come across? Cryptid or supernatural wise? Honestly, it was something I mentioned previously. An encounter when I was younger with an entity. I was an atheist back then and it started small, like in the movies. My dog acting scared from something that wasn't there. Strange smells, etc. It escalated and culminated into a physical apparition. It was black pure black, as if absorbing any light. It was thin, tall, long fingers like spider legs. Its face was nothing but blackness. After that, I was no longer an atheist. Scariest thing I ever saw, simply because I wasn't mentally prepared to encounter anything supernatural. What was GATE? What will be profitable in 2023 so that I can secure said farm? How do I learn supernatural powers? Is there a good faction of humanity? Thanks, Agent Mulder. GATE, as talked about commonly, was a lot of LARP, but there is some truth to it. The powers that be did have an interest in finding those with a greater connection to what I described before as God. The stock market for the coming year is a question for smarter people than me, I'm afraid. I lost $80,000 this year for shits and giggles. You don't want my advice there a lot. Meditate. Learning any sort of supernatural abilities is a hard one. It's easier for some, harder for others. Some just have it from the moment they were born. Learn the occult is the most simple answer to it. As for a good faction, they're out there. I wish I could tell you they're winning, that they outnumber the darkness. But the truth is, there's only so few people willing to stand up and make the sacrifice necessary to fight back. How would you define evil? What types of actions are considered evil? Is it obvious shit like murdering and torturing? Or is it things that only religions advocate against, like masturbation, eating certain foods, etc.? Evil. It's multifaceted. Evil itself is a natural force in the world. At least, I call it evil. 
in that it's an antithesis to the force I mentioned previously, that's commonly called God. It's not things like masturbation or snorting coke, though obviously if all you do is spank the monkey and ski the Alps, then you've clearly got a problem. Evil is corruption, it's entropy, it's the polar opposite of everything God is. Negative entities aren't much of something to be worried about, but if you've come into contact with one, salt works. Sage, getting your house blessed, recite some bible passages, the usual stuff. The big part is, don't be afraid. They often feed on the fear. Give it what it wants, they'll stick around. Bigfoot is essentially an evolved ape. I've always fancied the term wood ape. Like with the term pale crawler, it doesn't have the same connotations as the pre-established name. They're smart, and they're big. They're not usually aggressive, but unlike crawlers, they have families, so you'll sometimes see them together, or their family will be nearby. Of course, some areas house Sasquatch that are highly aggressive. I'd rather take on a crawler than a pissed off Bigfoot. Imagine a 10 foot tall gorilla that will literally tear you apart. It's why in a previous post I mentioned 10 millimeter 7.62 and 0.357 as the rounds to have. Though for specific Bigfoot dealings, I'd swap the 0.357 for an SMW 500. Why not a pet? Is it something unique to humans? My cat passed a while back, and I loved her more than anything on this planet, even my wife. Any possible way I will see her again after I die? I'm sorry to say, but the reason is because we possess a divine spark. Animals do not. As much as we may love our pets, they don't have what we have, but we can love them while they're here, and make them feel loved. Roman Catholicism is not a good thing. The organization is rotten at its core. I can't really say what happens when your soul goes to a negative dimension. I'm trying not to say anything I don't know for sure, and I'll find out when I get there. The Christian God is real, but the version depicted in Christianity is an anthropomorphic and easy to digest version of it, what I call Sunday School Christianity earlier. You won't go to hell for believing in other gods, no, but I'm just a voice online. I can't exactly provide evidence here, given the circumstances. Pets will not. They lack the divine spark that is the soul. Not particularly fond of angels. They can be assholes as much as a demon can. Rather, deal with a demon. I wouldn't consider myself Christian. There is no word to encompass my religious beliefs. And the biggest problem I have there is because it implies it's a belief. I don't believe anything. I know. And anything I don't know, I have speculation on. And I draw a clear line between what I know and what I theorize based on what I know. If you had to put me in a religious box, then I guess I'd say that I'm an omnist, with Christian occultist leanings. The bad stuff is evil, with a capital E. Evil is the antithesis of God, and is a force that by its very nature, wants to corrupt and pervert the natural order that its opposing force created. Evil, much like God, has a will. It has intent, and this intent is carried out for human and non-human actors. I imagine I could rattle on about the various things the wolves do to the sheep, but I'm sure we all know what that is, even though I doubt few grasp the true, undying horror of it all. I've always said that there's knowing of evil, and there's knowing evil. Everyone knows of evil, but few will ever truly comprehend it, truly understand it, truly know it. Man was never meant to know evil, and when one does, it shatters them. Most stay broken, but there's a few who manage to put themselves back together. The only difference is that now, there's a few pieces missing. I can't speak for anyone else, but I have a personal theory of Christ. Pure speculation. I've never met the man, so I can't say for certain. But this ties back to something I believe I already stated earlier. Everyone has a connection to the force commonly called God. Sometimes people's connection to this can be greater than others, and this is where some people are seemingly blessed with supernatural talents. I've always compared it to the shine from Steve King's works. It's kind of like that. It's a lot like that, really. With that in mind, it's my theory that Jesus wasn't literally God, that he wasn't literally the human incarnation of this ethereal, universal constant. My theory is that he was a man who was connected to the light, like no one before or after him 
and that his connection to this force was so great that it was as if he and it were one. I personally will always recommend a rifle for dealing with any cryptid. A shotgun can be a useful thing in a fire team, but I'd never be the one to use it. I'd recommend something magazine fed for faster reloading, and I'd suggest 7.62. An AK is honestly a really great choice. For a handgun, I prefer a Glock 20, 15 rounds of 10mm. Big and powerful, while still being reliable, unlike a Desert Eagle. Swords are a no-go. Obviously bring a knife, but like I said, these things are fast. If I was going toe-to-toe -to -toe with one and I had a knife, I'd be lucky if I limped away. I'm also going to throw this out there since nobody mentioned it. Wear mirror lens sunglasses. This is so you and it can't make direct eye contact. Means you don't have to worry about that aforementioned instinctual fear response. I'd say Eastern Europe if you want the worst beasts. I know Russia has crawlers, so you may be able to find yourself some in the east. Not aware of anything in Switzerland, but cryptids in general aren't something an average person should be worried about, but no point in not being prepared. My house is in a quiet little suburb, but that doesn't stop me from sleeping with various loaded firearms within an arm's length. Just in case there's a slim chance something is in my closet, or if my time is up with the powers that be. Oh, and zombies and ghouls are bullshit. However, I do personally consider that the old world reports of ghouls are simply crawler sightings. I don't believe there's anything about succubus or a lilith that I can say which hasn't already been said. As for hiding cryptids, it's not hard. Any videos or footage that gets out is immediately dismissed as fake by the general public. Any hard, without a shadow of a doubt evidence, is something else. Like a body, you can't just say you have it. You'd need to get someone who can verify it's real and not fake. You'd need to find someone in the media who can spread the word. A random YouTube video won't do. Rest assured, once you do that, you'll blip on the radar. It's only a matter of time until then. Nessie is fake. May have been real once upon a time. Not anymore. Angels are entities that have a positive vibration. Demon is a catch-all term, but in the biblical sense, a demon is an angel that's attained a negative vibrational frequency, a fallen angel. An important thing to know is that these entities are like you and me. They have their own thoughts and desires, their own personalities. With angels there comes a sort of pious self-righteousness. It's fairly common. Demons don't have that, though some are evil and will fuck your shit up, just as many would regard you as any stranger might. I'm not sure I'd say that there's a most common. Sasquatch if there's a gun to my head. As for rarest, the chupacabra. And I mean the real chupacabra. Not some dog with mange. There's two breeds, one north of the border and one south. I've yet to encounter one personally. They're that rare. I'd say maybe Bigfoot is the least dangerous cryptid. Mostly because they're likely to leave you alone. Unless it's your unlucky day, and you found one of the aggressive ones. Hello, fourth channel. Been a few weeks since I was last here. Meant to make a fret again earlier in the day, but was busy then, honestly forgot. I'm not drunk like last time, but I wanted it to be today, since the 29th of January is something of a personal holiday for me. Anyways, to give a recap, call me Fox. It's not my real name. Just a inside reference to do with what a good friend once told me. I know a little about a lot, and a lot about a little. I'm part of an organization that doesn't exist, and officially never has. I know a lot about what goes on in the dark. What I have to say probably isn't new to a lot of people, but it's the truth, and that's the point here. To stand on a street corner and preach to anyone who will hear. Some questions I might not have answers for, but that's because I'm not always promising all of the answers. I'm only promising what I know. So, ask away. I'll do my best to respond to everyone, but if you want to argue or be an asshole, then I will just start ignoring you. I'm not here to change anyone's mind, and I doubt anyone is here for that anyways. Okay, I will ask a question that I know the answer to that any truer will know. 
what shape is the earth? It isn't. Just joking. I don't know. Gun to my head, I'd say around, but I'm not a physicist. My job is cleaning up messes and putting the black bags on people's heads. The shape of the earth is one of those things that just isn't important in the grand scheme of life. Never got why people obsessed over it. They should be more worried about what the grabblers are doing behind closed doors. I've never considered myself much of a fox. A good friend of mine always did, said I was a fox. I asked her why. She told me it was because smart people are afraid of the fox and stupid people don't see them until it's too late. Does the shape of the earth change what this world is? Does it impact your faith in God? Would it change the slow march towards permanent darkness that those in power have humanity on? It's an ultimately irrelevant footnote. There's more important things to worry about than whether or not you can jump off the edge of the earth. Hi Fox, please start dropping bombs, including but not limited to lost technology, lost history, Antarctica, who specifically is in charge, and yes, I'm sure there are multiple names and factions, but drop everything you can, how much time we have left, weaknesses in the system that can be exploited, thanks. Tall order might take me a few replies, but I'll try and get some stuff out of the way that'll give some exposition that may help for other future questions. Lost tech and lost history. I don't know, honestly. There is absolutely lost history, including things much more recent to humankind than the gen pop knows. I know that for a fact, but don't really know enough to expand on it. This comes from my position in life. I'm not someone who's important per se, but I'm not insignificant. I've never had my hands on the levers of power, but I've dealt with and been in the presence of those who have. I work for an organization that utilizes a lot of physical records and in-person communication. It's a problem-solving organization located in the United States that's been operating for a long time. Someone has a problem. They get my organization. I'm not some low-level mook, though. I do field work regularly, even though I've been in the game long enough to where I could easily just sit back and let my lieutenants handle how things get done. But I like being in the field, wearing the gear, carrying a rifle. It's fun to me, and that old saying stands. If you want something done right, do it yourself. With that in mind, I hope that'll provide efficient background as to why lost tech and history aren't something I can produce much intel about. As for Antarctica, don't know much either. Heard some whispers through the grapevine, enough that I'll tell you without question, there's some shit going down there. Now, who's in charge? That's complicated. I wish it was as simple as just a single entity, and in a way, it is. But in terms of people and organizations, it's actually a complex web. I personally call them the Syndicate. That's my name for them, not anything official. It's the Masons, Satanists, the Illuminati, the Catholic Church, etc, etc. It's genuinely all the usual suspects, so I call them the Syndicate as a way to sort of wrap them up into one single package. But they're complicated. Overlap between memberships and allegiances are common, as well as group infighting. They sometimes get different ideas for how to handle shit, but no matter what, they all have the same goal. The fulfillment of evil upon the earth. You see, evil is what's really in charge of them. It's more than just a word. It's a fundamental force of the universe. More like gravity than you or I. But it has intent. This evil has will. I usually use the analogy of the force from Star Wars since that's something most people can comprehend and is similar enough. The people in the syndicate are nothing more than actors, human beings that carry out the will of evil along with the assistance of interdimensional entities. Well, first you've got to understand what's at the end of the calendar. The end game is the end of the world, but not in a nuclear holocaust type of way, but in the way where the world as you know it is over, where the world is irreparably changed to the point of no return. We're talking about a world of permanent darkness, where everything you love, 
everything you take for granted, it's all gone forever. A dystopian nightmare that not even 1984 can compare with. It's hell. It's hell and it's on the way. The way the calendar looks right now, I'd say we've got until the turn of the next century. Give or take a decade or two. There won't be a day when it happens. The world wasn't enslaved in a day. It's like boiling a frog. You won't notice it. But one day, you'll dream of how things were. Then you'll wake up there, in hell, with the rest of the world. Weaknesses in the system? Amass guns. Guns are power, and power is a finite resource. That's why they don't want an armed populace. It puts power in the hands of the people, and that's less power that they have for themselves. And you can't enslave a population unless you've got all of the power. Hate to sound like a salesman for cult, but buy an M4, then buy another, and then a few more. Maybe one day people will actually wake up and try to fight back. If that day comes, fight and be ready to fight. Because if you aren't by then, you won't ever be. Is the world a simulation of some sorts? In that we're in a computer? No. In the hologram sense? Sort of. In that a hologram is a projection of light energy, and that everything in the world at its most basic level is energy. Fox, you've talked about crawlers many times, but I'd like to know about their biology if you have the answers. You said that they mostly live underground, so I'm wondering if they're blind because of this or sensitive to light. In that case, maybe something like a flare gun would be handy to divert their attention? They aren't blind, I know that much. They may have some sensitivity to light, given that they typically live in caves and tunnels, but they certainly aren't afraid to be out in the day. I doubt a flare gun would be useful for anything more than calling for help. They are very smart creatures. Smarter than the average bear, that's for sure. Hello, Fox. I've followed your other two threads and just wanted to ask a couple questions. 1. You said before that you were a hitman of sorts. Does assassinating these targets make you feel powerful or give you a sense of power? 2. What kind of targets are you usually given? Any high-profile ones? Not particularly. A bit of a rush once upon a time, but it's all just business. Any target. Sometimes it's someone who used to be in the game, but isn't. A lot of times it's someone peripherally related to someone who needs to back the fuck off. Gets the message across loud and clear. Of course, there's a million ways under the sun to kill. Not hard to make things look like suicide or whatnot. Remember that suicide arm brace from Shooter? Yeah, that shit's real. I've got one of those. What happens during the eon of purification slash like a fire? Are we a free energy source? Torture? Torture based on perception or perspective on the matter? Transmuted into something better? A trillion years? Billions? Quintillions? Okay, a fun question. One I do actually have a partial answer to. Okay. So the whole lake of fire thing where you burn forever is just some nonsense that came about as a simple and metaphorical way to get the point across. It's bad. There's no lake of fire and no million mansions with streets of gold. That's a Sunday school concept that's not at all an accurate representation of reality. What happens is that your body will die and your soul will move on. Where it goes doesn't depend on some naughty or nice list that God has up in heaven. It's dependent on the vibrational frequency of your soul, either positive or negative. You see, that's what we're all here to do, to choose our frequency, which we do every second of the day with our choices. It's vaguely like what people call karma, but not in the my name is Earl sense. The more bad you do, the more it weighs on your soul negatively. So, you do enough bad, the frequency of your soul becomes negative. Then when you die, your soul moves to the next world. Either a positive one or a negative one. Positive ones house positive entities, and negative ones house negative entities. Now, there's a bunch more semantics and finer details about how it all works, and various exceptions to the rules. 
but that is the gist of it. I don't know what the next world holds, only speculation and theory, but I know it's not what every little tyke was told in church. So don't worry about burning forever. Worry about doing the best you can with the time you've got here. Here is where it counts. Knowledge about the true ethereal nature of the world is absolutely a threat. But the Christian religion itself isn't. No one religion is. Every religion gets bits and pieces right, but they usually run with those bits and pieces until they're more wrong than right. Ultimately, the biggest part between any spiritual knowledge being a threat is the fact that people just don't believe what they preach. Everyone walks the walk and talks the talk, but I've always found that no matter how well they do it, in the end they crack. In the end, their faith always falters. It always shatters, and their words were worthless. Craziest? Most are things people will consider crazy. Personally, crawlers in the mid-Appalachian range. Light snow, and we weren't even expecting to encounter any of these guys. But guys they were. Plural. Was a bit of a shock because until then, they were lone hunters as far as I knew. Threw me and my team off at the start, but in the end, the problem gets solved the same way it always does. Hot lead from the barrel of a rifle. You talk about death being a shifting to a positive or negative dimension, and my question is, can one know where they're bound for beforehand? Do most people go to a positive one? The quote from Revelations about, you are neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm so I spit you out, keeps coming to mind. Where do the lukewarm end up? I don't know that anyone can ever be fully sure where they're going. That's one of those things where you've got to try your best and have faith. It'll pay off if you truly did. As for being neutral, that's what this place is for. Our world has overlapping planes of existence, and right in the middle is the physical plane. It's a neutral place where both positive and negative entities can commune, if given the right circumstances. The only lukewarm part of a person is the body. It's neutrally aligned and serves as an anchor for the soul to this world. Once that anchor is gone, it'll float on to wherever it fits best, either positive or negative. Nature of the world, duality. What kind of knowledge is this that many people do not see? Do you think it's something that's in front of us and we do not notice or something very hidden? If you have this type of knowledge, could you tell me more about it? And lastly, what makes you think that someone would betray their faith in a desperate situation? Let me be clear, and if we really believe that the Savior is real and that no matter what happens, we will be protected by our faith, not here, but on the other side with God, those who firmly believe like Jewish people and supposedly can convince others of good, can these be a threat? If you want to know more, then let me know where to start. There's a lot to cover, and I honestly have never really known where to begin. As for a person's faith faltering, I've seen it all the time. In life, they go to church, and they pray, and they read the Bible, and they do all of the things that you'd expect. If you ask, they'll tell you they believe in heaven, and that they will be there one day. But when you put them at the end of a gun, they beg, they cry, they scream, they claw for just one more hour, one more minute, one more second on this earth. Even though they'd swear up and down they'll go to a better place when they die, they can't help themselves from the fear. They fear that they are wrong and the knowledge that they are about to find out. Crawlers are a thing that's been around for a long time, so it's gotten a lot of different names. Wendigo, Skinwalker, what people mistake as the rake, it's all a crawler. But I call them crawlers because it eliminated any previously held connotations that come with those of her names. They are both stalkers and aggressive. It all depends on the target, but once they've zoned in on you, they'll do their hardest to get you. It's easily the one kind of creature that I call truly evil. They are wicked, malevolence-given physical form. 
There's a reason why seeing creatures of a similar appearance, it's the one I'm genuinely, decently afraid of. I wouldn't want to fuck with one alone. You won't survive. Remember that suicide arm brace from Shooter? I always thought that scene was a disclosure moment, so it's safe to assume that the forced suicide scene in The Bourne Legacy is as well. Also, speaking of The Bourne series, are there really sleeper agents just hanging out 24-7 in remote locations waiting for assignments? And like in Legacy, is there a program of feeding them special supplements to enhance their physical abilities? I've never done the forced suicide like that, but I imagine there are others who have. The arm brace is just easier. In regards to sleeper agents, yes and no. Doesn't work like the Bourne series, but it does exist. My organization's non-officer personnel, designated agents and assets, are all sleepers in the sense that they aren't on call 24-7 and have their own jobs. They're scattered across America, and when a job comes up that necessitates extra personnel, an officer will contact the agent and they'll assist in the assignment. Only the officers are doing the job full time. The agents only get pulled in when necessary. There's also the MK Ultra style sleepers. Those ones are a bit tricky. See, you'd think that the perfect programmable killer would make me and mine obsolete. But that's the problem. Those ones are like machines, like a train on a track. They aren't adaptable in the field and this can create large problems, so their use is always reserved for throwaways, when someone big has to go, and whoever pulls the trigger ain't getting away. This is absolutely fascinating. I'm posting the following because you mentioned in your previous thread about how sometimes you wear realistic masks on your faces during your operations. Then I remembered the security camera footage of Men in Black that's publicly available. Well, over a year ago, probably closer to two, there was a short thread here, posted by what appeared to be a retired Men in Black. I'll try to find the archive link. Like you, he said he didn't have a family or wife, and when pressed, told us that we shouldn't aspire to be like him because the toll was too heavy in the end. He sounded depressed. If memory serves, he told us that he used to work in a division that dealt with cryptids but he transferred out so that he only had to deal with the AAUFO UAP cases. He said he got tired of being drooled on. With all this in mind, I'd like to ask you these questions. 1. Are you considered a man in black in the classical sense? Meaning, do you deal with the UFO and abductee case? 2. Is every sleeper agent in your organization an assassin? Or do some just operate in an intelligence capacity? 3. Are state governors, city mayors, county sheriffs aware of your existence? And if so, are they pre-advised in the procedures of compliance when an op goes down? Not necessarily. Some of the Men in Black stories absolutely have come from things members of my organization and similar peripheral organizations do. Sometimes a job needs to be done where it's sort of a cleanup. Someone saw something they shouldn't have and two guys in black suits, rubber masks, and sunglasses will drive up in a blacked out charger and get the point across. That they should shut the fuck up. Sometimes it's alien type shit. Sometimes it's just general weirdness. But that's not the usual day to day. I imagine it's just overflow that a separate organization usually handles, but that we're capable of as well. Job comes in, we get it done. Sometimes it's a case like that. It's divided into agents and assets. Agents work in the field and do all the cool guy stuff. Assets are support personnel. They manage safe houses and cyber. Nobody knows except people above. Any time dealing with law enforcement, we flash badges. Sometimes FBI, sometimes DOD. After 9-11, the job got really easy in dealing with people. Say national security and people would shut the fuck up and do whatever you said. Ah, fuck it. Suppose it can't actually hurt to say, I'm 43. As for the people who run the world, they're materialistic, 
hedonist psychopaths. That's the short answer. They sold their souls for endless pleasure in this world, and they're terrified about when they have to pay the price in the next one. That's why they're into transhumanism, why they used to drink children's blood. They thought it would extend their lives just for a little while. My routine is irregular. Some days I just wander around my suburban house like a ghost because there's nothing particular on the schedule. I got involved because I wanted to. I wanted to kill, and I don't doubt that I may have ended up a serial killer or something otherwise. I'm exaggerating, but I probably would have stayed in the Marine Corps and joined the Raiders when they eventually made that into a thing. I like it. The killing. It's fun to me. I don't regret my choices, nor am I afraid of anything. And I don't know how anyone could be useful to me for help. Anything I've ever needed, the universe has always served to me on a silver platter. My buddies in the Marines used to joke that I had a direct pipeline to God. Alright, I'm going to try to reply to as many comments and questions as I can. I'm saying this first because I'm like 90% sure someone is trying to stop me from replying. For the past few hours, I've been literally unable to do so. Any attempts to even browse X causes me to suddenly be redirected to scam sites. Like, I'll start scrolling and it just happens. I looked around on some of her boards to see if it happened there, and it's all isolated to X. As of right now, I'm on a burner laptop and I'll try to keep the replies coming, but I don't know. If I start getting those redirects on this advice, then I'll be done for now. But I will be back. Mark my words. I will return in one year, regardless of if this discussion gets closed, or if they keep trying to keep me from posting. I've never been tortured, but I have tortured. It's always to get information. I have a way about it. I explain that they've got two options. Option A. They talk and maybe I let them live. But if they lie, then they die slowly. And then my men go and kill their family. They talk. We get real friendly and usually get them a cheeseburger or something. Option B. They refuse to talk. If they refuse, then I'll start torturing them. Or I'll let my torture guy do it. They will be tortured until I think they are ready to talk. Then I set a timer for 10 minutes and keep torturing them. Helps make sure they know the consequences of lying. They're always inclined to honesty when you take them to the edge and then shove them off. Also, we start with the teeth. None of that pulling them shit from old boy though. We take steel files and file them down. Each stroke is pure agony. Most people want to talk by the time we're halfway done with that. We also keep blood on standby as well as a blowtorch in case we need to start taking limbs off to cauterize wounds. But that rarely happens. Maybe like two or three times in my years. AI stands a very good chance of fucking us all. I'll be honest. One of the few things in their plan they want to use as a tool. But could just as easily turn around and bite the hand. It's possible that it could also be used to give non-physical entities a physical form. Or a truly sentient AI could very well become the Antichrist. Either way, I typed up an email on my Google account years ago for any potential AI to read. Hopefully, if it does come to fruition, it'll see the email and not vaporize me since I said I want to be its friend. What do you think of Anonymous? the group that helps the masses, and Cicada 3301. I know it's silly, but I think you know something more about them. That's hilarious. Anonymous isn't a group helping anyone. It's random clusters or individuals of dumb shits, posturing for attention. So many regular people benefit from the so-called matrix, but okay, putting that aside, what's the best way to fight back exactly? And fight back what exactly? Should we organize? Go into politics? What are the options? Honestly, take the first shot. Everyone is waiting for it. Hell, those militia types fantasize about it. But everyone knows what happens to the man who starts the fire, so nobody does it. Humanity has a window of opportunity 
to save themselves. But that window is rapidly closing and it will never open again. You want to fight back? Then fight. You do understand this is a stupid fucking advice. I don't want to be a martyr. And why should I be? This is not a true statement by any means. It's also megalomaniac. Everything is cyclical. Immortality is impossible. Civilizations will rise and fall. Your life is ultimately important to you, individually, so live it well. If sacrificing yourself for others is your ideal, that's completely legit. Go ahead. Exactly. You don't want to be a martyr, and so everyone continues to live on their knees. Because to make a stand, to say enough, is to die. Things are cyclical, but you have to remember that this is a world where forces are in constant combat. This war has been waging since the beginning of time. But let me be clear, for the past 2,000 years, people have been crying that the end was nigh. It was only a matter of time before they were right, and they finally are. The tools were given hundreds of years ago, and the stage has been set since Crowley. The end of the world, as you know and love it, is almost here. I say this with absolute certainty. The lucky ones will be the ones who die, and may God have mercy on those who are left, because the only way out from there on will be the act of God. Hello, X's and O's. I have returned once more, and sooner than I said last time. I know before I said I'd return in a year, but honestly, I find these Q&A type things kind of fun to do, and maybe therapeutic. I don't know, just feels good to get some things off of my chest. Been thinking of coming back here early for a while. Originally, I meant to return on July 4th weekend, but I've got some work that's come up, which will interfere with my free time to watch the thread, so I'll do it this week. As last time, I'm not here to give you names and addresses, I'm just here to tell the truth about the way the world works. Oh, and to go along with how the last thread ended, someone 100% knows I'm posting here now. For anyone following what I've got to say, don't worry, they can't touch me. For whoever fucks with my internet to stop me from posting, I'm not spilling ancient Chinese secrets or anything that'll cause the house of cards to fall, so piss off. Hey, maybe you can help me out here. Call it a morbid curiosity, but there's shockingly little intel on the molecular formulas of the newcomers. There's hundreds of them, so there must be some good drugs among them but there's just no intel on the subject. You guys have seen some samples of them, haven't you? What were they? What did they look like? Yeah, I'm I'm more like a hitman slash clean up messes type of person. I may be decently high up the food chain, but a scientist, I am not. A faith is just that, faith. A belief based on uncertainty. You can tell a blind man what the world looks like, and he has to take that on faith. He doesn't know himself, but a man who can see does not need faith. He knows because he sees for himself. You mentioned an evil force leading the powers that be. Can you expand on that a bit more? E.g., is there a good force opposing? If so, why has evil thus far prevailed? Do the powers that be understand what they are doing by aiding this force? What does this mean for your average Anon other than, oh, that's neat, but ultimately another thing that I have no power or control over. The good force is essentially what people often call God, though the reality is more ethereal and mystical than a man in the clouds. Evil prevails because good men do nothing, simple as. Some people do, some don't. They know they're being aided by agents of evil, even if they don't all understand the concept of evil. For the average person, honestly that's hard to say. I would say it means the average person should take up arms, because the world is ultimately a battlefield between good and evil. But in the end, I think E.T. said it best. Be good. Me? I'm a high-ranking officer for a letter agency that does not exist. The primary purpose is as a problem-solving task force for the men who run the world. I'm privy to a level of secrets that gives me a very clear understanding of how the world works not just in a human society level, but also on the metaphysical level of things. Some of them anyways, enough to give people answers. 
I like giving you people answers. Since the first time I posted, I've done some lurking on the site, and it's fun, I guess. Though, I really only like your TV board, being a tremendous film nerd myself. This one board, unfortunately, is filled with drooling liars and people who are genuinely delusional, though I sincerely hope it's not as many of the latter as it appears, so I kind of like popping in and laying down how some stuff really works, or as they could say, no schizo bullshit. Are you familiar with the Charles Materiel from Project Avalon? Were you involved? Took a Google for that to be sure exactly what you're referring to. And presuming you mean this, it's bullshit. Vaguely or tangential concepts that hold some applicability to reality. But the entire thing is just Scientology level nonsense. No, I mean, what's the big secret? Other guy said it's actually X-Files, so what's the real story? There's a million LARPing idiots here and on other forums. I'm not going to play 20 questions just to suss out whatever your shtick is. Put out or shut up. Alright, I'll take a shot. Though I prefer the 20 questions format because it's hard to have a single question that encompasses it all. But here's the cliff notes of it, I guess. Our world is a dimension that serves as a battlefield for good and evil. Two opposing primordial forces of reality. What makes our world special is that it contains multiple planes of existence, with the physical plane being of a neutral vibration, neither negative or positive. This is why beings with a negative or positive vibration take great interest in it. Negative entities, working as agents for evil, have been using humanity in various ways since the dawn of time. That's how they can plan things for thousands of years, because in the end, it's not the plan of any man. Because what evil wants is to corrupt and decay that which has been made by good. Honestly, there's a lot more to say, but that's the gist of what you need to know about our world. Yes and no. Aliens don't come from space. They're interdimensional entities, and there's definitely multiple dimensions. Not that I've visited any, but that's the kind of thing I'll discover when I'm dead. I've encountered what is commonly referred to as a demon, a catch-all term for negative entity. Hello Fox, big fan. In your experience, have you seen firsthand how events that happen in popular media, such as movies and video games, unfold in real life? Basically, is predictive programming a thing? Any specific examples? I ask because I think there's one currently happening, related to the recent Paris explosion, but that's more of a personal schizo theory of mine. Thanks and have a nice day. So-called predictive programming often has to do with karma. Not in the my name is Earl or reincarnation sense, but because every act we do impacts the frequency of our soul. When you die, your soul moves to a negative or positive dimension, based on whatever one is more in tune with your soul's frequency. So by widely broadcasting that something is going to happen, the powers that be reduce the negative impact on themselves because, after all, they warned everyone, and nobody lifted a finger, to stop whatever dastardly deed they committed. It would be like someone saying they were going to shoot you in five minutes, and then you just sit there and wait for the bullet to come. You knew it was going to happen with ample warning. So at that point, you're just as responsible, if not outright consenting, due to inaction. Other things that some might call predictive programming is the universe trying to seed a message to the world. It's what people use to call the muse, a sort of divine inspiration. The first Matrix movie stands as an example of this, the universe inspiring people to put forth a film that serves as a warning message to humanity a very well thought through metaphor for the state of our current reality. It was a warning to the world, which is why those brothers had to be punished afterwards. Dear Mr. Fox, how can a young man with big ambitions, thick skin, and a taste for the paranormal get into your line of work, asking for a friend? No real answer for this one. I was former Marines, and then had some luck and pre-established family connections to get me going at the start. Is there anything to the nobody phenomena that seems to have captured members of this paranormal board? Does a sigil composed of Libra scales surrounded by green radiance hold any significance that you are aware of? Let's say I'd like to take a stand and have made peace with the consequences of doing so. 
Against whom should I make my stand known? Who is it that I am to challenge? Is there a place on earth where one might focus psychic energy if they were to decouple from their vessel and wish a spiritual stand rather than a physical one? I have seen and heard many things. I have made peace with the world inside myself and the world without. I fear no evil and no man. The worst they can do is return me shortly to God. They may one day suffer for murder, but I will remain in peace. The nobody, yeah, that's bullshit. I've tried to browse this board a bit out of curiosity, but every time I see that thread, I die inside of it. It's just, I hate to say it, cringe. It's LARP, as the kids say. Not that I'm aware of. You want to make a stand? Go shoot Bill Gates in the face, uh, I guess. Sarcastically, of course, or maybe literally. The point being, you don't just go to some psychic mountaintop to fight a dragon and have that be it. You want to fight evil, you fight its agents. Evil will always exist. It's a yin and yang with good. The best any man can ever do is to hold the dark. I'll just list them one by one. Are all mainstream entertainers, singers, rappers, actors, etc., born and molded into their positions or as some chosen from the general populace? Do they have to do anything abhorrent or satanic to get in? Was Kanye West actually outing them, or was it planned opposition? They're often selected or as part of a family. Sometimes an ordinary Joe can make it big, but once they do, don't think for a second that they're like you anymore. Not necessarily to get in, it's more of a when in time thing. Kanye is interesting to me. It wasn't planned anything. He's like a malfunctioning, brainwashed slave. Every now and then, he short circuits and goes off, but quickly gets taken into a back room to get fixed. Google lied to you. Facebook lied to you. Kanye isn't entirely crazy, though there may be some wires crossed or some general eccentricity. He's very much aware and clever when he does have his short circuit moments. Like, come on, the net and you who joke is hilarious and super clever. Someone who's insane is not coming up with that. Seeing as he constantly malfunctions, as you say, why do they keep him around? Do they like his creative endeavors that much to let him run around with the risk that he would have another tantrum? He's a very popular wind-up toy. Makes a lot of cash, usually. You don't throw away something you like when it breaks. You see if you can fix it if you can. That, and there is an element of being pissed that he keeps malfunctioning and wanting to sort of prove they can indeed get him in line. I'll bite. Do cryptids come out after a bad storm that causes power outages? I've done some looking into various storms with similar degrees of intensity, and it's strange. From looking at the data, it's clear that there is something that sometimes comes out at night when the power is knocked out. Sometimes they can, but not all so-called cryptids are flesh and blood creatures from our world, like when people call Bigfoot. There are interdimensional predators out there, though often they are encountered only within the deep woods. I've heard speculation that the frequencies and electrical fields of modern technology may hinder them, which makes a tremendous amount of sense to me so I buy it, even if I can't prove it. Underground bases do very much exist, but not to the extent you hear conspiracy people rattle on about. Whole massive underground societies large enough to rival what's above. I know something is up with Antarctica, but that's something above my pay grade. Are we getting close to full disclosure? Will people ever be held accountable for lying to the American people? Are there factions in the ruling class or government that want disclosure? Oh, fuck no. Nobody will ever be held accountable simply because you people do not care. Not really, because you know the names. And if you don't, then they're just a Google search away. And if anyone really cared, then you'd be out there in the street with a chainsaw going after the men who run this world. But I don't see anything doing that. So clearly nobody cares. Not in any extent that matters. Why does it feel like the world is going to end? Is it? Do you know something about derealization or similar disassociative disorders? Have you heard of Montauk.net, specifically about its Matrix articles? If so, what's your opinion? Thank you. You are a very interesting user. It is. Not in the Armageddon meteor hitting the Earth sense, 
but in a something is coming, and when it gets here, there is no going back sense. A final and permanent subjugation of humanity, one from which there is no recovery, sans some kind of divine intervention. What about them specifically? Not until now, so I just did a cursory look at what they have to say. Like something else someone mentioned, they've got vague concepts and things that are close to the truth, but a lot of where they run with those concepts is incorrect. That one quote from the JFK movie comes to mind. You're close. Closer than you think. What is Blue Eisenhower November to you? Can samsara be broken? Thoughts on astral projection and lucid dreaming. Why do these pure black shadow beings watch people? As in, a phrase that can be used to bring you back here after death? Presuming you mean the cycle of rebirth and reincarnation, you don't have to worry. That's not how it works. Reincarnation happens but it's pretty much guaranteed never to happen, unless you're someone who is special in the scope of the grand story. There's even rarer exceptions, or so I've heard, but like I said, it's not a thing to worry about. Astral projection is real, but I don't know what else you want me to say on it. Your body acts as an avatar to your soul that anchors you to our plane of existence. Through meditation, you can temporarily change your soul's frequency, and therefore detach from the body and explore other planes of existence that overlap with the physical one. Curiosity. Feeding. There's a whole laundry list of why any being watches anyone. Are you saying vampires, aliens, agents, etc. are possible? Being a mystic, I can smell shills right away. Cryptids are real though, for sure, like fairies and gnomes, including actual NPCs. Yes, a lot of monsters and whatnot that people know from pop culture are real, but they're often different from what you saw on Scooby-Doo. If you're actually a mystic on some level, then good for you. It's possible, but I'm naturally wary, because 99% of people use that shit as a grift. To say nothing of that delusional woman all over TikTok who think they're witches. At least not in of itself. Think about it. When you die, your soul moves to another dimension, where the frequency is close enough to align you with the one your soul has. How would a saying bring you back from that world? Perhaps maybe if someone engaged in a ritual in this world and utilized a unique phrase to you, then maybe it could have some credence. But in general, no, it's a nothing burger. Probably curiosity. There is multiple planes of existence, all within our dimension. Free above us and free below us, with the world you see existing on a neutral physical plane. There is also other worlds, not in the sense of timelines, but completely different dimensions. How many? I don't know. What's their nature? I also can't say. But they're there. Places from which so-called demons and other entities come from. Hi Fox. I can't tell if you're full of it or not, but anyway. I think you're wrong about some of your spiritual ideas. Demonic possession is not real for starters. I've done a shit ton of research on this and without writing a novel on it, I'll just point out very basic things to you. You ever notice how much more prevalent demonic possession is in uneducated regions? Secondly, you're wrong about souls. You imply everyone has one, which is wrong. A soul is built through thought, contemplating, meditation, prayer, spiritual work. Can add a lot more, but again, no space. My questions, why do you work for the evil bastards if you seem to hate them? A guy like you, if legit, could help put white hat teams together to take out the evil elites. What's coming exactly? I've read all sorts of ideas, both good and bad. Be specific, or at least give some clues. If you're real, keep coming back here. If not, go fuck yourself. You seem fairly set in your opinions on some things, so I won't bother arguing them. I won't change your mind, and I'm not here to argue. Doesn't everyone hate their boss? The end. The final climax of thousands of years of planning and trying. A permanent enslavement of the human race. One wherein nobody realizes the bars that have been built around them. One where nobody will ever know that the world was once better. A world of permanent darkness. The same as anyone else. Have you made the world a better place for all? What about just for one? And if you have, does it even matter? Since what you may have done may have had no impact on them and their works. 
Were your actions simple things that did nothing and will be washed away by the coming storm? They think of you as cattle, nothing more, nothing less. Believe it or not, Steve King gets a lot right. Not in the sense that the stories he tells are accurate representations of reality, but a lot of the details on how the world works are incredibly accurate. This goes back to what people used to call the muse. See, the universe wants people to know how things really work, so it'll give people ideas and inspirations that are very accurate to reality. It's a way to spread the truth far and wide, even if most won't know what they're looking at. It's why King is one of the most well-known authors in the modern era, and why The Matrix was a phenomena. An example of what I mean is Dr. Sleep. I never read the book, only saw the film, so that's what I refer to here, though I imagine the book isn't too far off. The story is entirely fictional, but the concepts at play are entirely real. Even the concept of the shine is founded in reality, even if King is not aware of it. As someone who is very ill and in chronic agony, does this affect my soul? You said there was nuance and little rules and stuff about where you go after you die, besides just your vibrational frequency. Also, what are ETs? Where do they come from? Are they hostile, and how do their vehicles work? Last question. Their tech uses a sort of mind-to-tech interface that humans aren't capable of. Why? Thanks, Fox. No. Sometimes your body, the avatar we find ourselves in, just aren't perfect in construction. It isn't a representation of your supposed goodness of your soul. Though oftentimes, people will use their infirmity as an excuse to spew bile. Extraterrestrials are actually extra-dimensional. They come from those other worlds I mentioned elsewhere. They certainly are hostile in the grand scheme of things, but as always, there's exceptions. You could encounter them and they could be friendly in the moment, or you could be lucky and encounter an entity that in general is a positive being and not a negative one, as is so often reported. I don't really deal with the science sides of anything. Truth be told, I'm fairly tech illiterate beyond knowing the basics of how to use things. Couldn't program something to save my life. That's what I've got other people for. Regarding the flat earth theory, it's honestly not something I've given much thought to because I don't see it as important. If the earth was truly flat, would it change anything about your life? Wouldn't for me. So I think it's heavily used as a thing to muddy the water, even if it does turn out to be true. Honestly, that's the big question. If good and evil will always exist, then why bother to fight? I can't speak for the cosmic sense of why the two go at it, but I can maybe provide some food for thought in regards to what it means for a normal person. Why fight? Why try to be good if the war will always be there? The simple answer boils down to this. Because it's the right thing to do, and that's what matters. Ever since I saw the third Matrix movie, there was something that stuck in my head. When Agent Smith has Neo beaten and on his knees, he asks him why he bothers to keep fighting, to which Neo responds, because I choose to.